Welcome to lesson one of quantum mechanics. The learning goal for today is nothing less than to become one with the fundamental mystery of quantum mechanics, with apologies to Richard Feynman. Let's talk about an experiment, an experiment with bullets. We fire bullets at a uh, armored barrier of some kind, and uh, we watch them hit in various places. What I'd like you to do is to think about how you'd represent the position of the bullets as they strike the screen. Go ahead and stop the podcast and make a little sketch. Then we'll watch again as the bullets hit the screen, and you'll notice this time that there's a histogram. So the idea is you could use a histogram to represent the position of the bullets as they hit the screen. Notice that um, it's a statistical representation, which just shows you sort of what the variation is on the coordinate of the bullet as it hits the screen. If you fire the bullets many, many times, you'd ultimately see a distribution that developed to look something like this Gaussian. Now, what happens if we put an armored plate in front of the gun with a slit and we fire the bullets again? Again, they'll hit the armor, but this time some of them get through the slit and hit the armor plate behind. Again, I'd like you to think about the distribution of bullets as they hit the wall. Let's fire the gun again and watch the histogram develop. The idea is that it'll still be some kind of a Gaussian, but it's a Gaussian that's formed behind the slit so that it's shifted over a little bit from the old Gaussian that we had before the, the plate was there. We could do this again with another slit located slightly to the right of the first slit, and you'll notice that the bullets again, some get through. You'll notice that as they pass through, some of them get deflected a little bit. Maybe they get close to an edge or something. I don't know. But uh, they form a distribution which um, looks like another Gaussian, but this time the Gaussian is displaced to the right instead of to the left. You see how that works. Now the question is, what happens if I put both slits together? What happens to the distribution of bullets as they hit the final armor barrier? I'd like you to predict what that distribution is going to look like based on the picture you see here. And then let's run the experiment and see what the distribution really is. You'll notice that, uh, again, it's a kind of a histogram. But this time, there's a peak under the right slit, and there's a peak under the left slit. So that the overall histogram is sort of like a double hump distribution. How are these histograms related? Can you come up with some kind of a mathematical expression that relates the left probability distribution and the right probability distribution, in other words, the probability distribution of bullets when the left and the right slits are open, to the probability distribution you'd expect to see with both slits open. I hope you came up with something like this, where the probability distribution with both slits open is the simple sum of the distributions with either of the two slits open. Now here's a different experiment involving waves. So the idea is we got a wave source that produces some waves, and they come down and hit the bottom of the pond or whatever it is. How would you represent the intensity of waves reaching the bottom of the screen? You might come up with something like this. Notice they're at the center, they're closest to the source, and as you move to the right and left, you get a little further from the source, so the amplitude's going to drop or the intensity's going to drop. What if I stick a slit in here? I'm going to get a distribution that shifted to the left. It's a little bit like the distribution of bullets when we put one slit in. You could do the same thing with another slit, but this one to the right. Again, we'll get an intensity distribution, but this time the intensity distribution will be shifted to the right. So the question is, what happens when I open two slits? Let's look at the intensity distribution with two slits open. You'll notice something different is happening. 
This doesn't really look like the situation with bullets. What is the intensity going to look like? It's a three hump distribution. We have two slits, we have three humps. It's kind of crazy. How are those related? There's the left distribution, there's the right distribution, and there's both. Think about that a second. Stop the podcast if you like. To understand the distribution of intensity for waves, you need to know the idea of an amplitude. The intensity is proportional to the square of the amplitude. But the total amplitude is the sum of the amplitude from the left and the amplitude from the right. We get the idea of interference. Now there's a Visual Python demo I can't do, but I'll provide the, uh, I'll provide the code so you can run the demo yourself if you like. But I want to repeat the whole thing with electrons. Now remember we had bullets. These were classical bullets that went through a slit. And then we had waves going through slits. These are now electrons. Now electrons, unfortunately, you can't see them in flight. They're very tiny and difficult to watch. But you can see that when you turn the electron gun on, they make little flashes on the screen at the bottom. So if we open a slit, we see flashes. And we can make a histogram of the flashes as they appear. Then we can do a similar experiment with the second slit. Again, we see flashes. Then we can do two slits. And we see flashes from the two slits. The interesting thing is the probability distributions from the one slits look a lot like the probability distribution with the classical bullets. But when we open two slits, the probability distribution from the two slits being open looked an awful lot like the intensity distribution from the wave experiment. So that's very different. Some comments. The results persist even if the electron current is, re is reduced to arbitrarily low levels. In other words, you can dial the electron current down to the point where there's only one electron at a time in the system, and you still see the three-hump probability distribution. If you try to measure where the electron goes through, which slit they go through, for example, the interference pattern goes away. In other words, the distribution of electrons changes so that you no longer see the interference effect. You cannot define or you cannot identify which slit the electron goes through. If you do, the, in the interference pattern is destroyed. Here's another question. If we don't know whether the right slit is open or closed, is there a measurable event that would tell us for certain one way or the other? In other words, is there a single measurement you can make, which if the measurement turned out one way or the other, you could determine with certainty that the other slit was open and, uh, or was not open? Think about that. Stop the podcast and think about it. Okay, um, I hope you're back again. Uh, the measurement that you might think of is to put a detector at the zero of the interference pattern. If you measure a photon there, then you know for certain that the right slit is closed. That's called an interaction-free measurement. In other words, you've detected the presence of something over the slit, but the photon that you measured went through the other slit. The photon never went through the right slit. So there's actually a whole current field of research called interaction-free measurement, deducing things without interacting with the thing you're, whose presence or absence of presence you're, de you're deducing. Okay, here's a clicker question. How do electrons behave like classical bullets? Stop and think about that. The, uh, the way they behave like classical bullets is that they're measurable in discrete lumps. Okay. Um, how do electrons behave like classical waves? Uh, they, uh, they have amplitude adding, just like classical waves. That's the idea. So, um, and finally, next time, I'd like you to install Python and Visual Python on your laptops. You can get that from the K drive in the 465 folder. Make sure you do the pre-flights. And... Uh, See the examples that come with Visual Python, get a flavor for what they're like. And next time we'll pick up with uh, some more math and other fun stuff.
Talk to you soon. Bye. Welcome back. It's time for lesson two. We're going to start with a little review of some modern physics. And uh, basically, there's just a couple of ideas I want you to think about. Now, we're going to discuss these in the class. So when you arrive at class, we'll have a conversation about it. But I wanted you to think about it a little bit before you got there. The first concept is, what is the idea of normalization, and why do we care about it? What's, what's important about it? What does it mean? And uh, we're going to hit this concept over and over throughout the semester, so it's important to, to get it straight in your head. The other question is, how does the momentum operator allow us to get information about the momentum associated with a particular wave function? So what is it the momentum operator does? Um, how does it work to to allow us to get information. I'm going to touch on that in a minute, but also I want to have a conversation about that when you get to class. I'd like to talk a little bit about expectation values and what they mean. The first thing I want to say is, uh, well, expectation value is a terrible name. Whoever came up with it uh, had a really bad day as far as I'm concerned. But anyway, let's, let's talk about it. Let's say you rolled a six-sided die capital N times. You just kept rolling a six-sided die over and over again. And, and capital N is a pretty big number, so that uh, I couldn't fit all the results on the top of the fraction here. But, uh, but it's a capital N underneath. And uh, what we're calculating here is the so-called expectation value of the, uh, the result of the die. And what would we get? How would we do that? Um, we'd add up the results in other words, we'd add up the value that we see on the top face of the die for every trial, and we divide by the number of trials. I want you to notice that there's another way we could do that same calculation is to count the number of times the number 1 appears in the numerator and multiply that by 1. Then we could count the number of times that the number 2 appears in the numerator and multiply that by 2. So if, if 1 appeared 57 times, We'd, the first term in the, in the second line would be 57. And if 2 appeared, um, I don't know, 50 times, then we take 2 times 50, that would be 100. But of course, that would be what you get when you added up all those 52s. And if 3 appeared uh, 30 times, then we'd have 33s, which would be 90. So 3 times, times 30, and so on. You can see that the sum you get in the numerator is the same either way you compute it. And what you end up doing is dividing by n, <clears throat> the number of trials. Again, same, so it's obviously the same thing. But if you rewrite that a slightly different way so that you uh, break the terms out, the number of 1s divided by n, the number of 2s divided by n, the number of 3s divided by n, and so on, you'll notice that um, the number of 1s divided by the number of rolls is nothing other than the probability of rolling a 1. And the number of 2's divided by the number of rolls is nothing other than the probability of rolling a 2. And in the limit that n is a very large number. So we're, we're going to assume that capital N here gets big, you know, I don't know, millions or billions or something, something large. And so we can think of the expectation value of the die as the probability of rolling a 1 times 1 plus the probability of rolling a 2 times 2, and so on. So that's, that's where that formula basically comes from. If we continue on that line of thought, you can see that uh, if you want to know the probability of some random variable x, forget about the dies now, let's just say we have a random variable x that can take on different values, x1, x2, x3, that we can compute the expectation value of that random variable as the probability of getting the value x1 times the value x1, plus the probability of getting a value x2 times that value, and so on. So you can see how this expectation value formula comes out of general considerations. Um, and this would be the correct formula for a discrete random variable, a random variable that can only take on certain definite values. But in this class, we're often going to be dealing with random variables that can take on a continuum of values, a continuous set, you know, anywhere between 0 and 12 or something. And in that case, instead of doing a sum of the probability times the value, we're going to have to do some kind of an integral of a probability density. So 
the idea is that there's a certain probability per meter that the particle can be found uh, around x equals zero meters and a different probability per meter that it can be found around x equals one meters and so on. In that case, the corresponding sort of analogous calculation would be an integral of probability density times the thing that uh, the value of the thing whose probability you're computing. So you can see the expectation value of x is the probability density at some value of x times x itself. But uh, in quantum mechanics, of course, to calculate probabilities, what we want to do is to compute the magnitude of the probability density, or the probability amplitude squared. So it's the squared probability amplitude takes the place of the probability or the probability density, depending on what kind of amplitude it is. So in a wave function terms, you know, probability density is going to be psi star psi. And the way we'd write out the expectation value of x is to take psi star times x times psi. Now, we stick the x in between the psi and the psi star for reasons that will become clear in a moment, but it's, uh, it's a tradition to do it that way, and it's a tradition that makes a difference when the thing whose expectation value we're computing uh, doesn't commute with the uh, position, in this case, the, the argument of the wave function. So this is where the momentum operator comes in. You guys are already familiar with the momentum operator from the reading. You know that it's uh, minus ih bar times the x derivative of the wave function. So the way you calculate the expectation value of the momentum is instead of sticking x in there, you stick in the probability of the momentum operator. <coughs> but you compute the expectation value in much the same way. Now we're going to be digging into this expression and why it turns out the way it does and, and how that really works uh, throughout the course. But I just wanted to write it out for you in this way so you can see where the formula comes from. Um, and you can kind of, maybe that'll help as a mnemonic for you to keep track of, of how it goes. All right, let's talk about the uh, quantum facts of life. There are a few of them that I wanted to just throw out there for you guys to sort of uh, have in the back of your minds as, you're, as we're going through this material. One is that the energies of bound systems are quantized. So if I have a system where a particle is stuck in a certain region of space and it can't get out because it doesn't have enough energy, that's called a bound system. And bound systems in quantum mechanics have definite energies that they can take on and, and other energies are forbidden. We're going to see the mechanism for that and how that all works as the course goes on, but I just wanted to have it as something that you have been exposed to. Also, things that are classically waves, like electromagnetic waves, in quantum mechanics end up behaving like particles. So, for example, photons are, are so-called particles of light. They have particle behavior. Uh, we saw that last week with the two-slit experiment. Um, you could have things that have a wave character, but also a part particle character. Uh, classical particles, things that we normally think of as particles, also have wave characteristics. So, for example, electrons. And we saw that again last week, so that's uh, part of what we did last time. And there are some basic relationships that you need to uh, absorb and internalize so deeply that they just seem obvious. But uh, I want to go over those. One is that energy and frequency are basically the same thing. We're going to see that uh, wave functions that um, whose phase rotates with a definite frequency are wave functions of definite energy. So frequency and energy basically mean the same thing. Momentum and wavelength mean the same thing. So wave functions that have a definite wavelength also have a corresponding definite momentum and vice versa. And finally that uh, if you have observables that are not compatible with each other, so for example, momentum and position are not compatible, it means you can't measure them at the same time, there's an uncertainty relationship between them that says that the uncertainty in the one observable multiplied by the uncertainty in the incompatible observable uh, have a minimum possible value, and that minimum in this case, in the case of momentum and 
and the position turns out to be Planck's constant. So uh, I just wanted to throw those out there as points of conversation. If you have questions about those things, please make a note of it, bring them in to class, and we'll talk about it. Um, I'm going to show the interference demo again this time. I wanted to remind you of it and what it says. Um, some of the things that, uh, that it ought to bring to mind are that in quantum mechanics, the, the thing that waves, the, the waving thing, is a probability amplitude. And that the amplitudes for alternative possibilities need to be added together. So if the thing can go this way or it can go that way and wind up in the same final situation, those two amplitudes need to be added to get the amplitude to be in the final situation. Um, the probability of a measurement is the squared magnitude of the sum of the alternative possibilities, the sum of the amplitudes for any alternative ways of having that possibility, and then finally the sum of probabilities of all the possibilities. So that if you add the probabilities up for every possible way, um, those, those uh, probabilities have to add up to one. All right. So what are we going to be doing today? Today we're focusing on complex numbers. So the main objective for today is to understand, become one with the idea of a complex number and how you deal with them. The other is to use these complex numbers, um, which turn out to be the values we use for quantum mechanical amplitudes. Use those quantum mechanical amplitudes to compute probabilities. Okay. So here we go. Let's talk about complex numbers. Complex numbers have a real part and an imaginary part. There is a formula called the Euler formula that we're going to be using to represent complex numbers in the complex plane. Um, this will bring to mind a representation of complex numbers that are it's called the phasor representation. And uh, when you get to class, we'll have some complex clicker questions, no pun intended, literally. Um, and also some board work to, to sort of exercise these ideas. Okay, let's talk about the complex plane. Um, a complex number can be thought of as an arrow in the complex plane. The complex plane has a real direction and an imaginary direction. The real part of a complex number is the part that points in the real direction, and the uh, imaginary part is the part that points in the imaginary direction. So you can think a complex number is a lot like a vector, but we don't call it a vector because it doesn't point in real space. It points in the complex plane, so it's a phasor. It's called a phasor. So, and there is a formula to describe the phasory part of a complex number. It's the Euler formula. Now I'm 92% sure you guys have seen the Euler formula before, but just in case you haven't, I'll remind you how it goes. If you have a complex number with a magnitude of 1, its real part is uh, the cosine of the angle that the phasor makes with the real axis, and the imaginary part is the sine of the angle that the phasor makes with the real axis. Um, you can also imagine a, non, a, a general complex number that has um, a magnitude other than 1, it could be bigger than 1, and you can use that same Euler formula to figure out what the uh, general representation of an arbitrary complex number would be. And it goes something like this. The real part is going to be A times the cosine of theta. The imaginary part is going to be the amplitude of the complex number, or the size of the complex number, times the sine of theta. Now, in this class, our phasors are going to depend on time. So the way it boils down is this. The phase of an amplitude, a quantum mechanical amplitude, is going to advance in time with a frequency that depends on energy. So the idea is you uh, replace the angle theta with a time-dependent um, angle that increases linearly in time, and it ends up looking something like this. So as time goes on, the phasors we use in this class are going to spin or rotate with a frequency that depends on energy. How does it depend on energy? Well, it's the Einstein relation. Um, energy is going to be h bar times omega. So that's all there is to it. Now you're going to see a lot of these phasors spinning in this class, so I guess try to 
internalize that concept and get used to it. Okay, how do you add two complex numbers? Well, it's pretty darn easy. Basically, the, uh, the real parts add and the imaginary parts add. So if I have a complex number that's the sum of two complex numbers, um, I end up adding the real parts together, and that gives me the real part of the result. I add the imaginary parts together, that gives me the imaginary part of the result. And you can see that that's exactly the same way vectors add. So the answer is complex numbers add just like vectors do. You can think of two phasers adding together exactly the same way two vectors might add together in two dimensions. What about multiplication? How do two complex numbers multiply? Well, it's, uh, it's different. <laughs> if I have a complex number, uh, 2 plus 3i, then you can work out the angle that the phasor for that number makes with the real axis, just the way you would a vector in physics 110. And the length, the size of the phasor, is going to be worked out the same way using the Pythagorean theorem. And you can do that with another complex number, the b that we used from the previous example. Same idea. But when I multiply these two complex numbers together, um, the easiest way to do it is with the Euler formula. You simply multiply the two complex numbers together just like you would any other number, but notice that the phase angle is in the exponent, whereas the magnitude of the number shows up as a coefficient in front. So you multiply the magnitudes and add the phases. So you can see how these two particular numbers uh, multiply. Um, the negative 45 degrees of B partly cancels the plus uh, 56 degrees of A, and you end up with something like 11 degrees of phase when you're done, or 0.197 radians. But uh, you multiply the magnitudes and add the phases. That's how that works. All right, so when you come to class today, be prepared. I'm going to have some clickers for you. I'll have some board work to try these things out. And we'll calculate some quantum mechanical amplitudes and some quantum mechanical probabilities using these tools of complex numbers. All right, we'll see you guys there. Welcome back. Here we are again. It's time for lesson three, the representation of complex things. OK. First of all, let's talk about some learning goals. The first is to understand how the Einstein relation appears in quantum mechanics. The second, understand how the de Broglie relationship actually sort of comes from the Einstein relation in special relativity. We're going to develop a geometrical interpretation of the amplitude e to the i k x, e to the minus i omega t. We've already talked about e to the minus i omega t. We haven't yet really addressed the e to the i k x, so we're going to talk about that today. And finally, we'll begin the development of a vPython program that's designed to illustrate a traveling wave in three dimensions. Now, uh, that piece is actually going to happen in class. I'm not going to say much about that in the podcast, but I wanted to let you know that it was coming so you could get your head screwed on and be ready for that. Let's begin with a little review. So you remember that we have this thing, uh, e to the i theta, from the Euler relation. You know that that can be thought of as a, a kind of an arrow in the complex plane that makes an angle theta with the real axis. We also know that uh, in quantum mechanics, these phasors change in time, and they change in time that depend in a way that depends on the energy. So we'd replace the theta with an omega t, where omega is given by the Einstein relation. And you may remember that we think of that as an arrow that sort of spins around with a frequency omega, uh, something like this. But today we're going to explode that a little bit and move it into a three-dimensional representation. It looks like an arrow spinning around like so. Um, I happen to look at it from a direction where it spins the other way. If you looked at it from the other side, it would spin the same way the original picture did. But in any case, um, the, uh, the way the Schrodinger equation is conventionally written, usually the time part comes in with a minus sign, so the, air, the phasors spin in the opposite direction, e to the minus i omega t. Now, for the purposes of today's lecture, uh, it's going to be helpful to have associated with phase not only a direction in this three-dimensional picture, but also a color. So I went ahead and developed a modified version of the program that changes the color of the vector as it goes around, the, the phaser as it goes around, so you could also determine the phase by looking at the color. So 
Let's think about the simplest possible situation we can imagine, and that probably is a single particle at rest. Now, if it's at rest, what do we know about its momentum? Well, we know its momentum is zero. But if we know its momentum is zero, that means we know its momentum exactly. But if you think about the uh, what you call uncertainty principle, if you know the momentum exactly, that means the uncertainty in the position must be infinite. So we don't know its position at all. X is completely unknown. That means that the amplitude or the probability density is constant, which means the magnitude of the quantum mechanical amplitude must be constant. So let's see, how can we imagine that happening? Um, the only way that can be, I, I, when I say constant, I mean constant in space. It can vary in time because the thing can have energy, but it can't depend on position. The probability density is a function of position has to be constant because we have no idea where the thing is. That means it's equally likely to be anywhere. Okay, what about its energy? Well, it, if it's at rest, its energy is its rest energy, which is just mc squared. So that tells us everything we need to know to deduce the wave function directly. We know it has to vary in time according to its energy, and we know it can't vary in space because we don't have any idea what its position is. We do know what its energy is because we know it's just the rest energy. So that tells us omega. Omega must be mc squared over h bar. Okay, how do we view this in three dimensions? You can imagine we've got a bunch of phasers. Each phaser represents the amplitude for the particle to be at any different location. And the magnitude of those phasers has to all be the same because the thing can't have any uh, dependence on position. And they all have to have the same phase because, again, the wave function can't depend on position. Um, so there we have it. What if we add color? If we add color, um, the phasers just change their color as they go around. And that's all there is to it. Okay, so what do these phasers look like in space-time? So in a space-time diagram, I use one direction to represent space. I use a different direction to represent time. Um, what I'm going to do is to use, since we don't have to worry about the amplitude of the wave function, all we have to worry about is its phase, I'm going to use uh, color to represent phase. So let's look at a space-time diagram. X is left and right, T is up and down. Let's imagine some events that might occur in that space-time diagram. Just to remind you about how space-time works, you might think about which of those two events occurs at the same place. If you say A and C, you're right. What, what about which two of those events occur at the same time? If you say A and B, you're right. So now you have an idea of what this thing means. Let's overlay the phase of our wave function on top of that picture. And you can see that the phase does what you think it would do. It, it advances in time, but it doesn't depend on position. Okay, that's the idea. So now let's imagine uh, overlaying on top of that a space-time diagram for an observer moving relative to this original observer. Now, just to get our head screwed on here, for this new observer who's moving to the right relative to the stationary particle, um, which of those two events now occur at the same time? In the frame of the moving observer, it's going to be B and C that occur at the same time. Good. And which two of those events occur at the same place, according to this moving observer? The answer is none of them. They all occur at different locations, according to this moving observer. Good. Okay. So uh, what we want to do now is to imagine putting ourselves into the frame of reference of the moving observer. So we're going to stretch the space-time diagram to do that. And notice what happens. In the moving observer's frame of reference, the phase varies with position. No longer is the phase constant, the same everywhere, the phase now has a positional dependence on position. <laughs> How did I say that? It depends on position. If you look at different values of x prime, you get a different phase. 
Now what happens if I redraw the, the phasers now with that um, spatial dependence? It ends up looking like this. And how does it go? The thing goes to the left. So this particle which was at rest in one frame of reference appears to be a wave function propagating to the left in the frame of reference of the moving observer. And it has a wavelength. That wavelength is determined by the speed of the moving observer. And notice that um, the faster they go, the shorter the wavelength becomes. That is the correct idea for the de Broglie relation. The de Broglie relation is actually a consequence of relativity. I don't, I'm 92% sure de Broglie didn't actually derive it this way, but, uh, but it does work out. Okay, let's look at the math of the situation. If, uh, if we start with our original wave function that only depends on time, we do a Lorentz transformation into these primed coordinates and substitute the time back in, we get a, uh, a wave function that looks like this. Notice it depends on space and time now. If we do a little algebra, cancel some stuff out, replace things with other things, and so on, we get the final result that looks like this. Notice that the coefficient of time is the energy in the prime frame, but the coefficient of space looks like the wave number. That's the momentum divided by h bar in the prime frame. So that means that uh, we've uncovered the de Broglie relation. The, mom the wave number k, 2 pi over lambda, goes like the momentum divided by h bar and the energy in the prime frame goes like uh, goes like the energy you'd expect it's gamma times e so um, if you think about that as a as a wave function notice that uh, you can factor out the space part and the time part the space part is at e to the i k x the time part is e to the minus i omega t that's exactly what we were talking about before. We have phasers that depend on position by uh, going one way, phasers that depend on time by going the other way, and that corresponds to a particle propagating in space and time. So that's how that works. Let's, uh, let's look at a movie that describes this in a little more detail. Okay, so here is a traveling wave, much like the one we talked about before. And I'm going to turn on the time, and you can see that uh, it's very clear. This traveling wave appears to be moving to the right. You can see if I turn off the time that the dependence of the phase on position is uh, just e to the i k x. I can uh, I can look at it from different angles. You can see it's got a definite circularity or or corkscrew direction and. Uh, and that corresponds to e to the plus i k x minus omega t. So the uh, time direction, the, when the thing advances in time, if you look at any particular location, when it advances in time, the phase goes one way, but it's the opposite direction that the thing goes if you take any moment in time and advance in x. So if you look, notice if, you, if I turn this way, as you advance in x, notice that the, uh, the phase is going in the clockwise direction, but if you advance the time at any given position, the phase is going in the counterclockwise direction. So that's, it's the combination of those two effects, the behavior of the phase as a function of position and the behavior of the phase as a function of time that gives you the direction of propagation. Now, let me... Uh, let me take away that one and turn on this one. This is exactly the same idea, except now the positional dependence of the phase is reversed. So now this one's going like e to the minus i k x, which means it's propagating to the left. Now you may remember that um, k corresponds to momentum and omega corresponds to energy. So the plus ikx corresponds to a particle with positive momentum. The minus ikx corresponds to a particle with negative momentum. So this particle, 
the particle that has this amplitude, this variation in amplitude on, on space and time, corresponds to a particle moving to the left. Now what I want to do is to show what happens when I put both amplitudes together. Notice that um, no longer do you see any indication that something's moving to the left or right, but by putting both sets of amplitudes on the screen at the same time, the whole thing appears to stop. In fact, if I show you the superposition of those two amplitudes, you can see that it is in fact a standing wave. Interesting. Now, um, if I put those two amplitudes back, actually let's do one other thing here before we get to that. Here we are back to the right propagating wave. Let's calculate the probability density. How do I do that? It's just the length of the arrow squared. So, and I rescale it to make it uh, fit in the picture. This green cylinder represents the probability density. Notice probability is a real number. So how do you represent that on a complex plane? Well, you just make a solid cylinder that, uh, that doesn't care about what the phase direction is. It just gives you a magnitude. So for a right propagating wave, the thing looks like this. For a left propagating wave, it looks like that. All that says is that the amplitude of the phasers is not a function of position. But what happens when I add the two right and left propagating waves together? Something interesting. You can see that at some places the two phasers cancel, at other places they add, and what you end up with is a probability distribution that has humps in it. So this looks like the particle is likely to be found in those places where the phasers add. It's very unlikely to be found in those places where the phasers add destructively. They add everywhere, but they add constructively in some places, destructively in others. So uh, also notice what's the momentum, what's the expectation value, I guess, or the average momentum in the case when you have both left and right propagating waves. Right, the answer is zero because you have a 50% probability of finding yourself propagating to the right, an equal probability of finding yourself propagating to the left, and so the average momentum, the average uh, overall momentum is zero. This is sometimes called a standing wave because the probability density does not depend on time the total momentum, the average momentum, the expectation value of the momentum is zero. So that's the way that goes. All right, so that's all for this lesson. We'll see you in class, and we'll talk about writing vPython programs that, uh, that exploit some of this uh, lovely math. Talk to you soon. Bye. Welcome back. It's time for lesson four. Today we're going to be talking about stationary states and superposition. So you remember last time we discussed the plane wave solutions to the Schrodinger equation, which are solutions that correspond to a particle of exact momentum and exact energy, but absolutely uncertain position. In other words, they're particles that uh, are not confined at all, they're completely free, and uh, they have 100% uncertainty in position and zero uncertainty in momentum. Um, now, you recall that the wave function factors into two parts. There's the part that has to do with the energy, and there's the part that has to do with the momentum. The energy part is what determines the time dependence of any phaser at a particular position. In other words, if you pick a position in space, and you imagine watching the amplitude of the wave function at that point in space, it will simply spin in time with the frequency omega that's determined entirely by the energy. On the other hand, if you take a snapshot in time, so time is constant, and you look at the behavior of the wave function over some range of distance, you'll notice that the phasers advance in phase as you move in x according to e to the ikx. They just rotate as you move in x, um, and that rotation rate is the wave number k, the number of radians per meter, say, and uh, it's determined entirely by the momentum. All right, so let's try to generalize this a little bit. We want to talk about 
operators that operate on wave functions to uh, give us new results that are often, in this case, related to observables. So let's talk about the uh, first observable we're going to discuss is momentum. So momentum is an observable in quantum mechanics. That means it's uh, represented by an operator that acts on the wave function. Uh, another observable is energy, which is also represented by a, an operator that acts on the wave function. And uh, it's probably most useful just to see the effect of acting on the wave function with these operators. Let's, uh, let's try the momentum operator. If you hit the wave function with the momentum operator, you take the derivative with respect to x. And since it's a simple exponential, in this case, the free particle wave function, down comes an i and a k. But you'll notice that the i in the ik and the minus i in the operator combine to become just 1. And so you end up with just h bar k times the original wave function back again. Now that's a form of uh, equation we're going to see over and over in this class. We have an operator acting on a wave function, which produces a value times the wave function back again. That means that this wave function is a particularly interesting wave function with respect to this operator. It's called an eigenfunction, a very special function, which means it has a definite value of the observable associated with that operator. It's, in this case, it's got a definite value of momentum. It's called an eigenvalue. The eigenvalue is the value of momentum associated with this eigenfunction. Okay? You can do the same thing with the energy operator. The energy operator acting on this wave function uh, does a similar thing. It pulls down an minus i omega, and the minus i omega and the plus i h bar combine to create an eigenvalue again of h bar omega, and that is, of course, just the energy associated with this particle moving in free space. So again, we have an operator. Uh, acting on a wave function, producing a value multiplied by the same wave function. That means this wave function is a very special wave function with respect to the energy operator. It's an eigenfunction of energy. That means it has an exact value of energy. Any wave function that has a factor e to the minus i omega t is a wave function of definite energy. And that value, again, is called the eigenvalue. Okay. Now, what other kinds of operators can we generate? You know, we've got the momentum operator. What about kinetic energy? What kind of, how could I form an operator like that? Right, so you you want to use the relationship of kinetic energy to momentum, p squared over 2m, substitute the momentum operator, and you get the kinetic energy operator. It's just the momentum operator squared divided by 2m. What about the x operator? Well. We're using x as a coordinate to represent our wave function, so the x operator is just the x value at any particular place. And uh, there's a new operator, which I'm sure you heard of when you took your mechanics class, is uh, h, the Hamiltonian operator. It's simply the sum of the kinetic energy operator and the potential energy operator. Generally, the potential energy operator just depends on position. So you could think of that as the kinetic energy operator, p squared over 2m, plus the potential energy operator, which only depends on x. So that's our Hamiltonian operator. We can make a statement about energy, which says that the kinetic energy plus the potential energy is equal to the total energy. And we can express that statement in the form of operators acting on the wave function. The Hamiltonian acting on the wave function is the same thing as the energy operator acting on the wave function. And that is the Schrodinger equation. If I replace the energy operator with the time derivative version um, that we just discussed in the last slide, you'll see that it is exactly the Schrodinger equation. Okay, so now we're going to do a bunch of math with this equation. We're going to do what's called separation of variables. So the idea is you start with the Schrodinger equation and you break the wave function down into two pieces, a part that only depends on the time and a part that only depends on space. So the idea is um, we factor the wave function into two pieces, and you'll notice that the energy operator only acts on the time part, and the Hamiltonian only acts on the space part. 
So what that means is we can sort of divide through by uh, little psi times little phi, and we get an interesting situation where on one side of the equal sign, we have a function that only depends on the time. On the other side of the equal sign, we have a function that only depends on space. And if you think about it for a little while, you realize that the only way we could have a solution that wasn't utterly trivial, like a constant or something, is if these ratios have to equal the same constant. That constant, in this case, turns out to be the energy eigenvalue. So the energy eigenvalue is the thing that determines omega. It's also, and it ties the time part to the space part through this so-called eigenvalue formula. And uh, we get that the time derivative of phi is related to the energy. Of course, this is just the, uh, the Einstein relation, basically. The energy is simply h bar omega. So, and this result, this uh, result for, for the time part of the wave function is very general and very simple. It basically says that if you've got an, uh, an eigenfunction of the energy, that that eigenfunction is going to rotate in, with the frequency omega. What's left is the spatial part. We haven't solved the spatial part of the differential equation yet. So we plug the e back in and solve for psi of x. And this is the so-called time-independent Schrodinger equation. In other words, we uh, propose that there must be some uh, set of energies, e, that are the eigenvalues, and those energies must correspond to solutions of this spatial part of the differential equation. Okay, so um, let's talk about the general properties of these equations. In general, there are many solutions to the time-independent Schrodinger equation. Each solution is a stationary state. Um, each solution has its own value of the energy. Each solution rotates at a different rate. And general solutions are built as superposition of stationary states. So that's the idea. Uh, so let's see what that says. Oh, I should point out that talking about superpositions of stationary states, we're going to be adding phasers together. When we make superpositions of stationary states, we're going to be adding phasers with different frequency. So uh, let's see what that looks like. If you have two phasers with different frequency, they're going to add something like this. Notice that uh, sometimes they uh, are constructively adding, and other times they're destructively adding. It's easier to see what's going on if you imagine switching to a frame of reference that rotates with the slower phaser. So let's do that. We'll switch to such a frame of reference, and you'll notice that now it looks quite simple. Either the phasers add, or that they either add together in the same direction, or they add in the opposite direction, and, and the resultant is smaller. Um, but that's the basic idea. Now, I think the most important thing is you start to get some intuition about how these solutions to the Schrodinger equation work. And so let me go ahead and get started on that. We'll do a little demo and talk about the simplest case of a collection of stationary states. It's called the infinite square well. OK, so here we are looking at a solution to the Schrodinger equation in the simplest possible case, which is the infinite square well. Now, an infinite square well is really just a, a fictional situation where you imagine that a particle is confined to live in a finite space in one dimension, and it has zero probability of escaping. So in terms of potential energy, the only way to accomplish that is to have the potential energy go to infinity at the edges of the box and to be zero inside. That's the simplest case. And so that's the way you implement the thing mathematically. The solutions just turn out to be sine functions, which start at zero at the left edge and go back to zero at the right edge. They're exactly the same as the solutions to waves on a string that is attached at both ends. And so you should be familiar with the basic, uh, basic result. The interesting thing is that because the momentum is 
inversely proportional to the wavelength as the wavelength halves, the momentum doubles. But the only energy in the problem is kinetic energy because in those places where the potential energy is not zero, the wave function is zero, and so there's no chance the particle will be found anywhere but where the potential energy is zero, and so the potential energy actually makes no contribution to the total energy of the system. So it's all kinetic energy, it's p squared over 2m, the momentum goes like 1 over the wavelength, so having the wavelength doubles the momentum and quadruples the energy. So the the ground state, the lowest possible energy that can exist, is the state that looks like this. The first excited state is similar, but it's got half the wavelength, so it looks like, like so. Now let's watch what happens if I turn on the time. The ground state wave function is going to rotate. Each of the phasors is going to rotate with a frequency that's determined by the energy in the ground state. It's just uh, sine kx times e to the minus i omega 1 t, where omega 1 is the frequency of the ground state. Now, if you look at the uh, first excited state, it rotates with a frequency that's four times the frequency of the ground state, for the reason I just mentioned, that the wavelength is half, that means the momentum is double, but since the kinetic energy is the only energy, um, it goes like momentum squared, and so doubling the momentum quadruples the energy. Now we can watch what happens when I have both the ground state and the first excited state, the n equals 1 and n equals 2 states together. You'll notice that uh, every time the ground state goes around once, the first excited state goes around four times. So um, that's consistent with our understanding. What happens if I create a superposition state, that is a state that's a linear combination of the ground state and the first excited state. That's easy enough to do. I can just add these two guys together and you'll see what I've got. Let me uh, move things around a little bit so you can see kind of what's going on. You'll notice that when the phasers on one side of the well from the two different states are pointing in the same direction, we get a superposition that's large. But when they point in the opposite direction, the superposition on that side of the well becomes small. Um, because the first excited state is positive on one side of the well and has the opposite phase on the other side of the well, this has the effect of making the superposition wave function sort of slosh around back and forth. Now, just like I did in the earlier slide, we can go into a frame of reference in which the ground state is stationary. Hang on a second. There we go. So all we've done is to switch into a frame of reference that's rotating with the ground state. And so uh, you can see a little bit more easily what's going on because the, uh, the ground state's not moving. So you can see that when the first excited state is in phase with the ground state, we get a big amplitude on that side, and when it's out of phase, the amplitude shifts to the other side. There's one last thing I can point out here, and that is the probability density. So if we, uh, if we just look at the ground state, the probability density looks something like this. All I've done is to uh, create a cylindrically symmetric um, how would you call it? It's like a cylinder, similar to the ones we looked at with the traveling waves, but basically the green represents the squared magnitude of the corresponding phasor. And we can do the same thing with the, uh, with the first excited state. Now we've got the, those bloopy looking things along the axis represent the probability amplitude. I'm sorry, they represent the probability. It's the square of the amplitude. And you can see that uh, where the amplitude goes to zero, the probability goes to zero, and so on. This also indicates why these are called stationary states. Look at the probability distribution for this state. It doesn't change in time. And that's because all these phasers are doing is spinning. They're not changing their length. They're not doing anything else. And so the probability density is fixed in time. And hence, this is called a stationary state. 
Now what happens if I put both the ground state and the first excited state in a superposition? I add them together. Now something interesting happens. Now the probability density according to the amplitude of the superposition is sloshing back and forth. So this is not a stationary state. A superposition state is a state that has poorly defined energy. What's the energy of the state? Well, we've got a 50% chance of being in the ground state. We've got a 50% chance of being in the first excited state. So the expectation value of the energy is going to be um, a half of the sum, I guess. So that's going to be uh, 2.5 times the energy of the ground state or something. Um, so anyway, I hope that's uh, useful for you to think about. We're, we'll do a couple of projects with the infinite square well. The next uh, computing project after the traveling wave project will involve uh, Fourier coefficients and superposition states and all kinds of fun stuff. But uh, for now, that's it, and we'll see you guys in class. Okay, welcome back. It's time for lesson five. Today we're going to study the infinite square well, which is our first real system. Okay, so first of all, why study the infinite square well? The answer is because it's simple. Well, let's look. If you check in the text, you'll see problems that are worked out for the infinite square well, like this one. Doesn't that look simple? And then, of course, there's calculating Fourier coefficients for the infinite square well. That seems pretty simple. Then there's things like uh, building up superpositions of wave functions using the stationary states of the infinite square well. Kind of simple. And then, of course, there's testing for orthonormality of the stationary states of the infinite square well. That's looking really super simple. Okay, I think you get the idea. I'm, I'm kind of joking here. The math looks pretty hairy, but... Uh, but the truth is it's not that bad if you can stick to the fundamentals. So what we want to do is keep our brains focused on the fundamental ideas and see if we can't use our comfort with those ideas to ease the pain of the otherwise sort of hideous calculus that we're going to run into. Just to recap, those ideas are the Einstein relation, the fact that frequency and energy are related to each other. We're going to find that the stationary states of the infinite square well each rotate with a different frequency, and that frequency is determined by the energy of the state. The de Broglie relation, the idea that momentum is related to the wave number k, and the wave numbers are determined by the requirement that the wave function fit inside the square well, uh, that, half, that the width of the square well is either one half wavelength or two half wavelengths or three half wavelengths, just, just like standing waves on a string. And the de Broglie relation tells us, given the wavelength, what the momentum associated with that, or what the magnitude of the momentum associated with that state might be. We're going to be focusing on the uncertainty principle. It turns out the uncertainty principle also relates the size of the well to the kind of momentum you expect to see, um, magnitude of momentum. We're going to be adding amplitudes together to get the total wave function. And we're going to be calculating probability densities by squaring the amplitude. So all those ideas are going to come back and we're going to use them in the context of the infinite square well. If you solve the Schrodinger equation for the infinite square well, you get solutions that are sines and cosines. In fact, the time-independent Schrodinger equation for the infinite square well is exactly the same equation as you get when you solve for standing waves on a on a physical string stretched between two points. And I'm, I'm sure you're familiar with those. Uh, if you need help seeing how the solutions come about, please, you know, ask, but, uh, but it's straightforward. The, uh, the stationary states are numbered 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and so on. And you can see that the, that the number of each stationary state just corresponds to the number of half wavelengths that fit inside the well. I'm showing you examples for a well with a width of one unit, but of course you can have any well width, and that only affects the size of the of the wavelengths. If you calculate probability densities, you do that by squaring these amplitudes. You'll notice that the probability densities uh, also kind of look like sines, except that they're shifted up. Um, they're like sine squareds. Okay, so 
they have, uh, well, you can see what they have. They have all positive values because probabilities have to be all positive real numbers. And so uh, the probability densities also have to be positive and real. But there are the first five stationary states corresponding probability densities. Okay, what are the important ideas here? Number one important idea is normalization. In other words, these states, although we know the solutions from the Schrodinger equation, in order to completely define them, we have to make sure they're normalized. So the idea is you start with an eigenstate, psi sub n. This is the spatial part of the time-independent Schrodinger equation, the solution to the Schrodinger equation. And uh, the factor in front of the x, I'm going to call that k sub n. It's n pi over a. It's a uh, the required factor in order to make sure the sine function goes to zero at the right edge of the well, assuming x starts at zero on the left edge, all signs will go to zero there, but the only way to get it to go to zero at the other edge is to make sure that the wave number is an integer multiple of pi over a. So th that gives us our k sub n's. Anyway, to normalize it, we have to make sure that the probability density integrated across the well is one. And you can see that's an easy integral to write down. Uh, sine squareds are easy integrals to do because sine squared always has a value, an average value of a half. So when you integrate over an integer number of half wavelengths, you get uh, one half times the size of the well. So it's uh, a over two. So when you do the integral, you get one is equal to capital A squared times A over two. And that means that capital A has to be the square root of 2 divided by the width of the well. So the normalization constant goes inversely like the square root of the width of the well. Okay, let's talk about energies of these states. You know, the only energy that there is is kinetic energy, because everywhere where there's potential energy, the wave function is 0. So the only energy we have to worry about is kinetic energy. The kinetic energy operator, we already know, is the... Uh, minus h bar squared over 2m times the second derivative with respect to x. That's the first term in the Schrodinger's equation we always write down. And uh, the psi sub n's are eigenstates of kinetic energy, of this kinetic energy operator. So that means it's easy to calculate the corresponding kinetic energy. We just apply the kinetic energy to one of our uh, eigenstates, one of our stationary states, and what we get out is the kinetic energy times the stationary state back again. So that means it's just got to be um, the momentum squared over 2m. Momentum, of course, is h bar k sub n. So we write all that out. We plug in what k sub n is. It's n pi over a. And you can say that you can see that the energy is easy to calculate for the infinite square. Well, it's just p squared over 2m. And it looks kind of intimidating as you see it written out there with all the h bars and the pi's and everything, but uh, it's actually not that bad. All right, another important idea. Let's look at orthonormality. Orthonormality is the property that the stationary states have, that if you integrate psi star of one stationary state against psi of a different stationary state, or the same stationary state, you get 1 if n and m are the same. In other words, psi star psi uh, for any single n is always 1. It's normalized. But if n and m are different, you get 0. So that delta nm there has a name. It's called the Kronecker delta. It, uh, it just is shorthand that says it's 1 when n is equal to m, and it's 0 when n is not equal to m. Okay, so what good is that? Well, it's good when we're talking about wave functions that are superpositions of stationary states. We'll see in a minute that uh, useful wave functions or real wave functions in the real world are, are never exactly eigenstates, but they're usually superpositions of eigenstates. So let's... Uh, Let's look at that. We have a wave function that's a little bit of psi 1 plus a little bit of psi 2 plus, who knows, some other uh, contributions. The thing on the left is a general wave function. That's, uh, you know, some wave function that's been set up in the laboratory, say. And the things on the right are stationary states. So the idea is we're writing out a general wave function as a superposition of stationary states. Now let's say we want to normalize this general wave function. How are we going to do that? Well, we're going to have to calculate psi star psi and integrate it over all of x. Well, if you plug in the definition of the general wave function, you can see that that uh, looks pretty hairy. It's the integral of the superposition star times the superposition, the original superposition, and then integrate it over all x. 
But let's the cool thing about integrals over all x and, and these sums is that it doesn't matter if you integrate the sum or you sum the integrals. So we can re swap out the order of summation and integration. And you'll notice what I've got over there on the right is the integral of psi star sub n times psi of m. Well, that's exactly the orthonormality integral. And we know what that one turns out to be. It's delta nm. That means it's 1 if n is equal to m and 0 everywhere else. So the whole sum over m, only one term counts. It's the one where m is equal to n. And so that means I can throw out all the m's and just write that as uh, cn star cn because the m where m is equal to n is the only one that counts. But of course that's just the nth coefficient multiplied by its complex conjugate, which of course is just the magnitude of the nth coefficient squared. So what we just figured out is that the, the integral of psi star psi is just the sum of the squares of the coefficients. That's really cool. How do we figure out what the coefficients are? Well, we can rewrite the sum, and then we'll do something crazy. We'll multiply each side of the sum by psi star sub n and integrate over all x. Notice that on the left, that's an integral that if I know the general wave function I'm trying to represent, it's a function that I know. But on the right, I've got psi star n multiplied by all these other stationary states. Again, I can uh, expand that out and integrate. The sum of integrals is an integral of sums. Uh, backwards, an integral of a sum is the sum of the integrals. So I can, and the c sub n's are just constant numbers. So I can write that out as a series of integrals of n on 1, n on 2, n on n, and so on. But of course we know that n on 1 is 0 and n on 2 is 0. The only one that counts is the one where n is multiplied by n because of orthonormality. And that means that the, uh, the result of that sum is just c sub n. So that's really cool too. So the, so the answer is the way you figure out the nth coefficient is to multiply the wave function you're trying to represent with the superposition by the nth stationary state complex conjugate and integrate over all x. And that will give you a number which is the value of the nth coefficient. The last issue is how do I figure out what the wave function does in time? And then we go back to the Einstein relation, and you just notice that each term in the superposition corresponds to a particular energy eigenstate, and each term corresponds to an amplitude that rotates at a different rate. So to get the full time dependence of the wave function, we simply multiply each term by the corresponding phase factor that goes with that energy. And that's really all there is to it. And in fact, you could say that that is all there is to quantum mechanics uh, in, at, at some level. It, um, we're going to find out that there are more problems than the infinite square well to worry about, but that the general principle that we break wave functions down into stationary states, and each stationary state rotates with the frequency that, cor that uh, corresponds to its energy, uh, that really is about all there is to it. Okay, what we're going to do now is look at a little VPython demo that to illustrate some of these ideas using the uh, three-dimensional phasers that we've been talking about. And then when you get to class, you're actually going to calculate the Fourier coefficients or the, the linear superposition coefficients for an example where the particle starts on the left half of an infinite square well and then the wave function evolves in time from that initial condition. All right. Okay, so here we are looking at the ground state of the infinite square well wave function again, and you can see it, it rotates with a frequency omega. Now, we looked at this a little bit last time. I just wanted to point out something that I neglected to when we last spoke, and that is if you add the uh, first excited state, n equals 2, which has 4 times the energy, and then look at the um, probability distribution that sloshes back and forth, I wanted to point out something about the frequency of sloshing. The, uh, as the ground state goes around once, the first excited state goes around 4 times, but the frequency of the sloshing is three times every time the ground state goes around once. Let's watch that. 
starting at the top word left left that's one time two times and then three times so it did it three times if you go into the frame of reference in which the ground state is stationary and watch uh, what happens you'll see why that is in that frame of reference the um, first excited state is now going around with the frequency 3 omega 1 instead of 4 omega 1 and the sloshing happens every time the first excited state passes through the same uh, passes through the plane of the of the ground state so the interesting point is that the sloshing frequency is the difference in frequency between the ground state and the first excited state. This has relevance because if you have an electron making a transition from the excited state to the ground state, its charge density is going to slosh just like this, and that charge density is going to radiate with the frequency equal to the difference in frequency between the two states. And that's just the right frequency so that the energy of the radiated photon is equal to the energy difference between the two states. Okay, so that's how that works. This is a slightly different demo where uh, we can look at the ground state, the first excited state, the, let's look at the next third excited state. Now notice that they have different amplitudes. It turns out I've picked coefficients for these states that are just right to confine the particle to the left half of the well if I added an infinite number of them together. Of course, I only have seven here. So if you go, um, let's see, one, two, three, four turns out to not contribute at all. We'll find out why when we solve the board work problem today in class. Five, six, and seven. Eight also doesn't contribute at all, so uh, it's not included. If I add uh, all these states together and watch them go, let's look what they look like. You can see that each of them is spinning with its own frequency. Each state rotates with a frequency that corresponds to its energy. Now, remember the energy of the stationary states of the infinite square well go like n squared. So that means the ground state is 1, first excited state is 4, and then you go 9, uh, 16, and so on, 25, 36, 49. So it turns out the seventh excited state, which is the I forget which color that is. Let's see. That is the purple. It's going around 49 times every time the ground state goes around once. But if I add them all back in again, you can see how they go. Let's look at the superposition. That's the superposition. That's the full quantum state of all those guys added together. So you can see it. It looks kind of crazy. But uh, if we turn off the time, and reset so that we're looking at t equals zero, you'll notice that indeed, go ahead and turn off all the individual components, the particle is pretty well confined to the left edge of the well. Now it's not perfect. If you'll notice, there is a little bit over here that's not confined to the left edge of the well, but that's only because I've only added seven terms. If I added more terms, many more terms, uh, then on the left I'd have a square it would look like a square wave, it would be a flat top, and it would go suddenly to zero, and I have zero over here. But because I only have seven terms in my sum, it doesn't quite make it. But uh, if I turn on the time, you'll notice that the wave function goes crazy. And uh, But the other thing I want to point out is that if you wait until the ground state wave function goes through one full cycle, let's see if we can see that. I'll go ahead and bump it up here. When it gets to one full cycle, right about there, the wave function returns to its original look. So this thing is periodic. And if you look at the Fourier expansion, if you look at the coefficients and see what happens when the ground state goes through one full cycle, you'll see that this is exactly what you'd expect. All right. So here's our first example of a real wave function that starts out. It's not a stationary state, obviously. It's a superposition state but you can see what happens to the, uh, to the total wave function. What about the probability? The probability dances around, similar way. Again, if you wait till the ground state wave function gets back to its uh, original orientation, see if we can do it here, you're gonna find that the probability is all confined to the left-hand side, it repeats. 
and that's how it works. All right. Okay, welcome back. It's time for lesson six, more on the infinite square well, superpositions of stationary states, and a little introduction to Dirac notation. Now, first of all, let's consider a wave function that's made up of components. Each component is a stationary state, a normalized orthonormal stationary state of the potential. In this case, it's the infinite square well. Now, how do we get the values of these coefficients? Well, if we know what the total wave function we want is, in other words, if we know the function we're shooting for, we can do a trick. It's called Fourier's trick. What you do is you multiply both sides of the first equation by psi star sub n, where n is an arbitrary integer, and then you integrate over the domain of the potential, in this case uh, from one side of the well to the other side of the well, and, uh, and you fiddle around. Now notice that what we have here is an integral of a sum, and that's the same as the sum of the integrals. But the integral you see on the right hand side, the psi star n psi m, you already know the answer to that one. It uh, is determined by the orthonormality of the stationary states and it's a delta nm, the Kronecker delta. So it's only one if n and m match. But the sum is over all m, but the uh, n is a single integer, one of the states, and so only one term survives the sum. And so you get that the nth coefficient is just the integral of psi star n on the total wave function you want to try to create via superposition. Okay. Now let's say we start with that same superposition, but let's express it in a slightly different way. This is about Dirac notation. Dirac notation is a shorthand that enables us to write down complicated expressions without as much labor. So basically it's a labor-saving device. Um, the idea is to replace the wave function with a ket. It's what's called a ket. And each of the stationary states becomes a ket with just the number of the stationary state. So these two statements mean exactly the same thing. In other words, we're going to suppress the space dependence of the wave function, but we know it's there. It's just that we don't have to write it all out each time. And then instead of writing out explicit integrals, we use a slightly different notation with a bracket symbol that faces the other way. It's called a bracket, or it's supposed to be like bracket, but it's called a bracket. Um, it's a combination of a backwards ket and another ket, and it really is just a shorthand for the explicit integral that you could calculate by taking phi star and multiplying by psi and integrating over all x, or integrating over the domain of the problem. Now, if you flop the psi and the phi, then you can see right away that what you get is the complex conjugate. In other words, if you switch the psi and the phi, you get the complex conjugate of whatever it was you had before. Now remember how we found the coefficients before with the uh, detailed integral expressions that went over all x? We can do the same computation without having to write out all the integrals using the Dirac, Bra, and Ket notation. We can hit the left-hand side of our psi with the Bra n and uh, you can see that the same trick happens. The bra acting on the sum is the same as the sum of the bras acting on the individual kets. And again, the uh, n on m is the integral of psi star n psi m, and that is delta nm. So once again, the, uh, the result is that the nth coefficient is uh, the bra n acting on the full wave function or the full state psi. So it's, it really means nothing different than what we already have done, except that we don't have to write all the integrals and the dx's and the stars and, and so on. It's really just a time-saving device. And it looks a little weird probably at the beginning, but as you, uh, as you move along, you'll get used to it. There's a useful analogy with vectors as well, like if you're used to vectors like this, where you have a vector a that's got an x and a y and a z component. You can think of kets as being a little bit like unit vectors. 
They're unit vectors that point in a direction in state space. It's not real space, it's not physical space, but it's a space of possible quantum states. And uh, the number of directions in that space is the same as the number of possible or basis states. Uh, for example, if we lived in a universe that had uh, three quantum basis states, we might be able to express a vector A or a ket A as a superposition of 1, 2, and 3, a lot like i hat, j hat, and k hat. And a1, a2, and a3 are sort of like the components of a in the 1, 2, and 3 directions. Now, in pointy vector space and positional vector space, we have this idea called a dot product. Well, the bra ket is analogous to exactly such a dot product. It's called the inner product of the vector space. And you can calculate the x component of an arbitrary vector by dotting the vector with i hat. In the same way, you can calculate the component of one of these generic Dirac state vectors by dotting or taking the inner product of the nth basis state with the full vector a. And if you, if you think about that, you realize you can rewrite the vector sum from the top in this way. You'll notice that uh, 1 on a is the same thing as a sub 1, and 2 on a is the same thing as a sub 2, and so on. In general, a sub n is the inner product of the nth basis vector and the full vector a. But uh, if you look at that for a second, you realize you can factor out the ket, the a ket on the right, and you can write it this way. And that is interesting because it says the, the ket a is the product of the ket a with this stuff, the superposition of these bras and kets, 1, 2, and 3. And I should say, if there were a higher dimensional space, if you had more basis vectors, you'd have to increase the size of the sum. But if you think about that, the thing in square brackets is really nothing more than the identity operator. It's an operator which, when acting on a ket, produces the same ket back again. And that is a fundamental theorem of linear algebra. It says if I, if I make a combination of bras and kets like this that includes all the basis vectors that I can create an identity operator by adding them all together, each individual term in the sum is a projector. It's called a projection operator that projects out the nth component of the full vector. And if you add all those projection operators together, then you're not projecting anything, you're not doing anything, you're just multiplying by 1. Let's do an example calculation with this notation just to kind of get the flavor of it. Let's say we wanted to know the Hamiltonian, the expectation value of the Hamiltonian in some state psi. In conventional notation, the way you compute that would be to calculate psi star times the Hamiltonian operator times psi and integrate over all space. Well, in Dirac notation, that same operation can be written as the bra psi uh, inner product with the Hamiltonian operator acting on the ket psi. So uh, what is the ket psi? Remember what the ket psi is, is a superposition of um, basis states, or eigenstates, in this case, they're eigenstates of the Hamiltonian. What do I get if I apply the Hamiltonian operator to that thing? Well, I just apply the Hamiltonian operator to the sum. Of course, the ha Hamiltonian operator is linear. It's a linear operator, which means that the Hamiltonian operating on a sum is, same, is the same thing as the sum of the Hamiltonian operator operating on each individual guy, so I can distribute the Hamiltonian over the individual basis vectors. But remember, these basis vectors are eigenvectors of the Hamiltonian. This is n equals 1, n equals 2, n equals 3. Each of those has a definite energy. We can call the energies e1, e2, and e3. But uh, you can see now what the Hamiltonian operator does is it multiplies each of the basis states by its corresponding energy. And uh, if I move those guys up to the top and keep going, you'll see that uh, the expectation value of the Hamiltonian is going to be the bra psi acting on this superposition, where each term in the superposition is now multiplied by the corresponding energy. But don't forget what psi is. Psi is c1 times 1 plus c2 times 2 plus c3 times 3 
So what is the bra side going to look like? Well, when you when you make a bra, it has to uh, get the bra of each term plus uh, it's got to include C1, C2, and C3. But remember the behavior of inner products. When you flip them, you get the complex conjugate. So when you flip a ket, you get a bra, but the coefficients are the complex conjugates of the coefficients for the ket. So I'm going to get C1 star times the bra 1 plus C2 star times the bra 2 and so on. And when I multiply these together, I'm going to get a bunch of cross terms. I'll get C1 star E1 C1 and C2 star E1 C1 and C1 star E2 C2 and so on. But notice that uh, I'm also getting the bra 1 on the ket 1, the bra 2 on the ket 1, the bra 1 on the ket 2 and so on. But those are uh, orthonormal so that when 1 and 1 hit each other you get 1. But when 2 and 1 hit each other you get nothing. And when 1 and 2 hit each other, you get nothing. When 2 on 2 hits each other, you get 1, and so on. So the only terms in the sum that are going to survive are C1 star C1, C2 star C2, and so on. And each of those is going to get multiplied by the corresponding energy, the energy that corresponds to that state, so that when the smoke clears, you get a result like this. Uh, the expectation value of the Hamiltonian is C1 squared, C1 magnitude squared, E1, plus C2 magnitude squared, E2, and so on. But remember what expectation value means. It means the probability of getting E1 times E1, plus the probability of getting E2 times E2, plus the probability of getting E3 times E3, and so on. So what that says is these magnitudes of these coefficients squared is nothing other than the probability of measuring the corresponding energy. So these are the probabilities of measuring E1, E2, E3, and so on. Okay, so that's a little more Dirac notation or the introduction to Dirac notation. It's, it's really not bad. You'll, you'll get used to it as we move along. And also some reminders about how the infinite square well works. Uh, this brings us to Computing Project 3. I want to take a few minutes to discuss Computing Project 3 so you guys are ready for it. Basically, we're going to imagine we have a wave function in an infinite square well where the wave function begins uh, with a uniform probability of finding the particle anywhere on the left half of the well and zero probability of finding the particle on the right half of the well. Last time we worked out the expansion coefficients um, for this situation and we worked out the wave function the wave function is the square root of 2 over a. It's a constant if x is less than a over 2, and it's 0 everywhere else. And the expansion coefficient is a function of n, but uh, these guys are uh, the sum of the squares of these coefficients is 1, because the probability of being in any of these states has to add up to 1. And you can see that uh, these just correspond to the amplitude associated with each of the basis states or each of the eigenstates of this particular Hamiltonian. Uh, what happens to the wave function at later times if it starts out in this state? Well, the answer is you can just take each component and multiply it by the phase factor e to the minus i omega sub n t. Or in Dirac notation, you can take each ket and multiply it by e to the minus i omega nt. And that tells you what the wave function does later. So the goal of this computing project is to set the wave function up so that the electron is in the left half of the well, and then to compute the behavior of the electron at future times. By what I mean by behavior is what the behavior of the wave function, of course. So in order to do that, you're going to need to learn a few more Python tricks. I'm guessing you guys mostly know these, but just as a reminder, if psi is an array of complex numbers, to get the squared magnitude, to get an array where each element of the array is the squared magnitude of the corresponding complex number, you can use the ABS function, ABS. It stands for absolute. Uh, it calculates the absolute magnitude of the phasor in each cell. And of course, to get the squared magnitude, we have to square it. Remember, in Python, squaring is done by the double star operator, same as Fortran. Then um, to get the sum of the square magnitudes, we can use the sum function. The sum function is a, it's really a method of an array object. If you just call sum directly, it'll add up all the elements of the array. 
if you slice the array first, which means you take a portion of the array, you can sum up a f some part of the array. So to calculate, for example, the probability of being on the left, you might want to um, add up all the elements up to the halfway point. So to, to do that, you'd calculate the uh, slice of psi from 0 to the length of psi over 2, take the absolute value of those elements, square them, and sum them. And that's uh, an easy way to do it in one line. All right, so your mission is to compute the wave function at any time, compute the probability of finding the particle on the left half in the left half of the well. It should be in the left half of the well. Graph the result of that probability calculation as a function of time, and to graph the expectation value of the position of the electron, in other words, the expectation value of x, as a function of time. That's interesting because that's related to the dipole moment of the electric charge uh, in many systems that involve electrons. Just to remind you how to do a graph in Visual Python, you, uh, you import from visual.graph all the symbols. That gets you a symbol called gDisplay, so you can create a graph window with a title and an x and y axis label. You can create a curve that acts in that display using the gCurve object. You'll want to specify a color. And then you can make some kind of a loop that calculates stuff. And inside the loop, you'd want to do a gr.plot. So gr.plot will actually plot a point on that graph. You can have as many graphs as you like per display. You just create as many g-curve objects as you like. And you can have multiple g-displays. And uh, each g-display could have different graphs. So in the example that I'll show you in a minute, you'll see that I've got two graphs, two windows, with each of them with a graph. And the, uh, the visual window that has the three-dimensional arrows spinning around and all three of them run at the same time. I'll also provide on the K drive, there'll be a starter program that gets you started. It includes everything you need up to the time part. So it sets up the arrows, sets up the coefficients, sets up the uh, curves and the display windows, but then it, it leaves you to compute the behavior of the wave function uh, for all future times. So that's something you're gonna have to work out. But uh, let's look at the demo and uh, see what it looks like. So in this window, you see the arrows all confined to the left edge of the well. In this window is the plot of the probability of finding the electron on the left edge of the well as a function of time. And the bottom window has the expectation value of position along with the expectation value plus and minus the uncertainty in position graphed as a function of time. So let's go ahead and I'll click the window and that'll start the thing running. And you can see the probability is going up and down. It reaches 0, and then it goes back up to 1, and then it goes around. And at the same time, the position of the particle, the expectation value, is kind of bouncing around inside the well. Eventually, we get back to a total phase of 2 pi, which puts the probability back. You can see the probability of being the left edge of the well. Now it goes back to 1. The arrows return to their original uh, condition and the expectation value of position is once again um, on the left edge of the well and, and the probability is confined to the left edge of the well. So that's the way the program ought to work when you run it. Uh, you can find the write-up for Project 3 on the K drive along with a starter program that will get everything running up to the time evolution itself. So have fun! Hello again, it's time for lesson nine. Today we're going to study the quantum simple harmonic oscillator. First we're going to review the classical oscillator. Then we'll work out the quantum Hamiltonian. Then we'll talk about the so-called operator method for solving the quantum simple harmonic oscillator. And finally, this operator method produces these things called ladder operators. We'll figure out a couple of nice features of those guys. And uh, this is just going to be the beginning of a, of a really a two-part session on 
uh, the quantum simple harmonic oscillator, so there will be more next time. All right, let's talk about the classical simple harmonic oscillator. You guys already know that the energy is the sum of the kinetic and potential energy. In the infinite square well, the only energy that mattered was kinetic energy, but now we have a potential energy that is finite everywhere, but uh, its value depends on position. So now we have a potential that goes like 1 half kx squared. You also are aware that the classical solutions to this problem uh, are cosines and sines. In other words, the position goes like a cosine, the momentum goes like a sine. If you plug those two functions back into the energy, you find out that the, uh, the total energy is constant. So that tells us we're talking about a simple harmonic oscillator without any damping, without any interaction with the rest of the world, and that that energy goes like the square of the amplitude. So. Those are the main points. Also, uh, one thing you may recall is that the frequency of the oscillator is related to the mass and the spring constant. So there's a classical natural frequency that's uh, related to the, the mass and the stiffness of the spring. Okay, so what about the quantum simple harmonic oscillator? We can start with the same energy idea, but now we're going to convert it into an operator. So energy now is going to become the Hamiltonian operator that acts on a wave function, and we're looking for wave functions that have the property that the Hamiltonian uh, hitting the wave function produces a number times the same wave function back again. Of course, wave functions that have that property are called eigenfunctions, and the number that you get is called an eigenvalue. How do we find these functions? Well, that's what we're going to be doing most of today. First, we'll replace the momentum in the classical expression for the energy with the momentum operator. That means that anywhere p shows up, it's going to become uh, minus ih bar d dx. If we plug that in twice, then we get that the kinetic energy term looks just like it did for the infinite square well. But now the potential energy term is no longer 0. Now the potential energy is proportional to x squared. Now, the trouble with k is that it looks an awful lot like wave number. And so to avoid ambiguity, we're going to replace k with the mass times the natural frequency squared. So instead of k, we're going to use m omega squared. It means exactly the same thing. It's just a different way to write the spring constant, and, uh, and that's all there is to it. But it avoids us having too many k's floating around. OK, so what is this operator method? The operator method is to start with the Hamiltonian. Notice that it looks like it might be factorable. You guys know that uh, a squared minus b squared is a plus b times a minus b. Well, you can play a similar game. Look at this as the difference of two squares in a way, except one of the things is complex. So if I rewrite this as minus i a p hat, plus bx times plus ia p hat plus bx. I have a hope that when I multiply all that together, I'm going to wind up with something that looks like the original Hamiltonian. Let's try it. Let's see what happens. If I, uh, if I call the first factor, we're going to call that a plus. The second factor, we're going to call that a minus. These names are traditional names for these operators, but uh, we'll see in a little bit why they have the plus and the minus and what the significance that has. But, uh, but let's go ahead and, and plug in these definitions, multiply everything out, and then see what happens. Notice that if I want this to work out to be the original Hamiltonian, then h bar omega times capital A squared had better be 1 over 2m, because I need to get p squared over 2m. And, uh, and h bar omega times b squared had better be a half of k, or a half of m omega squared. So b squared h bar omega has to be m omega squared over 2, because I need to get 1 half kx squared there for the, uh, for the potential energy, or m omega squared over 2. Uh, with those requirements, that determines that a has to be the square root of 1 over 2m h bar omega, and b has to be... Uh, the square root of m omega over 2 h bar. And also, of course, if you multiply those together, you get that the, the factors in the middle, with an a times b in them, um, are just 1 over 2 h bar. Now, one thing you might be confused by, I've got minus i a b p hat x plus i a b x p hat. 
Now, if momentum and position were classical variables, those two terms would just cancel. But they're not classical variables. We're doing quantum mechanics. And so that means that p hat times x is not the same thing as x times p hat, because these are operators, and it turns out they interfere with each other. They change. The, the order matters. So if I rewrite this out um, with the order intact, I get this term x p hat minus p hat x uh, in the middle. But I also get the correct value for the kinetic energy term and the correct value for the potential energy term. I just have this annoying extra term. And I've written it here with square brackets. It's uh, square bracket x comma p hat. Okay, That thing means x p hat minus p hat x. It's called a commutator. And it's a standard bit of terminology in quantum mechanics. Whenever I have two operators that don't uh, that interact with each other or that where order matters, that means applying them in one direction is different than applying them in the other direction, I can define a commutator. How do we figure out what that commutator is? The easiest way is to apply it to an arbitrary function. So if I apply x p hat minus p hat x to an arbitrary function, I get something. It's called the commutator. I get the value of the commutator. If I actually put in the definitions of x and p hat, and then notice that I've got f prime on the left, but I've got the derivative of x times f, which is going to be f plus xf prime on the right, and I cancel all the bits that cancel, I end up with something that's not 0. I end up with ih bar times f. So the commutator of x and p hat turns out to be non-zero. It turns out to be i times h bar. Now I can take that result and plug it back into my original expression. And you can see what I get is that the, uh, the kinetic energy and the potential energy are there, but I've got this annoying extra little bit, a half of h bar omega. But uh, I had hoped for just the kinetic energy and the potential energy. But all is not lost, because if I write the Hamiltonian as kinetic plus potential, and I write out what I got with the uh, two factors, a plus and a minus, I just have this extra half h bar omega. I can fix things up if I simply add a half h bar omega to both sides, and I get a good expression for the Hamiltonian. It turns out it's my factored bit plus a half of h bar omega. Now what good does this do? In class, you're going to show that the commutator of a minus and a plus is also not zero, that they don't, that they don't commute with each other, that they interfere with each other. But that commutator is just going to be 1. We're going to use that fact to find new solutions to the simple harmonic oscillator if we can only discover one. So let's suppose we have a solution. We'll call it psi sub n. And we know that that solution uh, satisfies the time-independent Schrodinger equation. In other words, the Hamiltonian acting on psi sub n is the energy of the nth state on psi sub n. What happens if we apply the Hamiltonian to this state that we get after applying one of the latter operators? So let's apply the Hamiltonian to a plus on psi n and see what we get. Well, what we get is the Hamiltonian acting on a plus. I've rewritten the Hamiltonian in terms of the latter operators, but notice I can distribute the a plus inside the parentheses. And then I can factor an a plus out on the left. So that's kind of tricky. As long as I don't change the order of the a pluses and a minuses, I haven't changed anything. And notice that I've rewritten it in such a way that it almost looks like I've got the Hamiltonian there. The trouble is the Hamiltonian is a plus a minus plus a half, and I've got a minus a plus plus a half. But the commutator of a minus a plus is 1. In other words, a minus a plus is the same thing as a plus a minus plus 1. So I can replace a minus a plus with a plus a minus plus 1. So let's do that. So that gives us a 3 halves inside. I get the 1, I get the a plus and a minus written in the opposite direction. And uh, I want you to notice that uh, now I do, in fact, have the Hamiltonian, except I've got an extra h bar omega. So a plus a minus plus a half times h bar omega is the Hamiltonian. I've got three halves, so that gives me an, an extra h bar omega. But now, 
the Hamiltonian acting on psi n, we already know psi n is a solution to the eigenvalue problem. So I can replace Hamiltonian on psi n with the nth energy eigenvalue times psi n. And now everything in parentheses there is just a number, which means that it, it commutes with any operator. So I can, repl I can swap the order of that number, n a plus, and we've got our answer. In other words, let's review what we did. We, uh, we took the Hamiltonian acting on the state a plus on psi, and we showed that that's equal to en plus h bar omega on that same state, a plus psi n. So a plus psi sub n is a new solution to the time-independent Schrodinger equation with an energy that's h bar omega greater than the original energy of the original solution that I started with. So what we found is that the latter operators give us new solutions. Now I haven't shown it, but it is true that the uh, A minus operator also gives a new solution. It turns out to be a solution whose energy is h bar omega less than the energy of the solution you start with. Okay, now let's look at a, a little vPython demo to get some sense of what these solutions actually look like. Okay, so here is the ground state wave function of the simple harmonic oscillator. Notice it looks a little bit like the ground state of the uh, infinite square well, except in that case the wave function comes down and goes to zero at a finite location. This wave function behaves like a Gaussian. This is the n equals zero state of the simple harmonic oscillator. There's, there is no n equals zero in the infinite square well. It starts at one, but uh, but numbering aside, this is the ground state, the lowest possible energy state, and you can see it's symmetric about the center, but the function goes to zero only asymptotically, so it doesn't go to zero at any finite value of x, but it's uh, very tiny out past a certain, certain distance. The, uh, the first excited state looks a lot like the first excited state of the infinite square well. Um, it's also uh, anti-symmetric, just like the n equals 2 state of the infinite square well, this is the n equals 1 state of the simple harmonic oscillator. Um, but again, it doesn't go to zero at a finite value of x, it goes down gradually. And we're going to learn more about exactly how it goes and, and why it looks that way. Um, now the ground state rotates at a frequency that's related to its energy. Remember, this is n equals zero, so that means that the energy is one-half h bar omega. Um, the first excited state spins faster, but unlike the infinite square well in which the first excited state is four times the energy of the ground state, this one is only three times the energy. It's three halves h bar omega. And the n equals two state is five halves h bar omega. So it's five times the energy of the ground state. Um, now the probability densities of these guys look about like you'd expect, sort of a lump in the middle, or for the first excited state it's two lumps, or for the n equals two state it's three lumps, and so on. And of course if you put two of them together, just like the infinite square well, you're going to get sloshing. So here's the sloshing probability density um, associated with the superposition of n equals 0 and n equals 1. You know, it's very similar in character to the kind of sloshing and behavior we got uh, with the n equals 1 plus n equals 2 state of the infinite square well. Now, as we go to higher and higher energy levels, um, you can see that the basic behavior uh, stays more or less the same. It's a little bit like the infinite square well, but uh, it's a little more well behaved. If I add a bunch of uh, terms from the different energy levels together, I get a kind of a bouncing back and forth. This almost looks like a an object in a classical simple harmonic oscillator wiggling back and forth in the uh, in the well in the quadratic potential well in this case. Now the other thing I want to point out is that uh, these other states. Like that's the n equals 7 state, I guess. Yeah, n equals 7 state. Notice it's got 7 humps, and it rotates at uh, 
a frequency, let's see, that would be uh, n equals 6, so that's going to be 13 halves, I guess, 13 times the ground state energy. And uh, But similar to the infinite square well, the uh, it, it wiggles just like the states in the infinite square will do. One thing I would like to point out is that the uh, probability density of these humps is larger at the ends than it is in the middle. And part of that is due to the fact that in a simple harmonic oscillator, when something's wiggling, it's going to spend more time at the ends, spend more time at the edges of its motion, uh, because it's going fast in the middle and it's going slow at the edges. And the other thing to notice is that, again, um, the probability density falls off asymptotically to zero, but it's never zero for any finite value of x. So that's how that works. Anyway, we'll get used to looking at these pictures uh, as time goes on, but uh, that's sort of that's sort of what it looks like. Okay, welcome back. Here we are with uh, lesson ten, and it's a little bit different presentation. It's what's so cool about a plus and a minus. So we're going to begin with the vPython demo. So sit back and look at the pretty pictures. All right, so here we are looking at the ground state wave function of the simple harmonic oscillator. Let's turn on the probability display so you can see what the probability density is going to look like. Now there is one big difference. This is the n equals zero state of the simple harmonic oscillator. It corresponds roughly to the n equals one state of the infinite square well, except for the fact that the probability doesn't go to zero. It just sort of tapers out here asymptotically. If you zoom in, you can see that that uh, that those cylinders don't actually quite go to zero, but they get pretty darn small. So now what we're doing today is looking at the a plus and A minus operators. So let's consider what happens if I apply the A plus operator to this wave function. As you know, what happens is you get the N equals one state. Okay? And if you apply the raising operator to that one, you get N equals two, three, four, five, and six. So this is the N equals six state of the simple harmonic oscillator. Notice it has seven humps. And that's because we started counting at zero, which is just the convention for the simple harmonic oscillator. Now what about A minus? A minus is going to take you down a step in energy. A plus brought us up a step in energy each time we applied it. A minus is going to bring us down a step in energy. So if we applied to n equals 6, we're going to get n equals 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, and finally back to zero. Now what happens if you apply a minus to the n equals zero state? The answer is you get nothing. Not the <coughs> n equals minus one state. There is no such state. As you remember, you can't have an energy that's less than the lowest potential energy in a potential. And that means that uh, what you get is zero. This actually produces a kind of a trick for generating a simpler differential equation to find the n equals zero state you write out the a minus operator as a differential operator and you apply it to an unknown function and set that equal to zero. What you get then is a differential equation whose solution is the n equals zero state. All right, so that's what I wanted to remind you of. Let's get back to the slides. Okay, very good. So what I want to do is to bring out some of the uses for a minus and a plus. Of course, there's the obvious use. We can generate new solutions if we have existing solutions. But I also want to point out that it can simplify otherwise very difficult calculations. And it can help us to understand the coupling with radiation. So we haven't really talked about how radiation works, how you treat radiation in quantum mechanics. But I want to touch on that today. We won't treat it fully until next semester when we get to perturbation theory. But uh, we can touch on it today and give you a sense of how these things actually help us. So let me remind you what are A plus and A minus. A plus is a linear combination of the momentum and the position operator. A minus is a different linear combination. The only difference between them is whether the momentum gets added or subtracted and uh, what the coefficients are. So 
remember that the capital A coefficient is the square root of 1 over 2m h bar omega, and the capital B coefficient is m omega over 2 h bar. We worked those out last time. And uh, that means that you can write a plus out in detail with the coefficients uh, in this way. And uh, a minus similarly works out this way. Notice that when you get all the i's in, in differential form, there are no complex numbers in a plus and a minus. The complex numbers come from the, or the, square, the i's come from the definition of the momentum operator and the way it gets added to the position operator. But when you multiply all the i's out, you end up with a pure real differential operator. Okay, now uh, what does the machinery do? Think about what happens when you apply a plus and a minus to a wave function. A minus acting on a wave function means you're going to take the derivative of the wave function, you're going to multiply the wave function by x, and then you're going to add the two results together. So it's kind of like take a derivative, multiply by x, and add. On the other hand, a plus says you take the derivative, you multiply by x, and then you subtract. So the only real difference between the two is one you add, the other you subtract. So let's look at the ground state wave function. The ground state wave function looks like this. It's really just a Gaussian. But if I take the derivative of the ground state wave function, I, uh, I get like a double humped Gaussian. Notice it has a positive slope on the left and a negative slope on the right, and so you end up getting a kind of a double hump thing. Of course, if you multiply the Gaussian by x, you get a similar looking thing, except it's a double hump the other way. Now, what happens if I subtract those two guys? If I take the blue minus the red, say, I get the purple. But that is exactly what the n equals 1 state looks like. That's the first excited state. Now, what happens if I add the two together? I get 0. Notice that 1 is the negative of the other. When you add them together, you get nothing. That means if I apply a minus to the ground state wave function, I get the 0 function, which is uh, not a wave function at all. It's 0 everywhere. So that's interesting. What happens if we play the same game with the psi equals or n equals 1 state? Notice that uh, when I calculate the derivative, I get a 3-humped thing. If I multiply by x, I also get a 3-humped thing, but it, it doesn't quite match. It doesn't quite cancel out. So when I add them, I get the purple function. That's the n equals 0 state. But if I subtract them, I get the blue but the blue is the n equals 2 state. So you can kind of see how the machinery works. Here it is again with psi 2. Here it is again with psi 3. Each time notice that when you add the results together you go down by one. If you subtract you go up by one. So you can see kind of mechanically how it is that these summing and differencing of taking derivatives and multiplying by x give you the effect of a plus and a minus. Now last time as board work we worked out the commutation relation of a minus and a plus and what do we find? We found that a minus a plus commutator was equal to 1. In other words a minus plus minus a plus minus was 1 or a minus a plus was the same thing as a plus a minus plus 1. So what I'd like you to imagine is um, suppose we have an eigenfunction psi n of a plus and a minus. What I want to point out is that that wave function is actually an eigenfunction of a plus a minus with eigenvalue of n. So let's see how that works. Suppose we create a new function by applying a plus to psi sub n. We'll call that function phi. And what is the eigenvalue of a plus a minus on that phi function? Well, uh, you can answer that. It turns out the correct answer is n, but let's see how it happens. a plus a minus on phi 
is uh, the same thing as a plus a minus on a plus psi sub n. But a minus a plus is a plus a minus plus 1. We know that's the commutation relation. So I can put that in, and I can factor out an a plus. But notice that uh, when I do that, I get a plus a minus psi sub n plus psi sub n. But remember that a plus a minus on psi sub n is n on psi sub n. And that means that I can factor out the psi sub n. I get a plus n plus 1 on psi sub n. But now n plus 1 is just a number. So I can take the n plus 1 out, and I see that a plus a minus on phi is n plus 1 on phi. So that means phi is a wave function whose eigenvalue of a plus a minus is n plus 1. So what we've just shown is that uh, a plus has the effect of giving an n plus 1 eigenvalue of the a plus a minus operator. Now remember, what is the Hamiltonian? The Hamiltonian is a plus a minus plus a half, but we just worked out that a plus a minus is an, is an operator whose eigenvalue is n. Its eigenfunctions are the stationary states. The eigenvalue of those functions is the number of the stationary state. So that means you can think of the Hamiltonian as just being the number operator plus a half times h bar omega. So it's just a different way to work out the Hamiltonian. a plus a minus is simply the number operator. It tells you the number of the state. And uh, you can see that uh, the phi function that we were proposing before is really just the n plus one-th energy eigenstate. OK, so what is a plus on psi sub n, just a plus alone? Well, we know that it's got to be something times psi sub n plus 1. But the question is, what is the something? What is that coefficient? It's going to be some kind of a coefficient that depends on n. These are not Fourier coefficients, by the way. I don't mean to imply that. They're just some constant that can depend on n. We don't know what that constant is at this point, but we can get it from normalization because we know that w the new wave function, whatever it is, will pick c sub n so that it's properly normalized. So the idea is uh, if we multiply both sides of the equation above, the a plus on psi sub n, um, let me say that again. If you take the result of applying a plus times psi sub n and then check its normalization, what you get is c sub n squared uh, psi n plus 1 star times psi n plus 1. So that's how we're going to work out the value of c sub n squared. But notice that uh, what I have there is the complex conjugate of a plus on psi sub n. But if you think about it, that's the same thing as uh, psi sub n star times a minus, because a plus and a minus are related to one another as complex conjugates. The conjugate of a plus on psi sub n is psi sub n star times a minus. But look what we have in there. We have a minus a plus. I can replace that with a plus a minus plus 1. We, can, we also know that a plus a minus on psi sub n is n times psi sub n, because that's the number operator. So that means that c sub n squared is n plus 1 times psi n star psi n. But we presume that psi n was already properly normalized. And that means that c sub n must be the square root of n plus 1. So we've just worked out the actual result of a plus on psi sub n. It's the square root of n plus 1 on psi sub n plus 1. You can similarly work out the result of a minus on psi sub n. It's the square root of n times psi sub n minus 1. Now, there's an easy way to remember this result. It's the square root of whichever n is bigger. So if I apply a plus, I get square root of n plus 1. If I apply a minus, I get the square root of n. They're different behaviors, but the thing that's the same about them is whichever side has the larger value of n, it's the square root of that. OK. so. We can generate new solutions, 
But how does that actually make my life easier? Well, let's take a, an example where it does make your life easier. Imagine you want to find the expectation value of momentum when the system is in the state psi 3. Well, psi 3 is a kind of a complicated function. If you write it out as an actual function of x, you can see that it's um, a complicated polynomial times a Gaussian. And calculating the momentum expectation value means you have to apply the momentum operator to that thing. You got to get its complex conjugate and multiply it all out. And it gets pretty ugly. Look at that. Okay, does that look like a fun calculation to do? It's, uh, it's hard. But I want you to notice something. By the definition of a plus and a minus, we can, we can get an expression for the momentum that's uh, simply the difference of a minus and a plus. So the momentum operator, in other words, another way to write the momentum operator is to write it as a difference of the lowering and raising operators. With that definition, I can calculate the expectation value of the momentum on state psi 3 and rewrite the integral as an integral on a minus on psi 3 times psi 3 star and an integral of a plus on psi 3 times psi 3 star. But we know what happens when a minus acts on psi 3. It's the square root of 3 times psi 2. And we know what happens when a plus acts on psi 3. It's the square root of 4 times psi 4. But square root of 3 and square root of 4 are just numbers. So what that means is that um, we end up with these integrals that look like the orthonormality condition. Psi 3 star on psi 2, psi 3 star on psi 4. But what are those? They're just 0. And so what is the expectation value of momentum? It's 0. Okay, that was easy. Let's... Uh, Let's look at another example. What if I wanted to know the expectation value of momentum squared? Again, this would produce a hideous integral, very difficult to do, because it's a third order polynomial times a Gaussian. I can take derivatives of that thing all day long. It's never going to go away. And so momentum squared, it means taking two derivatives, so it's going to be very complicated. But if I write the momentum out as a relationship among the raising and lowering operators, it becomes a simple sort of quadratic thing with raising and lowering operators. But I want you to notice something. A minus squared acting on psi 3 is going to give me psi 1. Psi 3 star on psi 1 is 0. A plus squared acting on psi 3 is going to give me psi 5. And psi 3 star on psi 5 is going to be 0. So I know right away that these two terms aren't going to contribute to the result. But what about the middle terms? I've got an a minus a plus. I've got an a plus a minus. Those are going to bop me down and bump me back up. So I'll end up with a psi 3. But the only difference is I'm going to have uh, a negative 3 because I'll get uh, the square root of 3 twice. The other term, I'm going to get the square root of 4 twice. So what I wind up with is just minus 7. And, uh, of course, there's a minus sign outside, so the answer is 7 over 4a squared. That's super easy. That's so much easier than actually writing out the integral. So there's another thing you can do. You can rewrite x as a superposition of a plus and a minus. What is a plus plus a minus? Well, it's 2bx. That means x is a plus a, plus a minus over 2b. And I can use that to calculate expectation values of x, which is also very difficult to do using the explicit algebraic formulation of the, uh, of the wave function. Let's talk about radiation coupling. The electric field propagating through space looks like some kind of a propagating wave. But for visible wavelengths, the uh, value of k is going to be... Um, very, very small, with a wavelength of like 5,000 angstroms, with the size of an atom of like 3 angstroms. When I calculate k dot r, it's going to be on the order of a 1 1,000th. And that's a very tiny compared to the uh, effect of the electric field. So I can basically ignore the k dot r 
for long wavelength radiation. And I get the electric field in the vicinity of an atom is approximately a constant in space, but of course it's going to vary in time. So I can rewrite the potential as being um, a constant electric field in space dotted into the position of an electron. So the potential is going to depend on time, but uh, but it's not going to depend strongly on the space. Let's say the potential will just be proportional to, to the distance. Okay. Um, the question is, how do I deal with a potential that depends on time? We're going to find out next semester how to do this in detail. But basically what we do is we write the potential, we write the Hamiltonian as a part that's the static simple harmonic oscillator potential and a part that's the interaction potential. And then instead of expanding psi as a bunch of Fourier constants times the basis functions, we we write it out as a bunch of constants that can have a time dependence. So these are Fourier coefficients that can depend on time. And then if you plug all that back into the Schrodinger equation, you get an equation for the time rate of change of these coefficients. And now what I want you to focus on, and we'll, like I said, we'll cover this all next semester. What I want to what, what I want you to focus on is the fact that the uh, there's a part of the time dependence of the coefficients that goes like the interaction Hamiltonian. It's like the expectation value of the interaction Hamiltonian between two of the basis states of the superposition. And uh, it gets a little bit complicated, but the main point is that you need to calculate the expectation value of x between two different um, stationary states. And that will determine the rate of change of the Fourier coefficient for one of those states. But remember that we can write x as a superposition of raising and lowering operators. That means that uh, I end up with a couple of integrals, one with an a plus and one with an a minus. And you can see that the integral on the left is only going to work if n is 1 less than m, and the integral on the right is only going to work if m is 1 less than n. So what this implies is that transitions are only going to be strong in those cases where the wave function, um, where the transition is going between an n and an m that differ by 1. So we're going to go back to, uh, to VPython now for a little demo of that. OK, so here we are back looking at the ground state. I just wanted to point out what happens when you get a superposition of the ground state and the first excited state. You can see that you get that familiar sloshing. But it's that sloshing that gives rise to the radiation. So the, the point is, um, the expectation value of position is going to vary in time when you have a superposition of two states that differ by one in their energy eigenvalue. So here we are looking at two and three. You'll notice a similar effect here. Three and four, similar effect there. So if I have just one and three, they're not neighboring, they're uh, like this, you still get sloshing, but notice that it's symmetric with respect to position. So it gives no variation in the expectation value of position. So that's the main point, and uh, we'll see you guys in class. OK, guys, welcome back. It's. Uh, it's lesson 11. This one is not going to have any pretty pictures. In fact, it's not going to be very pretty at all. It's about the analytical approach to solving the Schrodinger equation for the simple harmonic uh, motion for the uh, simple harmonic oscillator. So anyway, but before we get into that, I wanted to recap something we did in class the other day, and that is calculating the expectation of x squared in the n equals 4 state of the simple harmonic oscillator. And the idea is to remind yourself what a plus, a minus, and b are. Notice that you can rewrite x 
as a superposition of a plus and a minus. In other words, the x operator can be thought of as a sum of a plus and a minus divided by 2b, and uh, proceed to calculate. And the key here is to notice that when you square x, you get an operator a plus squared and a minus squared that can't produce any net result when sandwiched between the same, the ket and the bra of the same state. Because a plus is going to take you from 4 to 6, and 4 on 6 is 0. a minus is going to take you from 4 to 2, and 4 on 2 is 0. So those two outside terms don't matter. a plus a minus is just the number operator. It always produces just the number of the state, so that's going to give you a 4. And by the uh, what you call a commuter, the commutator of uh, a plus and a minus, you know that a minus a plus is just a plus a minus plus 1, so that's going to be the n plus 1 operator. That's going to give you a 5. So when the smoke clears, all that all that stuff does is give you 4 plus 5, or 9, which means the final result is just 9 times the uh, h bar over m omega. Of course, you may remember that h bar over m omega is the uh, square of the oscillator length. So this is really the, it's 9 times the oscillator length squared divided by 2. Okay, now back to business. Uh, first, in order to solve the Schrodinger equation directly using traditional approach of partial differential equations, we want to scale it. So if you look at the time-independent Schrodinger equation, you'll notice there's a bunch of factors there. The plan to scale it is to divide both sides by uh, basically the ground state energy, what we know will become the ground state energy, uh, 1 half h bar omega. And when you do that, it becomes rather symmetric. You'll notice there's an m omega over h bar, which is 1 over the oscillator length squared in front of the x squared. And there's a h bar over m omega, which is the oscillator length squared <coughs> in front of the second derivative with respect to position. So overall, these terms are all unitless. Um, 1 over the oscillator length squared times x squared is a unitless ratio. and when you take a derivative with respect to x twice, you're dividing by length twice, and so multiplying by the oscillator length squared gives you a unitless factor all, all together. And of course, e divided by e0 is unitless, so this, this becomes a, sort of a unitless equation, and um, as long as we th uh, rewrite psi as a function of the ratio of position to the oscillator length, so we're going to replace x, by a variable called xc, <coughs> which is x divided by the oscillator length. So, and you rewrite the differential equation using xc as a variable. It's just minus psi double prime plus xi squared psi is equal to k times psi, where k is now the ratio of the energy to the ground state energy. Okay, so the next thing we want to do is to factor out the asymptotic part. And uh, let's see. So if we look at that differential equation, it's got the psi double prime um, plus xi, xi squared psi is equal to k psi. If we go to large values of xi, the left-hand side has to practically cancel. The k doesn't really matter. It's a finite amount, but xi squared gets very large, and the second derivative is going to have to get very large in order to practically cancel those out. And so you get a solution that's just e to the minus c squared over 2, ignoring the k. And the idea is, what if we factor that out and see what's left over? We're going to find out what's left over is uh, some kind of a polynomial. But if we do that, we define f to be um, the exponential part, the Gaussian part. We know f prime is going to be the derivative, and it turns out that's minus c times f f double prime, if you work it all out, is c squared minus 1 times f. And if you put all that back in to the differential equation, um, what you find is that, uh, we'll get to it here, there you go, you get this relationship between the second derivative of the h part, the first derivative of the h part, and all the Cs and Fs. So F, remember, is the Gaussian part. You'll notice there's a common factor of the Gaussian part here. 
And uh, that means that we can basically ignore the Gaussian part since it's a common factor. And we are left with a differential equation only for the other factor, the h. <clears throat> now you'll also notice a couple of things cancel here. There's a minus h c squared and a plus h c squared. And when you get rid of that, you get a simpler differential equation here that, uh, that we can solve. And how do you go about solving such an equation? Well, the only really general method is to assume that the h is some kind of an infinite series. And so we write h as an infinite series uh, on the xi, the different powers of xi. And then we calculate h prime, which we need. And we calculate h double prime, which we need. And we plug those series back in to the original differential equation. And, uh, and what do we get? We get um, something like this. Now notice that I've got a xi to the n minus 2 power, a xi to the n minus 1 power, and a xi to the n power. And uh, after I multiply through the xi in the middle term, I want to rewrite these so that they all have the same power of xi. So the only term that's bad now is the left-hand term. I want to change it to xi to the n. So I'm going to replace n and n minus 1 with n uh, Let's see, I want to replace it with n plus 2, n plus 1, and then I get c to the n in that sum. And now I can take the sum to the outside, and you'll notice that uh, I have a common factor with c to the n. The only way that can work is if that common factor is 0, because the c to the n are independent functions, linearly independent. So the only coefficients I can put in front of the xi to the n's and still have this whole equation work is 0. So that means that I can write a recursion relation between c to the n plus 2, and, or c sub n plus 2, and c sub n. So if I know c sub 0, I can calculate c sub 2. If I know c sub 2, I get c4, c6, c8, and so on. <clears throat> okay, but notice that... Uh, this thing gets bigger and bigger and bigger unless one of the c sub n's is 0. So the only way to work this thing is if we make one of the c sub n's 0. And the only way to do that is to make the numerator 0. So that means k at some point has to be equal to 2n plus 1. That is, in fact, um, a quantization condition on the energy. So k, remember, is e divided by e0. That means e has to be e0 times 2n plus 1. Remember what e0 is, is h bar omega over 2. And so we get a quantization condition that the energies have to be h bar omega times n plus a half. That's the same condition we got with the operator method. So <clears throat> the, uh, the other thing is the recursion relation determines every other coefficient. So all you need is c0 and c1. So uh, what we do in practice is to we separate out uh, solutions that have C0 equal to something and C1 equal to nothing, and C1 equal to something and C0 equal to nothing. Those turn out to be the even and odd solution, and they're called the Hermite polynomials. Hermite, I guess most Americans say. The French pronunciation is Hermite, and uh, he was a French guy. And uh, for an example, let's say we want to stop at n equals 4. That means k has to be 9, and uh, that means if k is equal to 9, if you know c0, you know c2 is negative 4 times c0. You know that c4 is 4 thirds times c0. And then, of course, uh, there is no n equals, or there is no c6, because we're going to stop at, uh, at k equals 9. So that means we end up with a Hermit polynomial, uh, C0 times this thing. Now there is a convention. The convention is that the highest coefficient is 2 to the n. So the highest coefficient in this case is C0 times 4 thirds. That needs to be 2 to the 4. Of course, um, 2 to the 4 is 16. So the only way, let's see, the only way that works is if C0 is equal to 12. Good. And uh, if you plug that back in, you get h4 is 16, c to the fourth, negative minus 48 c, c squared plus 12.
So just multiply that all out. And, uh, and that's the way you generate the Hermite polynomials. This gives us a gen general form for the uh, nth simple harmonic oscillator wave function that looks pretty ugly. If I put it back in terms of x, real space, uh, all the xes become x over x0, and the normalization factor, I need to get a square root of distance in there somewhere. And the distance that turns out to be the right distance is the um, oscillator length. That comes in from the dxc, because dxc is dx over x0. And, uh, and that's the way it works. And of course, just to remind you, the oscillator length is the square root of h bar divided by m omega. We got that when we rescaled the Schrodinger equation. Now, last little bit of, of uh, understanding here is that uh, there is a recursion relation between one Hermite polynomial and the neighboring Hermite polynomials in, in n. If I know h0 and h1, uh, let's say if I know h1 and h0, I can calculate h2. That's what this thing is telling me. We can use that in a computer program to generate the Hermite polynomials. So Here's the plan. Uh, we can start our uh, Python program with uh, the normal starting point. We have a, a size in real space that we're going to study called A. We start with 80 arrows, and we're going to generate 20 Hermite polynomials. So we can have sums of stationary states of uh, 20 terms. And uh, the idea is to begin with an array of arrays. So the zeros function creates an array full of zeros. But notice I'm creating an 80 by 20 array. So each uh, element in the array is at a particular place between minus a over 2 and a over 2 and corresponds to a particular Hermite polynomial. So I'm going to have an h0, an h1, an h2, an h3, like that. And the way we start it is uh, that we know the h0 is, in fact, a constant. It's just 1. Uh, it turns out to be just the number 1. And h1 is actually quite simple. It's uh, 2 times x. You can work those out um, by hand using the recursion relations. Once you have h0 and h1, we can use the recursion relation to calculate h2. So that's the idea. We make a loop. And uh, each time through the loop, we compute the next, the next guy. So n is going to go uh, from 1 to, what's it going to go? From 1 to 19, I guess. And we're going to calculate the n plus 1th Hermite polynomial, just like the recursion relation shows. It's 2 times x times the nth minus 2 times n times the n minus 1th. That's it. And... Uh, and there you have it. So in your program, when you need Hermite polynomials, which you will for Computing Project 4, um, this is a strategy you can use to generate those guys. All right, very good. We'll see you guys next time. OK, welcome back. This is Lesson 13, the Simple Harmonic Oscillator Wrap-Up and Free Particle States. Really, I only have a couple of things to say about the Simple Harmonic Oscillator. One of them is a, an application that I wanted you guys to be aware of. You're taking Thermo right now, so you are familiar with the concept of a heat capacity. What I wanted to discuss was the heat capacity of a diatomic gas, in particular over temperature ranges in which the uh, molecules begin vibrating so that the Simple Harmonic Oscillator is the model that you'd use to to treat that vibration at least uh, a, as a first pass. The basic idea is that the uh, the probability of the molecule having any particular energy is proportional to the Boltzmann factor e to the minus energy divided by kT. Now uh, it's convenient to define beta to be one over kT, and then you can rewrite this. Uh, using the, no the notation e to the minus energy times beta, therefore. And there's a function. It has a name. It's called the partition function. It's simply the sum of e to the minus energy divided by kt, or e to the minus energy times beta, 
for all of the states in the system. So every individual state would have a contribution to the sum. And uh, in the case of the simple harmonic oscillator in one dimension, of course, there are uh, there's one state for each value of n, n would be from zero to infinity. Now, uh, the expectation value of the energy is simply the energy of each state times the corresponding probability of that state being occupied added up for all the states. And uh, you can see that the 1 over z out in front here really just corresponds to a kind of normalization factor. But uh, it's also true that since uh, the exponential is e to the minus energy times beta, if you take the derivative with respect to beta, that brings down the energy. And that is just exactly what you'd need to do to get the expectation value of the energy. So it turns out the expectation value of energy is minus 1 over z times the beta derivative of the partition function. Or sometimes folks write this as the logarithmic derivative with respect to beta of the partition function. The heat capacity is the derivative of the expectation value of the energy with respect to temperature. So that's, uh, or it's uh, delta Q over delta T. So the point is, if we know the partition function, we can calculate the expectation value of the energy and, and, and its temperature dependence. And from that, we can get the heat capacity. Of course, the heat capacity you can measure in the laboratory. So it's a interesting way to check to see if your concept of what energy states are available and what values the energy states have holds any water. Here's some data collected about the heat capacity of nitrogen gas, uh, diatomic nitrogen gas, as a function of temperature from the National uh, Institute of Standards and Technology, I think. It's NIST. Um, and uh, here is what it looks like if you model the nitrogen molecule as a simple harmonic oscillator. Notice that up to about 1500 Kelvin, uh, the model actually worked quite well. Higher than 1500 Kelvin, not so much. Uh, it turns out if you use a Morse potential rather than a simple harmonic oscillator potential, you get a much better fit to the data the spectrum of the Morse potential it basically just adds an extra term which has to do with the uh, the degree to well it has to do with like the dissociation energy and so on of the Morse potential but my main point here is that uh, the simple harmonic oscillator works good over a fairly large temperature range the Morse potential improves upon that but that for many purposes at many at a fairly wide range of temperatures you do pretty well just using the uh, plain old simple harmonic oscillator Okay, let's talk about coherent states of the simple harmonic oscillator. Coherent states are basically minimum uncertainty superposition states. So what that means is uh, you start with a, uh, a simple harmonic oscillator potential and you imagine the ground state, which is a minimum uncertainty state, and you sort of translate the ground state over a little bit it turns out that uh, that is a super, you can build that, that translated version of the ground state. You can treat that as a superposition of different n, different energy eigenstates. Um, and when you work it out, the coefficients happen to be uh, some number to the nth power divided by the square root of n factorial. And uh, that's the coefficient of the nth state. In order to normalize that, it turns out the factor out in front has to be e to the minus alpha squared over 2. Alpha is some number that characterizes the, uh, characterizes the amount of displacement that you put in. Um, we'll see in a little bit exactly how that comes about and how it works. But, uh, but for the moment, let's look at a real quick Python demo to see this sort of in action. OK, I just wanted to go through a little bit of the program for project four in case you're struggling with it uh, in this case we have 80 arrows and the length of the x-axis is 15. Um, hs is the ermit polynomials it's an array of arrays sort of like the example i did in class the other day where i made an array of arrays of the 
uh, stationary states of the infinite square well. Also, I have an array of coefficients. These are going to be the they're like Fourier coefficients, but now they're Hermite polynomial coefficients to create the coherent state. That's the alpha to the 2n divided by square root of n factorial, or alpha to the n divided by square root of n factorial business. And of course, then there's the uh, the actual wave functions. Now I have an array of array of wave functions. Now the wave functions are built up as uh, Hermite polynomials times Gaussians. And so we'll see how that works. I want to create the Hermite polynomials. I'm going to do that using a recursion relation that I described in an earlier video. We start with uh, HS0 is just 1, HS1 is 2 times x, and the higher order polynomials we get by taking twice x times the nth polynomial minus 2n times the n minus 1th polynomial. That gives us the n plus 1th polynomial, and that should, uh, that should take care of us. So that fills in the HS array with the Hermite polynomials. Then what I'm going to do is calculate the coefficients. I want to do that recursively because factorials are, are uh, dangerous to do because they get very large. And it turns out since these coefficients have factorials in them, we could easily overflow. But if we compute them recursively, then we reduce the risk of, of overflow. Finally, I can calculate the, uh, the wave functions. Uh, notice that I, I start out um, the ground state size sub zero is just a Gaussian. Then I calculate the normalization factor that goes out in front. And then for the ith stationary state, I take the normalization factor times the ith Hermite polynomial times the Gaussian. And then I get all of the uh, wave functions. Then to make the superposition state, this is a single wave function, which is a superposition of the stationary states. Uh, I start out with an empty array of zeros. Then we're going to go through each of the terms in the sum, take the coefficient for the coherent state times the mth uh, stationary state, and that makes my coherent state. And that's all there is to it. Then I'll build the arrows, and, uh, and that's where your part Okay, welcome back. It's time for lesson 14. We're going to continue with the Fourier transforms and so on. Um, I want to begin with a different way to look at the whole process. Let's, let's review what we mean by an inner product. An inner product in plain old vector notation is uh, a dot product. So we've got a unit vector dotted into some arbitrary vector. And what does that mean conceptually? It's a number that represents the degree to which a points in the v direction. So it's a component of a in the v direction. In Dirac notation, we'd write the same thing this way. But uh, in this case, we'd be thinking of a as a vector in some kind of an abstract vector space, and v as a unit vector in that space. But the interpretation would be exactly the same. It's the component of a in the v direction. Another way to look at that in the particular application of quantum mechanics is if we have a state A, a quantum state, and some sort of a basis state V, which is sort of a basis state is kind of like a, uh, a unit vector, more or less. Uh, it just is a unit vector that happens to belong to a basis, sort of like the I hat, J hat, K hat basis in Cartesian coordinates. But anyway, you'd say it's the amplitude of finding the system in the basis state V, given that the system is currently in the state A. So another way to interpret inner product is it's a measure of the amplitude of finding the system in the state V, given that the system is currently in the state A. So suppose we let the ket x represent the state of being at a location x on the x-axis, and the system is currently in the state psi, which is some arbitrary quantum state, what's the amplitude of finding the particle at x? How would you write that in Dirac notation? The answer is you'd write it as the bra x acting on the ket psi. 
But of course, the amplitude of finding the particle at a location x, given it, that it's in the state psi, is nothing other than the wave function. That's what the wave function means. It tells you the amplitude of being at different locations. So uh, the Dirac notation for the wave function is simply the bra x acting on the ket psi. Similarly, you can imagine having a ket k, which represents the state of having the momentum h bar times k. Suppose the system is currently in the state psi, and we want to know what's the amplitude of having the momentum h bar k, given that the system is currently in the state psi. Well, the analogous concept is that you take the bra k and hit it on the ket on the ket psi, and what do you get? You get k on psi, but uh, but that's what Griffiths calls phi of k. In other words, that's the Fourier transform of the wave function. So it's it's basically a different uh, bra acting on the same ket. So the ket psi is sort of an abstract concept of a quantum state. And if you hit it with the x bra, you get psi of x. You hit it with the k bra, you get phi of k. So phi of k and psi of x are sometimes called different representations of the same quantum state psi. Now here's a question. What would we mean by this? The bra x acting on the ket k. Well, using the same language we just cooked up, it would have to be the amplitude of finding a particle at location x given that it's in a state of momentum h bar k. In other words, we take a state of well-defined momentum and we write out the uh, amplitude to find a particle at different values of x given that it has that momentum. We've already done that problem. That was computing project two. That's the traveling wave function, the solution to the time-independent Schrodinger equation of a free particle. That is simply e to the i kx. Now, the factor out in front, the 1 over the square root of 2 pi, I'm just going to put that there. That turns out to be the right factor for the conventional way we normalize these functions. It's, it's a process called delta function normalization, but uh, we haven't really got to that yet, and I don't want to get into it today. Just suffice it to say for now that there is a normalization factor that needs to go out in front for everything to turn out consistently. And the most popular convention is that 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 factor that shows up in front is 1 over the square root of 2 pi. Okay, so that's what we mean by the bra x acting on the ket k. So let's, let's talk about bras and kets. What I want to do is to work out a, an example and get into uh, the concept of projection, but I want to start using conventional vectors. So let's imagine we have a conventional vector a. This one turns out to be a unit vector. You can tell it's a unit vector because if you square the components and add them together, you get one. But I want to write it in Dirac notation. So in the old-fashioned i hat, j hat, k hat notation, it would be 0.8 i hat plus 0.6 j hat. I want to write that in Dirac notation just for, for fun. And so I would write that as 0.8 i plus 0.6 j, where i and j are kets. They represent uh, you know, basis vectors in this uh, Cartesian basis, I guess you might say. Now imagine we have a unit vector v, which is, uh, how do I know it's a unit vector? Well, I can sum the squares of the components, and of course I get one. It also is clear that the thing points uh, at an angle of 30 degrees below the positive x-axis, just looking at the formation of that unit vector. If I write that vector in Dirac notation, it looks like this. So it's just a different way to write the same thing. And then if I want to know what is the dot product of v and a, in plain old vector not notation, I'd write it this way. You can see that uh, the cosine of 30 is square root of 3 over 2. The sine of 30 is a half. And so we end up with a number. It turns out to be uh, almost 0.4. Notice that uh, you can also write that as the bra v acting on the ket a. That's the inner product. Similarly, I can make another unit vector, I call it u, and uh, notice that it actually makes an angle of 60 degrees above the positive x-axis, and so it is orthogonal to v, u and v are uh, 
an alternative set of basis vectors to i and j. That's one way to think about it. And I've expanded u and v here in the terms of i and j, but uh, you can see they're unit vectors, they're both unit vectors, and they are both uh, perpendic mutually perpendicular to one another. So they would stand in as a reasonable alternative basis. Now we can compute uh, u on a, just like we computed v on a, and in that case we get uh, 0.92. Very good. Okay, so what we really have are two separate uh, equally valid but different sets of basis vectors. We've got the ij basis and we've got the uv basis. And uh, you can expand any ket in terms of either of those basis vectors and still have a decent representation of your ket. Okay, so what's, what's it all for? Actually, there's one other thing I want to touch on. I want to talk about projection. So uh, what does the operator ket v times bra v acting on A do. That turns out that's called a projection operator because V on A calculates the component of A in the V direction and if I multiply back with the ket V I get a new ket that points in the V direction but it's got a length of V on A which means that it's the projection of A onto the V direction. So when you when you make a bra and a ket and stick them together backwards like that, you don't get a number. What you actually get is an operator. It's called a dyad, and it has the property that it projects a, an arbitrary vector onto the V direction. Generally, the, the vectors you use to build these projection operators are unit vectors. Typically, they're basis vectors in some basis. And similarly, I could do the same thing with U. Uh, it would calculate the projection of A onto the U direction. Let's see how that turns out in practice. So um, I hope I, I don't know if you can see my cursor there or not. Let's hope so. Uh, we start with the um, with the vector a. That's the ket, and we calculate i on a. Remember a is 0.8 i hat plus 0.6 j hat. So i acting on a gives us a number 0.8. I multiply by i hat and I get a vector that points in the i hat direction. Notice that that's the projection of a onto the x axis. Similarly, I can do the same thing with uh, the j bra and ket. j on a is the number 0.6. If I multiply by j, I get a unit I get a component of a in the y direction in this case. Okay. And uh, if I add this vector, the projection of A onto the X direction, to this vector, the projection of A onto the Y direction, of course I get back A. And, uh, and uh, so it looks kind of like this. Now notice I can factor the A out, and I get this whole thing in parentheses, acting on A, gives me A. That whole thing in parentheses, therefore, must be nothing other than the identity operator. So that's the identity. It's what I get by adding the dyads produced by combining each of the basis vectors and the basis, adding them all together, and that forms the identity. Actually, that is a fundamental theorem of quantum mechanics, is that you can build dyads out of all the basis vectors of any basis, add them all together, and what you get is the identity. Uh, there's a general rule that if you don't know what to do next in a quantum mechanics problem, stick the identity in and see what happens. That uh, You think I'm joking, but actually it, that works a lot of the time. Okay, so let's look at U and V. This is an alternative basis, obviously at, ang at an angle, 30 degrees, relative to the original basis. And I can play the same game. V on A gives me 0 0.4. 0 0.4 times V gives me this projection of A. This is A projected onto the V direction. I can do the same thing for the U direction. And again, I can add them together to get A back again. I can factor the A out, and I can form the identity in this way as well. So you can make the identity out of the UV basis, or you can make the identity out of the IJ basis, but you, uh, you still get the same old identity. Uh, so how can I use this? Let's look. We, the, the point of all that was that I can form the identity out of dyads constructed from the basis vectors of any basis. So I can make the identity as the dyad of i hat plus j hat plus however many k hat, l hat, m hat, however many more I've got. Or I could form the identity equally well using u and v and w and how many other more basis vectors I might have. Um, 
in general, the basis vectors could have, uh, there could be a quite large number, maybe even infinite number, uh, get if you have a large enough space. And so another way to form the identity, or another way to write the identity, is the sum over all k of the dyad formed by the ket k and the bra k. Now what happens if, as we do in uh, our free particle quantum system, uh, where we have an, not a countable number of basis vectors, but a continuous set of basis vectors, the momenta of a free particle are continuously distributed. Any momentum is okay. There's, they're not countable. So that summation needs to be converted into an integral. So the bras and the kets uh, end up needing to be integrated over, and so we get something like the bottom expression. And uh, let's, let's apply that idea. What if I start with psi of x? You notice that's x, the bra x acting on the ket psi, and uh, I just insert the identity, okay? And, but I want to expand the identity as the integral over the k basis vectors. Notice that I could bring the psi in here, I could bring the x in here, and rewrite this as x on k, k on psi. But what is x on k? x on k is 1 over the square root of 2 pi e to the i k x. What's k on psi? k on psi is phi of k. So if I put all that in, what do I get? I get the inverse Fourier transform. In other words, the inverse Fourier transform is simply what you get by sticking the identity in between x and psi in an expression for psi of x. So that's uh, curious. We can play the same game with 5k. I can write 5k as k on psi. I can stick the identity in there. This time I'll write the identity not in terms of a superposition of k basis vectors, but in as a superposition of x basis vectors. There shouldn't be anything wrong with that. It's a perfectly good basis. So I can uh, do the same trick. And what do I get? I get k on x, x on psi. But wait, what is k on x? Well, remember, whenever you flip the order of the arguments, or flip the order of the bra and the ket in an inner product, you get the complex conjugate of what you had before. In this case, that's going to give us 1 over the square root of 2 pi e to the minus i k x, psi of x. And that, of course, is nothing other than the Fourier transform, not the inverse Fourier transform. This is the definition of the Fourier transform. So what we see is that the Fourier transform and the inverse Fourier transform are really nothing other than a change of basis uh, defined by sticking the identity into the uh, expression for phi of uh, k or psi of x. Okay, let's, uh, let's do a little demo of the Fourier transform so you can see how this calculation actually works. So this is a little demo that is similar to Computing Project 5, but the idea is to, uh, here I'll scroll down here to the important part. The, uh, the idea is to start with the Gaussian wave packet. Notice it's uh, e to the i k x minus x over sigma squared. So this is the uh, imaginary part of the phase, and this gives you a sort of a traveling wave. Uh, this is a real part of the exponential, and this means that as x gets big, the amplitude drops. So this sort of uh, gives an envelope that gets multiplied by the e to the i k x to give a Gaussian wave packet. So it's shaped as a Gaussian, but uh, where the Gaussian, uh, where x is small, it just looks like a traveling wave. So we'll see how that looks in a second. Um, what we're doing is multiplying, every time I uh, I hit the up arrow when I'm running this demo. We're going to adjust k. k is going to be a number that uh, generates this uh, factor which multiplies the Gaussian wave packet, the psi function, and the factor is e to the minus i k x, where k is now a variable that's going to change as I advance through the, uh, the Fourier transform. k is the argument of the Fourier transform, so we're fiddling with k. That changes the um, wavelength of the uh, factor we're multiplying psi by, then, then we multiply phi by psi, we add them all up, that give, that's kind of an integral, and then scale it, and, uh, and then I'm going to plot what we get out um, from that sum, and uh, that thing I'm plotting, of course, is nothing other than the Fourier transform. So let's run it. 
<coughs> and look at what we get. So this is the integral I'm doing. This is psi of x. Notice it's a Gaussian wave packet. It's uh, got a Gaussian envelope, but inside the Gaussian it's a traveling wave uh, propagating to the right. And what I'm going to do is start with this k equal to 0. So when I start k equal to 0, oh, I've got to activate that screen. Uh, k is now equal to 0. Um, notice that uh, I'm going to get a very small integral here. I don't see a scale yet, but the, but the blue is the product of e to the minus i k x and psi of x. The red is psi of x, the green is e to the minus i k x, and the blue is the product. Now, if k is equal to 0, e to the minus i k x is just 1. So I'm just multiplying by 1. So notice how all the green phasors are just constant and equal to 1. And when I multiply by 1, of course, the blue arrows and the red arrows are the same. So, and, but the key is when I add up all those arrows, I, I sum all these guys, notice they're spinning around and around and around, and so when I add them up, I don't get very much. I get almost nothing. So let's advance k. So I'm going to bump k up, and notice what's happening. e to the minus i k x, of course, has the opposite helicity. It's spinning the opposite way of the red arrows, and the, uh, the blue arrows, because I'm subtracting something here. The psi, remember the psi is at e to the plus i k 0 x times a Gaussian, but I'm subtracting a k from k 0, and so the wavelength of the blue arrows, the product arrows, is getting longer. As I advance k, the product wavelength gets longer and longer and longer. It's really the difference between k naught and the k that I'm using in the, in the uh, factor, the e to the minus i k x, and notice at this point um, the green wavelength is getting close to the red wavelength and the blue wavelength is getting long because I'm subtracting off more and more. <coughs> this minus i k x is subtracting more and more so that the blue is wiggling less and less, and, if it, and as it wiggles less and less, Notice the Fourier transform is getting bigger. Now there are some bumps in here that has to do with the periodicity and the sampling, uh, the fact that we have a finite sample size, but, uh, but the main point is that this, uh, the Fourier transform is getting bigger as k advances. I'll continue to advance k, and notice uh, now the blue isn't even going through, how does it go? It's got, uh, there's like a little over a one wavelength in here that's counting, and there's a large portion where the arrows point in almost the same direction, and there's very little canceling. Notice there's very little canceling from that. So the Fourier transform is now getting big. If I continue to advance k, Fourier transform is getting quite large now, and notice that there, it's definitely not even a full wiggle. You can kind of see it's, it's doing kind of a half a shimmy in there, and as I advance k, I reach a point where it doesn't wiggle at all. There is no variation in the wavelength. This is when k is equal to k0. When k is equal to k0, the e to the minus kx and the e to the plus i k 0 x they cancel, and all I have left is a Gaussian. Notice the blue arrows just look like a pure Gaussian. I can get it there. Now it looks like an absolutely pure Gaussian. The Fourier transform is now at its peak. Okay, that's where that's the wavelength where most of the energy is. Of course, there was there was some here at uh, shorter wavelengths, or excuse me, longer wavelengths, short, smaller values of k. As I advance k further, <coughs> now it's going to start to wiggle again. The Fourier transform comes down, and you can see the width of the Fourier transform has to do with the range of k values over which the blue arrows didn't really uh, uh, rotate very much in the region of space where they were large. Okay? As k gets bigger, they rotate more, they're canceling each other out, and now we're not getting very much. So um, that's the way that integral works. It's, uh, it's simply by, by multiplying by e to the minus i k x and integrating, we're getting an estimate of how much of the wave packet is constructed f from that particular wavelength. And, uh, and that's how it goes. Okay, let's, uh, let's talk about the delta function potential. It's, uh, it's necessary first to talk about what the heck a delta function is. So it's hard to uh, write down 
an algebraic expression for a delta function because there there really isn't such a thing exactly but uh, there are a couple of limiting cases that I think give us some insight into what a delta function could be so you could think of it as the limit as a approaches zero of this function this is called a Lorentzian and I've made a graph here of several different Lorentzians with different values of a notice that when a is 0.3 it uh, it's sort of a short wide thing but as a gets smaller and smaller and smaller the Lorentzian gets skinnier and taller but the uh, the coefficient in front is cooked up so that the area under the Lorentzian is always the same it's always one so a delta function is uh, roughly speaking a skinny tall thing uh, that has an area equal to one in the limit that a goes to zero it becomes infinitely skinny infinitely tall but it retains its finite area as another example um, you could think of it as a limiting case of a Gaussian again it's a Gaussian whose width and height are going to change with when a is large it's sort of short and wide as a gets smaller and smaller it gets taller and skinnier but again throughout this variation of a the area remains fixed so if you compute the area under this Gaussian you always get one so again a delta function is a very tall very skinny function that uh, it's infinitely high infinitely skinny and uh, has an area again equal to one so the more mathematical definition is this integral but uh, this integral is pretty hard to visualize when when k <coughs> goes from minus infinity to infinity the exponential just uh, rotates in phase it's just a phaser that spins around the um, the axis I guess you could think of it that way and uh, for different values of K it spins different amounts but uh, when you add them all up you get nothing kind of I mean uh, the idea is that when you go through one complete cycle you get nothing and if you go th through an infinite number of complete cycles by integrating from minus infinity to plus infinity you still get nothing so that's kind of one way to think about it of course when K is equal to zero uh, you get e to the zero which is one so you're integrating one from minus infinity to infinity and so of course you get infinity so the function is infinite when x is equal to zero it's zero when x is non-zero and it's a matter of some uh, mathematics to show that uh, when you integrate over all x you get uh, you get one so and that is probably the most important behavior of this delta function is that if you go from one side if you have a delta of x minus a it's a delta function centered at x equals a and you integrate from one side of the delta function to the other side in other words from a minus epsilon to a plus epsilon where epsilon is greater than zero it's not it's not equal to zero so you're going a finite distance to the left of a and a finite distance to the right of a then what you get is the function evaluated exactly at a that makes sense because uh, since the delta function is non-zero only when x is equal to a the function doesn't vary when x is equal to a it's just equal to f of a so the function comes out of the integral and you get the integral of the delta function which of course is just one times the function evaluated at a so that's the idea of a delta function let's talk about a delta potential if i have a delta potential it basically is a potential energy function which is proportional to a delta function now one thing to notice is that uh, because the integral of the delta function over x is equal to 1 that means the delta function itself has units of 1 over distance so since alpha times the delta function has to have units of energy it means alpha has to have units of energy divided by distance or it must have units of force essentially okay it turns out that uh, a delta function admits only a single bound state let's see how that comes about what we can do is write out the Schrodinger equation put the delta function in there and uh, and see what kind of solutions we get if we plug in everything 
it ends up looking something like this. If we uh, multiply through by 2m over h bar squared with a minus sign, um, we get this differential equation. And the question is how to solve it. We'll solve it in two steps. First, we'll look for bound states where the energy is less than 0. And we will um, consider those portions of the x-axis that are away from the origin. So if we neglect the origin at the moment, then the delta function is 0. And the thing simplifies to uh, just the second derivative of psi is minus a constant times psi. We're going to call the constant kappa squared. You can see that for that to work, kappa has to be the square root of 2me over h bar, or two absolute value 2me over h bar, since e is negative. e is going to be less than 0 since we're looking for bound states. And uh, and psi, of course, has to therefore be a superposition of two types of solutions, um, an e to the plus kappa x and an e to the minus kappa x. Now, the thing is, if you're left of the origin, then the term e to the minus kappa x is going to lead to trouble because it'll blow up as x goes to minus infinity. If you're to the right of the origin, e to the plus kappa x is going to blow up. So what has to happen is the wave function has to be e to the plus kappa x when x is less than 0. It's got to go like e to the minus kappa x when x is greater than 0. And it also has to uh, be continuous, which means that at the origin, the left and the right solutions have to match, which they do as long as the coefficient a is the same on both sides. So if you look at the solution, it ends up looking something like this. Now, what do we do about the origin? OK, to handle the origin, we go back to the Schrodinger equation. And it turns out all delta function problems, all delta function potentials, uh, get handled the same way. Well, you can't deal with the delta function directly. You have to integrate across the delta function so that the properties we have for the delta function can be invoked. So if we integrate both sides of the Schrodinger equation from a, a little bit to the left, to a little bit to the right of the origin. So we'll go from minus epsilon to plus epsilon. Notice that uh, the second derivative integrated gives you the first derivative. The delta function integrated just gives you the wave function evaluated at the origin. And the wave function integrated over a tiny distance uh, gives you nothing, because the, we're going to let epsilon go to 0 in the end, or become nearly 0. So. Um, Looking at what happens, we get uh, the first derivative evaluated at plus and minus epsilon plus 2m alpha over h bar squared times the value of the wave function at the origin, which is what we get from the delta function integrated, uh, is equal to 0. So if you look at that, what that tells us is the slope has a kink in it. And the kink happens between plus and minus epsilon. And uh, putting in our solutions just to the right and just to the left of the origin, the e to the minus kappa x and e to the plus kappa x, what we get is that um, minus 2 kappa a is minus 2m alpha over h bar squared times a. And so the 2s cancel and the a's cancel. And what you get is a condition on kappa. Now remember that kappa was related to the energy. So if we know kappa, we know the energy. So now we know the energy of the bound state. So that's how that works. I wanted to point out you can also use dimensional analysis to, ar to arrive at the same result. Um, you know that the kappa has to have some kind of units. It, it needs to be some, um, well, it has units of 1 over length, but it's got to be built up somehow of mass of alpha and h bar, because those are the only constants in the equation. And so we can plug in. Uh, 1 over kappa has to be m to the a, and then it's got to be alpha to the b, and it's got to be h bar to the c. If we put in what the units of m, alpha, and h bar are, the only way we can get it to work out is if uh, a plus b plus c is 0. If uh, negative 1, that's the 1 over l, is 3b plus 2c, you can see how things have to add up. And we know that um, negative 2b minus c has to be 0, since there's no time in 1 over length. And then we get three equations and three unknowns, and we can solve them. So we get b is equal to 1, c is equal to negative 2, a is equal to 1. And that tells us that 
uh, unit-wise at least, kappa has to be proportional to m alpha over h bar squared. It turns out it's not just proportional to, it's actually equal to. So the proportionality constant happens to be 1. But uh, I just wanted to point out that dimensional analysis is a very powerful technique for, uh, for estimating the behavior of solutions to differential equations, or at least to eigenvalues. Okay. Hi guys, welcome back. It's time for lesson 16. We're going to do delta function potential again, but this time we'll be discussing scattering states. Also, I have a, another addendum to our ever-evolving interpretation and understanding of the Fourier transform. So let's get started. First of all, um, I want to point out that for the delta function potential, there was only one bound state unlike the infinite square well and simple harmonic oscillator where there were an infinite number of states. But what happens to the delta function potential when you let the energy become greater than zero? Well, let's see. If you uh, write out the Schrodinger equation and then um, move things around a little bit, you can see that uh, when focusing on positions that are not at the origin, that if the energy is positive, you end up with uh, simple traveling waves. Traveling waves meaning some component of e to the plus ikx and a little bit of e to the minus ikx. Now, that particular wave function is not very well behaved in infinity, but never mind, we'll just march ahead and uh, hope that we can work out some way to make it make sense a little bit later. Now the thing is, we know the wave function has to be defined on the left and on the right side of the delta function, but we don't really know what's going to go on at the delta function yet. But um, what we can do is simply write an arbitrary or a general expression for a linear superposition of a right traveling and left traveling wave on the left of the potential and a right traveling and left traveling wave on the right of the potential. Now. Um, Generally, in an experimental setup, we would have particles, a particle beam coming from, say, one direction, and uh, particles would either scatter off the potential or they would be transmitted through the potential, but uh, that would mean that there would be no particles coming from the right of the potential heading left. So that means the G term in this expression would be zero. So we can get rid of the G we can rewrite our wave function er everywhere but at the origin as a right and left traveling wave to the left of the potential and a, only a right traveling wave to the right of the potential. Now, we know the wave function has to be continuous, but it also, uh, it turns out, has to have a discontinuity in the first derivative, the same way it did for the bound state. And you can remember um, how that worked. You know, to be continuous, of course, a plus b has to be equal to f because uh, you plug in 0 in for x uh, for the wave function at the left and the wave function at the right, and you get a plus b is f. You can write out the Schrodinger equation, including the delta function, at the origin. If you integrate the Schrodinger equation just from just to the left, minus epsilon, to just to the right, plus epsilon, You'll notice that the first term gives you a difference between the first derivative, the second term gives you a constant, and the term on the right of the equal sign, of course, is zero because we're, we're taking an infinitesimal integral uh, of a finite wave function. So we get the simple result that uh, the difference in the derivative of psi between the just to the right and just to the left of the origin plus 2m alpha over h bar squared times the value of the wave function at the origin must be zero. If you remember all that, stick in the definition of psi just to the left and just to the right, you get the expression ikf minus ika minus b plus 2m alpha over h bar squared times f, that has to be zero. And of course, since we know, we remember that a plus b is equal to f, we can get rid of b in the top expression, and that allows us to solve for f over a, then we can put f over a back in and solve for b over a. In any case, we get two expressions, one for the ratio of b to a, 
and one for the ratio of f to a. Um, now it turns out that the probability of being reflected is equal to the, uh, the ratio of b to a magnitude squared, and the ratio of being transmitted is the ratio of f to a magnitude squared. What I like to do actually when I'm solving these kind of problems is to just set a equal to 1 because all we ever get out of the analysis is the ratio of b to a or f to a and it's at that point there's only two numbers really that are of any interest and so you might as well just set a to 1 and it's solve for b and f. Anyway, uh, if you calculate the probability of transmission and the probability of reflection as a function of energy where you measure energy in units of alpha squared m over 2 h bar squared that's the sort of natural units of energy for the problem you can see that you get uh, what may be an obvious result when when you think about it but uh, basically the higher the energy the lower the probability of reflection and the higher the probability of transmission so this is sort of consistent with most actual real scattering experiments that if you go to a high enough energy that the thing won't get stopped, it won't get reflected, it'll just pass right on through. Okay, so um, I want to point out a couple things about this result. One is that we still haven't dealt with the problem of the uh, fact that these wave functions don't really behave very well. Notice that beta is inversely proportional to k, so beta depends on energy and you can see that beta shows up in both of these ratios, b to a and f to a, and so those ratios also depend on energy. Now what if I wanted to make a wave packet? How would I have to do? I'd have to superpose a, a bunch of different wavelengths in order to form a wave packet. That means I'd have to superpose a bunch of different momenta, or different k's, and each k has a different ratio of b to a or f to a. So if you think about forming a wave packet, you immediately think about the Fourier transform. Because you know that a Gaussian wave packet, for example, has a Gaussian Fourier transform, which means that it's a, a superposition of different momenta with a sort of a Gaussian shape. And that uh, if you want to figure out how that Fourier transform evolves in time, each energy component evolves at a different frequency, but each energy component is, of course, the same thing as a different momentum component, since the only thing energy depends on is momentum. And so uh, what you get is a wave packet that evolves uh, the way we computed in Computing Project 8, or 5, excuse me, Computing Project 5, where uh, you multiply each e to the i kx by e to the minus i omega sub kt and then integrate over all k to get the time evolution of the whole thing. So I want to show you a, a little demo about that now. Okay, so this is actually the solution for computing project 7, which we're not going to get to for a while. But I just wanted to give you a sneak peek in advance, and also it relates to the uh, concept I want to demonstrate right now. Uh, what you see there on the left is a wave packet that's propagating to the right. And it's about to encounter a potential barrier. That's the blue sort of cylindrical thing there. Okay, that's a, that's a potential barrier. You can kind of see through it a little bit. But uh, the wave packet's going to hit that potential barrier. And it's gonna, uh, some of it is going to reflect and some of it is going to be transmitted. And since we can do uh, reflection and transmission from a Dirac delta function potential as in addition to a, a finite size barrier like this one, um, a similar effect is going to occur. But what I want to point out is that um, the wave packet spreads just like it does in the free particle case. It is, in fact, a free particle wave function at this point, so it's a spreading wave packet. But when it gets close to the barrier, you'll notice that there's some interference going on. The uh, the wave packet partially reflects and is partially transmitted. And above here we have the calculation of the probability of finding the particle on the left and the probability of finding the particle on the right as a function of time. So you can see that uh, after the encounter the probability of being on the left is diminished, the probability of being on the right is enhanced because obviously there's a finite probability of finding the particle over here. 
Um, now, classically, this barrier is higher than the kinetic energy components, any of the kinetic energy components of the wave packet. And so, classically, there should be no transmission at all. So this phenomena is sometimes called barrier penetration. But what I, what I wanted to get to, as far as this demo is concerned, is simply that you can form a wave packet of many different momentum components and compute what happens as a function of time. We'll learn how to do this for a, for a potential barrier in, uh, in Computing Project 7, but uh, you can do it in a direct way that for an arbitrary potential, um, and you see that you get some chance of being transmitted, some chance of being uh, reflected, but that in the in sort of a realistic scenario, you'd have a superposition of many different momentum components in order to form a wave packet. That's the idea. Okay, so what that means is, what the ratio B to A really is, is it's the ratio of the, uh, it's the thing you multiply the Fourier transform of the initial wave packet by, to get the Fourier transform of the reflected wave. And F over A is the thing you multiply the Fourier transform of the incoming wave by to get the Fourier transform of the, the uh, transmitted wave. So, and when I say multiply Fourier transform by, I mean that each K component of the Fourier transform gets multiplied by the ratio B to A for that K. And, it, and the next K component gets multiplied by a different ratio B to A, but the one that's appropriate for the next K, and the next K, and the next K. So you're actually multiplying by this ratio B to A and F to A in momentum space. So there, it's actually a kind of a vector that you multiply each component, that you multiply the Fourier transform by, where each momentum component gets multiplied by a slightly different number since B over A and F over A depend on momentum. Anyway, I hope that's clear. Here's another demo to helpfully, uh, hopefully help you visualize what I mean by all that. So here we have a slightly different approach. Um, let me describe for you what we have here. This is the initial wave packet moving in from the left and uh, basically it's a uh, e to the i k zero x times a Gaussian, and so you get a Gaussian envelope around a traveling wave. If you take the Fourier transform of this guy, um, and you multiply that Fourier transform by the ratio of b to a, in other words, where if you multiply the uh, initial Fourier transform with the ratio of B to A, what you get is a new packet, but that packet happens to be over here at t equals zero, which is an interesting thing, because the B coefficient only applies to the wave function when it's to the left of the potential. So basically the, the, the reflected packet is over here at t equals zero. Uh, it hasn't, in a way, you could think of it that way, it, but it's not realized yet because it's on the right-hand side of the origin, uh, which is only valid for the uh, F, or the transmitted part of the, the packet. On the other hand, if you take the original um, Fourier transform of the original packet and multiply by the ratio of F over A, then you get this uh, packet. But of course, this packet is the transmitted packet, but it it's only really valid on the right-hand side of the potential. Now, what's the total wave function? Well, on the left-hand side of the potential, it's the sum of this packet and this packet. And on the right-hand side of the potential, it's just this packet. But of course, this packet's on the left, this packet's on the right, so they don't actually contribute at this moment to the real wave packet. At this moment, the only contribution to the real wave packet is the incoming wave. But what happens if we turn on the time? Now, these packets evolve in time exactly the same way the packets, the packet you're using for Computing Project 5, the, the free particle wave packet. And uh, if you turn on the time, you'll notice something interesting happens. These guys come together. Now, this packet and this packet and this packet just continue to evolve as free particle wave packets. But on the left-hand side of the potential of the origin, the result is the sum of this one and this one. On the right-hand side, it's just this one. So the potential is right in here. So notice that 
already we're getting some interference between this left moving packet and this right moving packet. Let me go ahead and turn on the time again. You can see that you get a kind of a standing wave behavior. And then after the packets pass through, the transmitted packet is now all that contributes to this packet, and the reflected packet is all that contributes to that packet. So uh, the Fourier transform of the original incoming packet now produces a wave that's over here on the right-hand side if you evolve it on its own, and uh, it doesn't contribute to anything because it's only a valid contributor on the left side. So anyway, that's one simple way to do uh, scattering calculations using the Fourier transform um, for free particle states. Okay, now one other thing I want to do in these slides for today is to Im continually evolve and deepen our understanding of the discrete of the Fourier transform in general and today in particular the discrete Fourier transform. So here are the expressions for the discrete Fourier transform and the discrete inverse Fourier transform. Uh, the idea is the Fourier transform is now a uh, sequence of numbers. The function whose Fourier transform you're computing, the discrete version, is not really a continuous function, but rather it's a sampled function. So you have a bunch of samples of a function, and you're computing the Fourier transform of those samples, and what you get is a sampled Fourier transform. So the function is a list of numbers. The Fourier transform is a corresponding list of numbers. And uh, you can jump back and forth between the function and the Fourier transform and the Fourier transform and the function. So all the information in the function winds up also in its Fourier transform and vice versa. Um, unfortunately, looking at those summation symbols and trying to cogitate upon those calculations uh, doesn't really lend a lot of insight into what's actually going on. But uh, I hope that when you're done with these slides, you'll have more insight than you have now about what's going on. Because, in fact, the discrete Fourier transform is just another form of a change of basis. So we're just changing from one basis to another, and we can change back and forth. The values of the Fourier transform give us different information than the values of the function, but they're equally uh, useful, I guess, and, uh, and they both contain all the information about the function. Each contains all the information that the other contains. I want you to notice one big difference between the discrete Fourier transform and the and the uh, continuous Fourier transform, and that is that the discrete version isn't symmetric. So in the continuous version, there's a 1 over the square root of 2 pi in front of each of them, and the integrals look almost exactly the same. In the discrete version, the convention is that the, uh, the function, which is the superposition of all the Fourier transform terms, has a 1 over n in front of the summation sign, and the, uh, the Fourier transform does not have any 1 over n. Now, uh, in the continuous version, they basically take the 1 over 2 pi and split it between the two. Each of them gets a 1 over square root of 2 pi. We could do the same thing here and put a 1 over the square root of big N in front of each of those summation signs, but that's just not the way it's done. It's just a tradition to do it this way. All the computer software you ever use that computes the discrete Fourier transform is going to do it this way because that's the way everybody does it. So I just wanted to point out that distinction so that you're not too disturbed by it. What I want to do is to develop a, a Dirac notation or a matrix vector representation of the Fourier transform. What I want you to focus on is the thing in the parentheses there, the e to the minus 2 pi i k over n. Now, the sum in this summation is over j. So the thing in parentheses is, is getting multiplied, or is getting taken to a higher and higher power, and multiplied by the original function to produce the kth component of the discrete Fourier transform. And notice that... Uh, the 2 pi over n is pretty prominent there. What it means is if you have an n element function, you take 2 pi and divide it into n slices. So um, I'm going to do an example in a moment with four pieces, 
where the Fourier transform is four element vector, the original function is a four element vector, and so we'd be dividing two pi by four, which would give us pi over two, or 90 degrees. So um, I'm gonna define alpha to be e to the minus two pi i over n, and uh, in the case n equals four, of course, that means alpha is gonna be e to the minus i times pi over two, or e to the minus i times 90 degrees. And uh, you can think of alpha as just the angle. It's the angle you get when you divide 2 pi by n. So if n is 4, obviously that's a 90 degree angle. And then you can think of the Fourier transform as just the jth element of the function times alpha to the k to the jth power. So the kth element of the Fourier transform gets alpha to the k multiplied by, or taken to the power of j, and then multiplied out. If you think of the original function as a vector, so in this case it's a four element column vector, you can think of k, the kth basis vector of the Fourier transform basis, as being alpha to the 0k, alpha to the 1k, alpha to the 2k, and alpha to the 3k, all divided by four. So that would be like, so for example, um, if you wanted to calculate the dot product of the kth bra vector, now the, the bra is just the horizontal version of the ket without the one over n. Remember the one over n only shows up in the inverse Fourier transform. The one over n doesn't show in the other. And the consequence of that is that when you make the bra of a basis vector, you don't, you don't just, uh, take the complex conjugate of each of these guys, you um, you take the complex conjugate of the alphas, but you don't carry over the n. So anyway, this means that the inner product of k and f, where f is some arbitrary function, is just uh, like so, f0, alpha to the 0k, time plus f1, alpha to the minus 1k, and so on. Note that this is exactly the same as the Fourier transform. It's just written slightly differently. And uh, that means you can think of the ket k and the bra k as basis vectors. And the kth element of the Fourier transform is simply the projection of f onto the k direction. So we're basically saying how much does f point in the k direction? You can think of k as just a unit vector in some other space. Let's go ahead and push on this four element system and see if we can find an easier way to visualize what's actually going on. That's what I want to get to. So our four element basis vectors are um, the zero vector. That means we're, we're taking uh, alpha to the zero to different powers, but of course alpha to the zero is just one. And uh, that means that we just have a list of ones. And then the one vector has alpha to the zero, alpha to the one, alpha to the two, and alpha to the three. The two vector, instead of going up by one each time, it goes up by two, and the three vector, instead of going up by two, it goes up by three. And they all have a one-fourth. The corresponding bras are easy to work out. The only difference is the alphas are taken to the negative power rather than the positive power. And then you can work out the inner product of any bra, the arbitrary kth bra and the jth ket. Uh, you can see that that's easy to do. You just put in the general expressions for um, those basis vectors in terms of alpha, and, uh, and you get the following result. Now notice that there's a k minus j in each term. What I'm going to point out is that when k and j are equal, each of those alphas gets taken to the zero power, and that makes them all one. And so you get 1 plus 1 plus 1 plus 1 divided by 4, and you get an inner product of 1. So the whole thing works out to be normalized correctly. However, if j is different than k, j and k are integers, if j and k are, are different, then you're going to get alpha to some power. You're going to get 1 plus alpha to some power plus alpha to twice that much plus alpha times 3 times that much. But the angles here are all 90, 180, 270, and 360 degrees. So, in fact, we never get to 360 degrees because there are only four elements. So it's 0, 90, 180, 270. 
And so if you take a integer power, higher integer powers of phasers that have those different angles, when you add them up, you're always going to get zero, no matter whether you do 90 degrees, 180 degrees, or 270 degrees. So uh, we'll, we'll see how that works out here in a moment. Let's, uh, let's try to make a more visual representation of this thing using phasers. So what I want to do is to replace these numbers that show up here as powers of alpha and so on with phasers that show us what the angles are. So one, of course, is a phaser that points along the real axis, so it's horizontal. Alpha to the 1. Now remember, alpha is minus pi over 2 when n equals 4. So alpha to the 1 is going to be a down-pointing phaser. Alpha squared is going to point to the left, and alpha cubed is going to point straight up. We just add 90 degrees each time. On the other hand, if you go up by two powers each time, alpha squared is going to be nine, or 180 degrees, so it's going to point to the left. Alpha to the fourth, we're back to 360 degrees, and alpha to the sixth, we're, we're uh, another 180 degrees, so it points back to the left. So the n equals 2 ket has phasers that point back and forth and back and forth and back and forth. The n equals 3 ket, you go 270 degrees, so you start pointing to the right, then you go 270, that gets you all the way around to point up. Then another 270 gets you pointing left, and another 270 gets you pointing down. I want you to notice that that's exactly the same you, thing you'd get if you'd chosen minus 90, or to go counterclockwise 90 degrees each time. You get the same result. So there's a sense in which the third ket is like the n equals minus 1 ket. It's like the minus, in fact, it's exactly the negative of the, of the 1 ket each time. So that's, uh, that's kind of interesting. In other words, well, I don't mean each element is the negative of the corresponding 1 ket, but I mean that it's like turning the phaser at a negative 1 angle, a negative 90 degrees each time around, instead of a positive 90 degrees each time around. Okay, so we could also do this for the bras, except, of course, the bras have to rotate in the opposite direction because the alphas have a minus one power, minus two, minus three, and so on. So the bras go in the opposite direction. And uh, it's interesting to see how that works out. If I take the ket one and hit it on the bra, or hit the bra one on the ket one, I get, uh, I have to multiply corresponding elements and then, and then that get the sum. But I want you to notice what you get when you multiply the corresponding elements. You get one times one, then you get e to the plus pi over 2 times e to the minus pi over 2. But of course, that's just 1. And then you get e to the uh, e to the i pi, and then you get e to the minus i pi. But of course, that's also 1. And then you get e to the i, uh, what is it, e to the minus pi over 2, i pi over 2 times e to the plus i pi over 2, and that's also 1. So when you multiply that all out, you get 1 plus 1 plus 1 plus 1, all divided by 4, and the whole thing turns out to be 1. So if we're looking at the bra 1 and the ket 2 uh, inner product, you'll notice that, again, we're going to multiply corresponding pieces of the bra and the ket. And when you calculate the product of those things, you notice what you get is a phaser that rotates by 90 degrees uh, for each component. So the 1 times 1 is a phaser pointing to the right. Uh, 180 times, one or times 90 is a phaser pointing down. 180 times 1 is a phaser pointing to the left, and 270 times 180 is a phaser pointing straight up. Um, the sum of all those four phasers <coughs> has got to be 0. So you get an orthogonal 1 and 2. And it turns out if, if either of the numbers is different from the, the other, then, uh, then you get nothing. So that's the way it works. And the Arrow business is just a way to visualize what's happening with the phases, because it's the phases that actually are the main point here. So let's do the same thing, but this time for n equals 8. There's the 0, 1, 2, and 3 kets, and the 4, 5, 6, and 7 kets. Um, I want to point out something about the 4 ket. Notice that every other component is advanced by 180 degrees. That was also true in the n equals 4 case, the n equal 2 ket there. Um, 
had that property. It's always the capital N over 2 ket that has the property that the next phaser is 180 degrees out of phase with the previous one. And uh, that makes sense because it's, it's uh, 2 pi over N is the phase alpha. And if we go capital N over 2, then uh, we end up with pi. As the, as the phase from one component to the next, and that's exactly what you see there in the fourth ket. So what I want to point out is that um, all the kets up to n over 2 have ever-increasing values of alpha. But the kets after n over 2, they also have increasing values of alpha, but I want you to think of them in a different way because you can also think of the n equals 7 ket in this example as having a frequency of minus 1. If you look at the 1 ket and the 7 ket, you'll notice that the phasers in the 7 ket advance the same magnitude of phase each time, but in the opposite direction. So it looks like a negative 45 degrees each time instead of plus 45 degrees in the n equals 1. And, and the 6 ket is advancing minus 90 degrees each time, whereas the 2 is plus 90. And the 8 ket is minus 135 degrees each time, whereas the 3 ket is plus 135 degrees each time. So there's a very real sense in which you can think of 7 is minus 1, 6 is minus 2, and 5 as minus 3. So in reality, in the discrete Fourier transform, the negative frequencies are actually built in, but they show up in the kets that go from n over 2 plus 1 up to n minus 1. And, uh, and the minus, and, and they go, how can I say this? The most negative frequency is the n over 2 plus 1. In this case, it's the 5. And the least negative frequency is the n minus 1. In this case, that's the 7. So that's where the negative frequencies are. And in the Computing Project 5, you'll notice there's a lot of monkey business trying to work out where those negative frequencies are. But I thought with this picture of what's going on, it might be easier to understand. So what does it mean? It means that this complicated formula is really just the inner product of the kth basis vector and the function. It's just a simple inner product. And that the... Uh, the function, when you reconstruct the function, that complicated function is just the sum over the Fourier components times the Fourier basis vector. So it's just a simple component basis vector sum. And you can think of that, if you put those two pieces together, you can see that we have back our simple quantum mechanical, actually it's linear algebra formula, of, of the change of basis, that uh, the sum of k over the bras and the kets, the projection operators for the k basis, is the identity. And so you can simply say f equals identity times f. But in quantum mechanics, we can also put in the time. And so the time evolution of that ket is what you get by simply sticking in e to the minus i omega t for each of the components of the Fourier transform. And that's what Computing Project 5 is all about, calculating that sum. And notice that uh, Really, that's just the inverse Fourier transform. So all you have to do is stick the e to the minus i omega t in and multiply all the Fourier components by their corresponding frequency phasers and then perform the inverse Fourier transform. And that's exactly what we do in Project 5. So that's all we have for today. Okay, so here we are, lessons 19 and 20. I'm going to combine lessons 19 and 20 together because uh, I didn't get the slides done in time for a live lesson 19, but I've got 20 pretty well sorted out. So I'm just going to make one video to cover both lessons. So the issue is, what's the finite square well, and what kind of states does it have, both uh, bound states and scattering states? So what is a finite square well? Well, it's a well with finite depth and width. So you can imagine drawing a picture of such a thing. It might look something like this. Um, we're going to make the potential energy outside the well equal to zero. That's a convention. Uh, it's a nice convention because it means particles that escape from the well have no potential energy outside the well. 
and all their energy is kinetic. But inside the well, there's a negative potential energy, and it has a depth of V0, so the potential energy at the bottom of the well is minus V0. Also, the well has a, uh, a width of 2A, and we denote that by having the right-hand uh, edge of the well at plus A, and the left-hand edge of the well at minus A. This gives us a symmetric potential. And one of the consequences of being symmetric is that the wave function has to be either symmetric or anti-symmetric. So uh, marching ahead, we've got the Schrodinger equation, our old buddy. Uh, we know the wave function has to have a certain symmetry. We also know that the wave function itself has to be continuous at the uh, points where the potential changes, and the first derivative must also be continuous at those points. Uh, it's easy to solve the Schrodinger equation in regions of constant potential. It's just uh, depending on whether the kinetic energy or depending on whether the energy is greater than or less than the potential energy, it'll either be uh, traveling waves, e to the plus and minus ikx, or it'll be real exponentials, e to the plus and minus kappa x. Uh, for some reason, Griffiths, choose, Griffiths chooses to use L instead of K as the wave number inside the well. So when you write out the solution, um, it turns out to look something like this. It's got a cosine LX instead of KX inside, and it's got a decreasing exponential in the positive X direction and a decreasing exponential in the negative X direction outside the well. The notation at the bottom just says that it's symmetric, so that if you want to know what the wave function is at negative 3 or whatever, negative 62, you plug in uh, psi at uh, plus 62 and then it's equal to that because it's symmetric. Now there is an anti-symmetric solution where you'd have a sine LX in the middle and a minus psi of negative X um, in the region for X is less than negative A, but uh, basically it's the same idea. Uh, I also want to point out that to begin with I'm going to look for bound states. That means we're looking for states for which the energy is negative. So let's march ahead. We'll move the uh, math up to the top of the page. Let's apply the condition of continuity of the wave function at x equals a. Uh, that means that d times the cosine of l a is equal to f e to the minus kappa a. We just plugged a in for x in the middle and in the right formula and uh, demanded that the wave function be equal on either side, whether you evaluate it using the right-hand formula or the left-hand formula. Uh, we don't have to worry about applying the boundary condition at minus a because of the symmetry of the wave function. So we we'll won't worry about that. We get the same thing anyway. Then let's apply the derivative uh, boundary condition. The, the wave function's derivative must also be continuous. That means that if you calculate the derivative of the wave function and then plug in a, either in the middle or on the right-hand side, you have to end up with the same thing. And you'll notice that there's a D in each of these equations, and there's an F in each of these equations, and they come in the same way. So if we divide the bottom equation by the top equation, we get a single equation, which is that the uh, wave number times the tangent of LA is equal to kappa. So uh, that gives us a constraint on L and kappa. Uh, there's another constraint on L and kappa, which I'll describe in a moment, but before I get to that, Let's talk about the anti-symmetric state. The only difference with the anti-symmetric state is it would have a sine in the middle instead of a cosine. And all that does is uh, change the cosine in the continuity equation to a sine, and it changes the negative sine in the derivative continuity into a plus cosine. And if you plug all that in, you find that uh, what you get is L times the cotangent of LA is equal to minus kappa. So this is the condition for the anti-symmetric wave function. So we have one condition for the symmetric and a different condition for the anti-symmetric case. Okay, marching ahead, let's, uh, let's get back to uh, the issue of, of the energy. I want to point out that uh, that there's a relationship between L and kappa. The, the, the only relationship isn't that uh, these two transcendental equations have to be solved, but L and kappa have a further constraint. And that is that uh, the kinetic energy inside the well 
has to do with the wavelength of the sinusoidal wave function inside the well, and it's p squared over 2m. Of course, p squared is just h bar l squared, and so you can evaluate the kinetic energy inside the well as h bar l quantity squared divided by 2m. Now, uh, the other thing that's interesting is outside the well, when the energy is less than zero, you get an exponentially decaying wave function. If you compute the uh, kappa, the, the exponential decay factor outside the well, you'll find that h bar kappa squared over 2m is just the uh, depth of the energy below zero. In other words, it's, uh, it's the magnitude of the energy. And you can see from the picture that the sum of those two has to be nothing other than the depth of the well. So that means that um, h bar kappa squared over 2m plus h bar l squared over 2m is equal to v0. If I define h bar l0 squared over 2m to be v0, that depth, then I can see that uh, I get a condition on l0, l, and kappa. It looks almost like a Pythagorean theorem. The point is l0 is determined entirely by the depth of the well and the mass of the particle. So if you make little l bigger, you got to make kappa smaller. And if you make kappa bigger, you got to make little l smaller. So that means that high kinetic energy states have a very small kappa, and low kinetic energy states have a very large kappa. Intuitively, what that means is that uh, states where the energy is deep down inside the well, close to the bottom of the well, do not penetrate very far outside the well. But those states that have a high energy close to the edge of the well, close to zero, they have a large little l, and that means their cap is very small, which means they penetrate deeply into the forbidden zone outside the well. So that's the meaning of that statement. The mathematical consequence is that if you know little l, you also know kappa. So they're not independent of each other. You can use this relationship to relate one to the other. And that's exactly what we're going to do. Griffiths defines z to be little l times a, and he defines z naught to be l0 times a. If I multiply that Pythagorean type equation by a squared, I get a new Pythagorean type equation except that uh, the first term there is going to be z0 squared, the second term is z squared, and we're going to leave the last term al alone. The idea is to use the last term anywhere we see that in our equations. We'll replace it by uh, using this Pythagorean-like theorem, or this Pythagorean-like expression, to replace it with something that only depends on z. So we're getting rid of kappa, and we're replacing it with z. We're getting rid of l everywhere, replacing it with z. That's the plan. So let's go back to these two transcendental equations. Let's multiply both sides by a. So now we have a new transcendental equation, except notice that now we have z times the tangent of z is equal to kappa a. But kappa a is the square root of z0 squared minus z squared, using the Pythagorean-like formula from the previous slide. And we can do the same thing with the, uh, with the cotangent version. And so now what we get are two transcendental equations, one for the even states, one for the odd states, that depend only on this z. And of course, z is l times a. So if you, if you know the width of the well and you know z, you can figure out uh, little l. You can get the kinetic energy inside. You can get kappa outside, again, going back to the Pythagorean theorem or formula or whatever that thing is. And you can see that these uh, transcendental equations look something like this. If I've, I've graphed the square root of uh, z0 squared minus z squared divided by z uh, as that black curve, and then the uh, red and green curves are the tangent and minus the cotangent of z, um, you can see that for this particular value of z0, I think z0 is 4 in this picture, um, that there are three solutions and uh, two of them are even, and one of them is odd. And Griffiths basically stops there and goes on to scattering states. But I, I can't stop there because I think this transcendental equation is pretty hard to get intuitive results from because it's so goofy looking, all the curves that you don't have a hard time drawing. And so I want to point out that there's a much simpler way to do these transcendental equations, and that is to recast them in terms of sines and cosines. So here's the plan. Let's start back 
at the beginning and let's square both sides. So we'll square both sides of this equation. Then let's add z squared to both sides. And we get this. And then I want you to remember that tangent squared plus 1 is secant squared. And cotangent squared plus 1 is cosecant squared. So I can substitute cosecant squared and secant squared for, uh, for those guys. But remember, what is secant squared? It's 1 over cosine squared. And what is cosecant squared? It's 1 over sine squared. So I can uh, solve those guys, take the square root, and I get the absolute value of cosine is z over z0 for the even states. I get the absolute value of sine is z over z0 for the odd states. We have to take care, though, because when we did the squaring and the square rooting, we, we lost some sine information. That is one drawback of this approach. But it's easy enough to figure out. If you draw the thing, you can see that uh, all you have to do is draw the uh, 0 to 90 degree, 90 degree uh, cosine curve and then just repeat it every pi over 2. So between pi over 2 and 2 pi over 2, it's uh, sine. Between 2 pi over 2 and 3 pi over 2, it's minus cosine. But it's the same curve. You just repeat it over and over again every pi over 2 radians for z0. And then the z over z0 from the right is just a straight line. It's a straight line that, uh, that's 1 when z is equal to z0, and it's 0 when z is equal to 0. And uh, even on a bad day, I can draw a straight line. And so you can see in this case, there are, what, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 solutions in the case that I've drawn here. Um, but it's easy to extract values of z from this guy and uh, you don't require great feats of uh, sketching or graphing or uh, Newton's algorithm or any of that business. So that's the point. Of course, uh, z0 is the value of z uh, that corresponds to uh, the full depth of the well. Um, basically, it's, uh, it's L0 times A, and so you just compute that number. Once you know the depth of the well and the width of the well, uh, you can you can calculate it. It's just a pure phase, no units. All right. So that's how that works. I want to. Uh, oh yeah, here are the solutions. I'll point them out to you. And uh, I'll, the other thing I want to point out is if you pick one of those solutions and then you go back and sketch the sinusoid all the way back to the origin, what you have is actually a uh, representation of the actual wave function because uh, it does correctly predict the slope and the height of the wave function at the edge of the well where it matches up with the exponential part. So we'll get a chance to try that out when we uh, when we work on computing project 6 and uh, we'll also do some sketching exercises in class so you guys get some experience with that. So I wanted to take a few minutes just to show you guys a quick demo of the bound state solutions to the finite square well and how they relate to the interior and exterior solutions and how the boundary condition comes into play. So what I've got here is two curves. This is uh, the top curve here, the, the, uh, this one, the green curve, is a cosine inside the well. The well has a, a width uh, or a, a parameter, half the width is one, so I guess it's a well width of two. and uh, we have a k0 of 5, so um, that represents the depth of the well. And, uh, and of course, since a is 1 in whatever units, I guess uh, you could say ev nanometers or whatever you like, <coughs> um, then z0 from Griffith's algebra is, uh, is also 5. So the, the way this thing works is I, I have a dial here. I can adjust k. So by adjusting k, I get the interior wavelengths to go up and down, and then of course you know that kappa and k are related by this uh, Pythagorean-like relationship, and so it means that uh, if I make k big, I make kappa small. So you can see as k gets bigger, the exponential outside the well gets weaker. Okay, so that's that's kind of the idea. Now the question is, what are the solutions going to be? Uh, I've got another graph here I can show you that is the one we cooked up in class to find the k values, or really the z values, that satisfy the boundary conditions. And you'll notice that in this case, uh, I have set, um, 
well, I guess Z0 is adjustable, so I can adjust Z0 to whatever you like. I'm going to set it to 5 here, and there's some kind of quirk that, uh, well, anyway. I set Z0 to 5, so when Z is equal to 5, Z over Z0 is equal to 1. You can see here's the here's the 1, and there's Z0 is equal to 5, and there are four solutions. So it looks like the first solution is right about here, which, if I'm reading correctly, is about... 1.3 or so, 1.3. So if I pop back over to this side and I dial the K value to 1.3, you'll notice that that's exactly the point where the kink in the slope between the cosine in the inside and the exponential on the outside, that kink disappears. So 1.3 is the value of K that not only satisfies the continuity, Notice I got this thing set up so it always the continuity is always there, but the uh, but the derivative has a kink in it except at certain special values of k, and those values of k are the ones that solve the transcendental equation. Let's check the next one. Um, it looks like that's at about two point six or so. Now uh, one other thing I want to point out before we move on, and notice how steep this, how sharp this exponential is. It goes to zero very quickly. It's down in the dirt by 1.6. Um, but let's march ahead and let's find the point where the other solution, the asymmetric solution, and notice it's right about 2.6. The kink goes away at 2.6, but the exponential now is a little bit weaker. It's not coming to zero quite as quickly, but uh, that value of k, 2.6, is right about where the slope and the continuity boundary conditions are both satisfied. Now, where's the next one? It looks like it's going to be about 3. Point, let's see, 5, 6, 7, 8, 3.85 or 3.9, I guess 3.80 something. That's hard, kind of hard to see. Um, Let's go ahead and dial this up to 3.80 something, and notice that that's right about where the kink disappears in the cosine solution, in the symmetric solution. So um, each solution to this uh, transcendental equation corresponds to a k value where the continuity equation and the slope condition, the derivative of the, of the wave function, are continuous at the well boundary. Um, and notice that each one corresponds only to a solution for a particular symmetry, even, odd, even. And here we see that the last solution looks like it's going to be right around 4.9 or so, almost 5, not quite, 4.9. Let's dial that in. Uh, and this is going to be an anti-symmetric solution. Let's go ahead and dial it up, 4.9. There it is. And uh, Notice we've got a nice um, continuity in both the wave function and the derivative, but notice what's happened to kappa. Kappa is so weak now, the particle is reasonably uh, expected to be out here at 3 and 4. You could me measure it out here at 4, and that means that the energy is so high, the thing's about to escape the well, and uh, the exponential stretches way out into the forbidden zone, into the classically forbidden zone. So anyway, that's what I wanted to show you guys. I hope that uh, that helps your intuition about how this stuff works. All right, let's move on to scattering states. Uh, scattering states, of course, are just states where the energy is positive. In this case, we're going to talk about waves that come in from the left. So the left-hand wave function might look like this. I'm using uh, an A amplitude of 1. The idea is that these other coefficients, b, c, d, and so on, uh, are all proportional to a. So we can think of b, if I set a equal to 1, I can think of b as being the amplitude per unit of incoming amplitude that gets reflected. And in the middle, I can think of c as the amplitude that passes through uh, to the middle, and d is the amplitude that gets reflected back into the middle. And finally, f is the amplitude that passes completely through the, uh, the well for a scattering state. Again, it's per unit incoming amplitude. So if I double the incoming amplitude, I'd get 2f. And if I tripled, I'd get 3f, and so on. But uh, the advantage of that, of course, is when it comes to calculating the reflection coefficient, the probability of reflection, 
Normally we would have to take b divided by a, magnitude squared, but a is 1. I've forced it to be 1, so I end up with a, a reflection probability that's just the magnitude of b squared. So dividing by 1, of course, doesn't change it. So how do we solve the problem? We apply the boundary conditions at x equals plus a and x is minus a, and we solve the four equations. Notice there's four equations and four unknowns. That's the idea. It's rather tedious. Griffith does it, so you can see how it's done. But I want to point out that in practical work, it's easier to use a computer. So I just want to point out that you can uh, use matrices in a computer to solve this problem. You've got the left, middle, uh, I'm sorry, the left and right hand boundary conditions. Um, I didn't really want to jump quite that far. Okay, you got the left and middle boundary condition and the middle and right boundary condition on the continuity of the wave function and the continuity of the first derivative. So that gives you four equations, but we have four coefficients, so we ought to be in good shape. So let's, let's apply these boundary conditions one at a time. The wave function has to be continuous at the left side of the well. That implies that this must be true. We just plug in negative a for x in the wave function on the left and the wave function in the middle. Then we do the same thing with the derivative on the left, and we get this condition. Then we apply continuity to the wave function on the right. We get this condition. Notice also, I forgot to say it, but there's no incoming wave on the right. There's only an outgoing wave on the right, and that's consistent with uh, particles being thrown at the well from the left with an amplitude of 1. And finally, we apply the derivative boundary condition on the right, and that gives us that condition. So we've got four conditions, and we've got four unknown coefficients, b, c, d, and f. Now the idea here is to move all the constant coefficient terms to the right, leave all the uh, constant terms with no coefficients to the left, and we get um, four equations that you can recast as a matrix multiply. So the idea is you think of the constants on the left as a vector, you think of the uh, functions that you multiply the coefficients by as a matrix, and then of course the vector of unknown coefficients, b, c, d, and f, shows up as a vector on the right. How do you solve that problem? Well, linear algebra dictates what you do is you take the inverse of the matrix, and you multiply both sides with its inverse, and out should come the unknown coefficients. Of course, you know everything. If you know the width of the well, and you know the depth of the well, that means you know a, you know kappa, you know k, and uh, of course, I used k here for the free waves, um, and you can calculate the result. Here's the little Python program that does exactly that. Um, I loop through a series of energy values. I calculate the k for the incoming wave. I calculate kappa for the wave inside the, the, uh, the well. Now, it turns out because uh, v is uh, complex, um, Kappa can turn out to be either a, uh, a real or an imaginary number. So if, uh, if the energy is greater than the potential, uh, then you end up with a, uh, a real kappa. I'm sorry, a, an imaginary kappa, which gives you a traveling wave. And if, and if the energy is uh, lower than V, then you get a, a decaying exponential inside the well. If V is negative, that means you always get a... Uh, for any incoming wave would have a positive kinetic energy, you'd end up with uh, a traveling wave inside. Anyway, the point is uh, you create this M array, and notice that you, because everything is complex, you can spell it just the way uh, it's written mathematically, and, uh, and then you define the constant vector, the B array, and then you just use the uh, linear algebra operators, take the inverse, multiply by B, and then pluck out the coefficient you're interested in. In this case, I was, I was plucking out the, uh, the transmission coefficient and calculate its magnitude squared, and then make a list of the reflection coefficient as a function of energy, and out comes a graph. It looks just like the graph from Griffiths. It's the transmission coefficient, the transmission probability, as a function of energy. Notice that if the energy is too low, then uh, you don't get anything through, but if you have an energy that's high enough, 
uh, you get uh, a probability of transmission goes up. There are certain energies that have just the right characteristic where the transmission probability goes to 1. Those are so-called resonant energies. And uh, if I kept graphing to higher and higher energy, you'd reach a point where everything gets through no matter what its energy. And uh, that kind of makes sense intuitively. All right, very good. So that's the idea. Um, we will use this idea of calculating transmission coefficients using matrices in Computing Project 7. Uh, I already told you a little bit compu about Computing Project 7 in the uh, when we discussed scattering states of the Dirac delta function potential, but we'll run into that again soon enough. I hope that helps, and we'll talk to you soon. Hi guys, welcome back. It's time for lessons 21 and 22. Um, this is the scanning tunneling microscope and other applications of tunneling and barrier penetration and so on. But actually, before we get into the barrier penetration business, I want to point out something about the double delta function potential we studied during the uh, second GR. So you've got a double delta function potential. You guys remember what the solutions looked like. One was a hyperbolic cosine internally and hyperbolic sine. That's the symmetric and anti-symmetric version. And uh, on the right and the left, of course, are the decreasing and increasing uh, exponentials. And uh, you no doubt remember the transcendental equation for each of those. The symmetric case had the hyperbolic tangent and the anti-symmetric case had the hyperbolic cotangent. I wanted to describe for you guys a strategy for actually solving these transcendental equations and getting values for the energy. So in order to do that, sort of the same way we did with the infinite, or excuse me, the finite square well, I want to introduce a parameter z and a parameter z0, which are just unitless numbers, which you can see uh, are easily uh, discovered in these equations if you multiply both sides by uh, <coughs> excuse me, a over 2, you'll see that the hyperbolic tangent and cotangent equations reduce to these. Um, and if you graph those equations, let's see, if you graph 1 over 1 plus the hyperbolic tangent, you get the green line, and 1 over 1 plus the hyperbolic cotangent, you get the uh, red line. And then, of course, if you go back and look at those equations, you'll realize that those each have to be equal to z over z0. So again, we get a straight line, z over z0, similar to what we had last time. You compute z0, it's easy to draw that line, and you can see the solutions, um, especially in the limit that z0 becomes large, you can see the solutions are going to be right around z equals 1 half. But um, the interesting thing is that um, the red line gives you a higher energy solution than the green line. And the reason for that is, uh, remember that the energies are negative, and so a larger value of z corresponds to a more negative energy, and that corresponds to a lower energy. Um, remember what the energy turned out to be. If you go back to the Schrodinger equation, you can see that the energy goes something like minus kappa squared. If you solve for the energy, it's minus h bar kappa quantity squared over 2m. And so the bigger kappa is, the more negative the energy. And of course, if you look back, <coughs> excuse me, if you look back, you can see that uh, the way kappa is defined, that means that um, the bigger z is, the more negative the energy. Anyway, uh, the other interesting thing you could see here is that the uh, symmetric solution always has an energy that's lower than a half, or more negative than a half, and uh, and the anti-symmetric had a higher energy. If you look at the variation of the energy with separation, you can see that as the two, as A gets larger, the slope of that line gets smaller and smaller, and both of the solutions approach a half, but it turns out um, the infinite separation corresponds to a reference point. The anti-symmetric solution, the energy is always greater than the infinite separation solution, and the symmetric case is always lower than the infinite separation solution. So we call the symmetric wave function a bonding wave function, and the anti-symmetric function a anti-bonding 
wave function and anti-bonding wave function. So um, one of them would produce a bond and the other one would not produce a bond. In other words, if you're in the upper energy state, that would tend to produce repulsion between the two delta functions. If you're in the symmetric state, that would tend to produce attraction. So the variation with separation, if you were, I can't, it's not that easy to create a, uh, a graph of that because I'd have to write some kind of program that would solve the transcendental equations for different values of separation and then graph the energy. But that would make a nice final project. You can imagine in a real world scenario, there might also be another force between the two delta functions that would be repulsive as they got closer together. And uh, so in the bonding case, there would be a, an, uh, what would you call it, competition between the bonding nature of the symmetric wave function, which would reduce the energy as they got closer, and whatever repulsive potential was involved that would increase the energy as they got closer, and the, the uh, competition between those two would produce some kind of equilibrium separation. And that's exactly the same kind of physics that goes on with uh, a diatomic molecule. And we'll delve into that much more deeply next semester. But uh, you could do it right now with delta function potential, and uh, I think it would make a nice little project. So if you're looking for something to do for your final project, that's, uh, that's one you might consider. All right. <clears throat> if I have a hunk of metal next to a vacuum, um, we talked in class about the fact that that would produce a potential. Inside the metal, there's like a finite potential well. Outside the metal, there's a... <coughs> <coughs> excuse me, a higher potential. And so you end up with a situation where electrons are stuck in the metal. There's a work function they have to overcome to escape from the metal. But if I bring another hunk of metal nearby, there's going to be a region in between the two uh, metal pieces where uh, the potential is high, but, um, but not infinite. And so it's possible for electrons to tunnel from one side to the other. Now, in the case of uh, just regular old metal, it, it turns out that the uh, there's no advantage to the electron to tunnel over there because the states are all occupied on the other side. Uh, and so not much tunneling happens if you just bring two pieces of metal close to one another. However, if you apply a potential difference, that tends to bend the potential band uh, down on the right, say, for example. And what that produces is an empty place on the right for the electrons to go, and also um, it makes a variable potential barrier that the electrons have to penetrate. And the degree of penetration um, depends on the distance over which the barrier exists and the, and the difference in potential. But you can see that uh, you could turn this into a, a elementary quantum mechanics problem where you have to compute the penetration probability based on the shape of that potential. So how do we attack a problem like that? As we talked about in class, um, you can break the variable potential into a series of finite square barriers, and that'll generate a series of equations that you can use to solve by satisfying the slope and continuity boundary conditions at each boundary of each barrier. But it's a, it's a very large linear algebra problem. Uh, a simpler approach is just to neglect the uh, growing part of the exponential and just look at the decaying part and we'll formalize this uh, much more clearly when we study the WKB approximation in chapter 8 the uh, next semester but for now just uh, you can just take the strategy and run with it uh, you can compute the probability the I should say you compute the amplitude to get through by calculating a position dependent value for Kappa and then integrate that across the region in which the potential energy is greater than the total energy. And you can come up with an amplitude to penetrate the barrier. And of course, then to get the probability, all you have to do is square it. So that's the idea. We can use that to calculate penetration probabilities for scanning tunneling microscopes, for nuclear reactions, and uh, lots of other interesting situations. Next time, I'll get you guys at the board doing uh, just such a calculation so you can see kind of how it turns out. Anyway, that's all I have for you this time, and we'll talk again next time. Hi, guys. Welcome back. It's Lesson 23, Everything You Ought or Ever Wanted to Know About Linear Algebra in One 
lesson. First of all, I want to start out with notation. Now, you guys at this point are a little bit more familiar than the last year's troops were with the notation, but let's talk about it. Uh, we're going to, excuse me, we're going to have the notion of a column vector, which is also going to be thought of as a ket. So a ket, what we've been using as a ket, I want you to think of that as a vector of numbers. It's just a list of numbers, but it's a vertical list of numbers. And a bra is actually the adjoint of the ket, and it's a horizontal list of numbers, at least that's the convention. And uh, the one difference between the bra and the ket is that in the bra version, everything is conjugated. It's complex conjugate of its value. The corresponding component of a bra is the complex conjugate of the component corresponding component of the same ket. Okay, and uh, then there's the idea of an inner product. Of course, an inner product is what you get when you dot a bra with a ket. <laughs> and to calculate, sorry for my cough, I've got this terrible cold. I'm going to, I hope it doesn't uh, cause you guys too much grief. I may have to re-record this after I recover. But anyway, um, the inner product is the bra times the ket. And the way you compute that is to multiply g star f for each element in the h component and then add them all together. So that's the inner product. I want to point out something that when you compute the inner product of g and f as a uh, inner product, as a dot product, it's the complex conjugate of what you get if you compute the same inner product in the opposite order, f on g. Um, to be a vector in a vector Sorry, to be a vector in a vector space, vectors have to obey normal rules of algebra. You need to be able to add them, multiply by complex conjugates, complex scalars, and then add them after you multiply by complex scalars. So it's the standard rules to be a vector space. Uh, you should check in Griffiths and see what the details of those rules are, but they're basically commonsensical rules of algebra that we already know. Okay, let's talk about basis vectors. So a, ba a set of basis vectors is sort of the analogy of uh, the i hat, j hat, and k hat vectors from regular old vectors, spatial vectors. And so in linear algebra, we use basis vectors, which uh, are sometimes called the e sub i's, e sub 1, e sub 2, e sub 3, e sub 4. And then you can write any ket as a superposition of complex numbers, the components, times the corresponding basis vectors. So one particularly nice orthonormal basis is the basis that looks like this, so 1, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, and 0, 0, 0, 1. Uh, you can see quite trivially that if you compute the ket f at the top of the screen, you can think of that as f1 times e1, f2 times e2, f3 times e3, f4 times e4, and that obviously gives you back the column vector f1, f2, f3, f4, just like we said before. So that's one uh, easy example. Of course, you can have other basis vectors that aren't uh, quite so simple, but they still can be a legitimate basis. How do you find the components of any vector? Well, you take the inner product of that vector with the basis vector who, whose component you want. So, for example, if you have a, a ket f, that's the superposition of four basis vectors, and you want to know what's the two component, then you could say, let's hit f with e2, and what are you going to get? Well, e2 on e1 is 0, e2 on e2 is 1, e2 on e3 is 0, and e2 on e4 is 0. And what's going to survive? Well, just the number f2. But that is exactly what we mean by the two component of the ket f. Notice that this is exactly like Fourier series. This is precisely the same calculation you do to get the coefficients or the components of a Fourier series. So um, there you go. You can think of vectors as pointers in an n-dimensional space. So uh, just like spatial vectors with i hat, j hat, and k hat are pointers in a three-dimensional space, you can think of these arbitrary kets as pointers of a kind in an n-dimensional space where n is the dimensionality of the ket. So how many components does it have? So for example, you could imagine a nine ket, a nine vector, which has nine components. And uh, we could imagine thinking about that 9 vector 
in terms of uh, a graph that gives you the value of each component. Notice that the uh, F1 component is 0.2, the F2 component is 0.3, and so on, but that forms a kind of a graph. What if we had a 27 component vector or a 270 component vector? Uh, you can see that as the number of components goes up, the spacing between the bars gets closer and closer, and then you can see how we could take this concept into an infinitely uh, large dimension and you get an infinite component vector, which is also known as a function. Okay, so a function, one way to think about a function, is as a, a vector, just like these other vectors, but with an infinite number of components, because the variable x, is, which labels the component, is, has a continuous set of values. Okay, so moving ahead. How does the inner product work with a very large dimensional vector? So with a, uh, with a 10 vector, you'd have an f vector that looks like this and a g vector that looks like this. What do we get when we take the inner product? Well, one way to look at that is as a bar graph. The f vector is the blue and the g vector is the green. And g on f is what you get when you multiply the corresponding values of the two vectors and add the result. So it's a sum over the components, and it ends up looking something like this. It's a summation over all i of g sub i star f sub i. Um, what happens, and you can actually calculate that, boom, 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 you get a number. What happens if you take the limit as the number of components becomes very large and f and g become functions? What is the natural extension of this idea? Well, here's a 27 element version of the same idea. Um, notice that it's starting to look like the product of two functions. And what is the summing like? Well, the summing is like an integral. So the inner product for uh, vectors in a functional vector space, a vector space of functions, uh, the natural analogy, an analog of the inner product from the discrete vector space is the integral of g star f which is exactly what we've been using. So that's how you might think about the, uh, the meaning of the inner product for functions as a, elements of a vector space. Now one other thing I want to point out, notice the dimensions of f and g in the uh, discrete vector space are unitless, but in the uh, function vector space, the functions are not unitless because we're integrating over space. And so that means the functions have to have units of 1 divided by the square root of length. So that's also true of our quantum mechanical wave functions. And the reason is so the inner product can be a unitless number, an amplitude. Okay, what's a linear transformation? A linear transformation is sometimes called a linear operator. But uh, a transformation does things to vectors. So if you apply a transformation to a vector, what do you get? You get a new vector. If you O hat acting on the ket psi gives me a new ket phi. That's the idea. So <coughs> linear transformations are uh, special in that they act on a superposition of two kets, the result is the same as if you acted on the individual kets and then added them together. So in other words, if you have an operator O acting on a superposition, A psi plus B phi, that's the same as A times the operator acting on psi plus B times the operator acting on phi. So that's what we mean by a linear operator. Um, Sometimes it's useful to imagine projecting out part of a system. So I want to talk about something called a projection operator. So you might say, for example, what is the, uh, what part of a four vector lives in the E1, E2 plane? So you have a, f a four element ket F, and we want to know what, compo what does that look like if we project it onto the E1, E2 plane? Well, clearly that's just going to be the one and two components are there, and the three and four components are missing. So that's the idea. Can we build an operator that does that? Is it possible to cook up an operator that does that? The answer is, yeah, let's, uh, let's look at an operator like this one. E1 as a ket times E1 as a bra. That turns out to be an operator. It's a special kind of operator called a dyad. 
But if you apply that operator to a ket f, what do you get? Well, e1 acting on f, we already know, um, projects out the f1 component. It's a scalar equal to f1, but the e1 basis vector is just uh, the column with a 1 in the first slot and zeros in the other slot. So when you multiply that all out, you get f1, 0, 0, 0. So you've projected out the 1 component of f. You can do... Uh, you can do the same thing with E2. Let's just, so, the, so the E1 projection operator projects out the 1 component. What does, uh, what does that guy do? Well, it, compute, it projects out just the 2 component. And what do you get if you have this? E1, E1, plus E2, E2. Well, the first one projects out the 1 component. The second one projects out the 2 component. But then they're added together. So you get F1, F2. That's our desired projection operator. Hey, what about this guy? That's right. It projects out each of the four components and add them, adds them back together. So if you apply this guy to any arbitrary ket, what do you get back? The same ket you had before. So this is also called the identity. This turns out to be one of the most profound theorems of linear algebra, that if you add projection operators together that project out all the different dimensions of your space, and add them up, you get the identity. So anywhere in your problem where you, uh, you don't know what to do, one uh, trick is to insert the identity and magical things will happen. So um, let's try to figure out what linear operators do by determining what happens when you act on an arbitrary basis vector with a linear operator. It turns out if you know what a linear operator does on all the basis vectors, then you can figure out what the linear operator does to any vector at all. Because, of course, any vector is a superposition of uh, basis vectors, and so you, you're done. So that's the idea. Um, say we have an operator O, which produces a set of kets O sub i when it acts on the basis vector. So like this. O, acting on the E sub i basis vector, produces a special new vector called O sub i. Okay, that's the idea. If we know what the O sub i are, we can figure out what the effect of O is on any basis vector, or on any vector at all, <coughs> because um, you can see that O acting on an arbitrary vector, it can always be written as a superposition of basis vectors, is the same as the superposition of O acting on the individual basis vectors. And of course that's the same as the components of the original vector acting on the O sub i, multiplying by the O sub i. And uh, how do we figure out what these O sub i are? Well, we can get the jth component of one of these O sub i's by taking the inner product of O sub i with E sub j. So here's the idea, E sub j acting on O sub i. But remember what the O sub i are. The O sub i are the O operator acting on the ith basis vector. So we can define O sub j i as the inner product of the jth basis vector with the result of O operating on the ith basis vector. That's kind of a mouthful. Okay, so uh, let's get the components of the resulting object. So if O acts on F, that produces a ket G E sub i acting on G is the same as E sub i acting on O acting on F. But how do we figure out what that is? Well, remember I said a lot of times if you don't know what to do next, just stick the identity in. Let's try it. We'll put in the identity between O and F, but then we'll rewrite the identity as the superposition of the projection operators of the entire basis, like that. Okay, I just replaced the identity with the sum over j of e sub j ket times e sub j bra. But the order of summation doesn't matter. I can, I can take the inner product of the sum or the sum of the inner products. I'll get the same result. Um, so we move that outside, and we see we have the following thing. The ith component of uh, g is the superposition of O i j times the jth component of f. In other words, I can rewrite this 
as the product of the of the elements O sub i j acting on F sub j, summed over all j. <coughs> let's uh, let's talk about the meaning of that. Actually, that is the definition of matrix multiplication. If you write out the components O i j as a matrix and you imagine multiplying that matrix by the vector f, you'll notice that the vector g is nothing other than the um, matrix O operating on the vector f. So uh, this is, in fact, what matrix multiplication is. And it turns out it's a simple consequence of putting the identity in to the definition of O. So there you go. Very exciting. Um, Let's talk about changing a basis. Let's say we have some, some other basis. We have two sets of basis vectors, the e's and the e primes. And we want to know what the components of f are in the e prime basis, assuming we know what the components of f are in the e basis. Again, the plan is to use the identity. We just write down that f is the identity operator acting on f. But what is the identity operator? Let's. Uh, Let's write it out in terms of the e sub i's. In other words, the, if we want to know the uh, j prime component of f, we take the j prime component of i acting on f. But i, remember, is the sum over the e sub i basis. And so we can uh, write that f, the prime, the j prime component, the prime component of f sub j, is the sum of these inner products between the basis vectors in the prime the prime set and the unprimed basis vectors uh, multiplied by the vector f. So let's see what that turns out to be. If we define ej prime e sub i as the matrix elements of a transformation called t, uh, we can write the change of basis as just a kind of transformation. It transforms vectors in the unprimed basis to vectors in the prime basis. So if we want to figure out how the basis vectors themselves transform, we can play the same trick. And we can see that what happens is um, the transformation that transforms the basis vectors is the transpose conjugate of t. And we're going to learn later that uh, when you take the transpose conjugate of, an, of a matrix, what you get is called the adjoint. It's the adjoint of the matrix. OK, let's just go over some terminology real quick. Uh, transformations that take one orthonormal basis into another are called unitary. Under such transformations, inner products are preserved. So you can think of a unitary transformation as kind of like a rotation. It keeps the vectors lengths the same, it keeps the angles between all vectors the same, but it just rotates them in some way. Okay. The inverse of a transformation has the property that if you apply a transformation and it's inverse, you get the identity, or nothing happens. Um, the transpose of a transformation is what you get when you interchange the rows and columns of the matrix. The conjugate is what you get when you take the complex conjugate of every element of a matrix. And uh, the adjoint is what you get when you take the transpose and the conjugate. So we're going to find out later there's a different definition of adjoint, which is equivalent when talking about matrices, but it's a little more general because it applies to all linear transformations, whether you represent them as a matrix or not. OK, a unitary transformation has the property that its inverse is the same as its adjoint. So in a unitary transformation, taking the adjoint and taking the inverse produces the same result. And finally, a Hermitian uh, transformation, or sometimes it's called a self-adjoint transformation, has the property that its adjoint is the same as itself. OK, and then uh, as far as notation goes, we have a matrix A. We can talk about its transpose. That's A with a tilde on top of it. We can talk about its conjugate, which is what we get when we take a star. We complex conjugate every element of the vector. And its adjoint, uh, we use a kind of a dagger symbol that to represent the adjoint. Finally, the inverse is uh, we take the power of minus 1. That doesn't mean we take the reciprocal of every element of the matrix. It means that we calculate the inverse of the matrix, which when matrix multiplied by the original matrix gives you the identity. OK, so for board work today, we're going to be doing a uh, rotation. Um, we're going to find, we're going to treat the basis vectors of the original x and y axis and the basis vectors of the primed x and y axes as if they were two 
different bases, and they are, but uh, we'll be using the notation and using the concepts from this lesson to calculate the transformation to go to convert a vector from one basis to the other basis, okay? And you'll probably recognize it when we're done, but we'll use the techniques described in this lesson to do that. And next time we'll move on and talk about eigenvalues. That's it for today. Hello, testing one, two, three. Here we are for lesson 24. Now this is the first lesson on formalism. So I want to take a few minutes to review where we've been. First thing to notice is that we've studied the time-independent Schrodinger equation in the context of four concrete problems. So the infinite square well, the simple harmonic oscillator, the finite square well and, and barrier, and also the context of free particles. And this, in, in a sense, this gives us a pretty good flavor of the different kinds of problems you encounter in quantum mechanics. Um, and we've studied the time evolution of all four of these systems in detail. So you guys know that the plan is you take whatever your initial state is and you decompose it into stationary states or eigenstates of the Hamiltonian operator. And then each component evolves in time according to minus, uh, e to the minus i omega t, where omega is the omega for that particular stationary state, since the energy of each state is generally different. Then each of them gets their own omega. And then you add them back up together again to see what the state will be at some later time. We're going to find that this is a general property of all quantum systems, but that uh, that's the property we've seen so far in the ones we've studied. Next, we've, uh, we've computed expectation values and uncertainties for really only three main observables, the position, the momentum, and the energy. And finally, we've computed probabilities of various types of measurements uh, involving those observables. So the probability of the particle being <coughs> between here and here, or the probability of the momentum being in a certain range, or the probability of the energy having a certain value. But it's always surrounded, basically, those, those three observables. Uh, next, we want to talk about where are we going to go. So now that we have a, a feel for how this stuff works, we're going to learn the fundamental postulates. So this lesson is primarily about the fundamental postulates and uh, the beginning of working with that formalism. We're going to expand the observables we can handle. We're going to talk about angular momentum. We're going to talk about... Uh, Let's see, spin and so on. That that all comes in chapter four, but uh, but we're going to get ready for the the expansion of the number of observables by talking about how the postulates deal with observables and how they show up in the formal theory of quantum mechanics. And finally, we're going to be laying the groundwork for next semester. So the idea from out here on is to basically lay the foundation so that we can study much more interesting systems like atoms and nuclei, solids, gases, and so on next semester. So that's the idea. Now, here are the postulates. These are the fundamental ideas of quantum mechanics. Everything else is deduced from these, but we don't prove these guys. These are our assumptions. So we're going to assume that these are correct. And you'll see how that assumption works as these assumptions work as we move on. The first assumption is that anything we can observe in nature is represented by a Hermitian operator. An operator is like the momentum operator or the energy operator and so on. These are Hermitian operators. We call them Hermitian. Hermitian really is the correct pronunciation, I guess, um, because they have real eigenvalues. So the, the thing that makes Hermitian operators important is that their eigenvalues are definitely real. We can't measure, we can't observe a value in nature that's, that's imaginary. So these have to have real eigenvalues. Okay, quantum states are represented by vectors in a vector space. So uh, that's a linear algebra concept. Vector spaces are very general things. And uh, as we go, we'll go along, we'll explore various kinds of vector spaces. The vector space we've been using up until now is a vector space called a Hilbert space. That's a space of square integrable functions, functions you can square and integrate <coughs> and get a finite result. So normalizable wave functions are members of a Hilbert space. Okay. When an observable is measured, the result of that measurement is always an eigenvalue of the Hermitian operator that represents that observable. So Hermitian operators have eigenvalues. Uh, 
The states that correspond with those eigenvalues are called eigenstates or eigenfunctions or eigenvectors. And uh, the result of the measurement is always the eigenvalue that corresponds to uh, that eigenvector that you end up measuring. So anyway, okay, it is possible to express any quantum state as a superposition of eigenstates of an observable. So what that means is whatever state the system is in, you can always decompose it into a superposition of eigenstates. So we've done that already in the infinite square well. We could start the wave function any old way we like, and we could write it as a superposition of energy eigenstates. Okay. The probability of measuring a particular eigenvalue is the magnitude of the amplitude for that eigenstate squared. We already saw this in the case of the infinite square well or any of the other cases we've dealt with, that uh, the probability of measuring a certain energy is the uh, Fourier coefficient or the amplitude of that component of the wave function in its uh, energy decomposition. If we break it down into energy eigenstates, a superposition of energy eigenstates, each energy eigenstate gets multiplied by a coefficient that tells us the amplitude of that state in the superposition, and the squared magnitude of that amplitude is the probability of measuring the corresponding eigenvalue. Finally, once an observable is measured, the quantum state collapses to the eigenstate that corresponds to the eigenvalue that was measured. This is a uh, this is an apostolate. We just assume that this happens. It turns out, as best as we can tell, it more or less does actually happen. But the detailed mechanism that permits this to happen, that makes this happen, is at this point not clear. We can, we've talked about that a little bit in class, but I'm not going to elaborate on that at the moment. Okay, so what's our approach going to be? We're going to become familiar with operators and how they work. We're going to get practice with the new notation. We're going to experiment with uh, some simple basis sets. And we're going to work some simple quantum problems with finite spaces to see how they compare to the systems we studied in Chapter 2 of Griffiths. OK, so what's our first example? Our first example is the idea of a change of basis. Let's say we have two sets of basis vectors, the unprimed and the primed. And we're interested in finding the components of A in the prime basis, assuming we know the components of A in the unprime basis. So we know the A sub i's. We don't know the A prime sub j's. So we want to know what are the coefficients, what are the components of a ket in the prime basis, given that we know the basis vectors of both basis, bases, and we know the components of the ket in one of the two bases. So what's the idea? The idea is to use the identity. We've talked about this in numerous other examples, but it uh, turns out if you don't know what to do in one of these kind of problems, uh, the best plan is to stick the identity in there and see what happens. So we stick the identity in. Remember, the identity is the sum of all the projection operators that span the basis. And so we add up the projection operators that span all the primed basis vectors. And notice that you can rearrange the sum. You can move the j sum to the outside, move the j ket, the primed e prime sub j ket, to the far right. And what's left in the middle is a sum that uh, sums over all i, but uh, it's just a sum of numbers. It's the, it's the component of uh, e sub i in the e sub j prime direction times the ith component of the uh, vector in the unprime basis, and that's just a number. But if you look above, you'll notice that the number that corresponds to the component that of in the prime basis of the jth ket uh, is just such a number. So you can make an association. You say, hey, look, aj prime is really nothing other than this sum. And so that tells us the answer. The answer is the, com the component of the ket in the prime basis is this complicated looking sum over the inner product of the e prime sub j times e sub i, all multiplied by the ith component in the original basis. Okay, here's the thing. Do not memorize this kind of a result. It's hard to memorize. It's hard to keep track of what goes where and so on. Uh, you've heard the phrase, use the force, Luke. Well, my response to that phrase is that in quantum mechanics, you use the identity. Anytime you run into a problem and you're not sure what to do, I want you to hear Obi-Wan Kenobi whispering in your ear, Luke, use the identity. 
and all will be well. Okay, so in order to emphasize that, I'm going to have you guys do some board work. I want you to compute the uh, values of the components of a ket in the primed basis here that I've given uh, using the identity operator, assuming that you know the ket in the unprimed basis. So here's the idea. Let's Okay, so let's assume we know this ket and we want to know how to express the ket in the prime basis. So the idea would be to figure out what a, a sub x prime is and a sub y prime is uh, that, would, that would be the components of the ket in the prime basis. So stop the video, see if you can work it out. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and work it out two different ways. Uh, one way is to compute the x prime component of the a ket, but in order to do that I'm going to insert the identity and I'm going to express the identity in terms of the unprimed basis vectors. So we'll do that. And notice that I get these things that look like x prime x, x prime y, multiplied by uh, x on a. Of course, x on a is just a sub x, and y on a is just a sub y. So uh, we need to sort out, though, what these x prime x and x prime y inner products are. And I can do the same thing for y prime on a. I insert the identity, again, expressed in terms of, of the unprime basis. And I'll get an explicit expression for the y prime component of a. Now remember how this thing looks. This is our coordinate system that shows that the angle between x and x prime is phi. But the inner product of x and x prime is the magnitude of x times the magnitude of x prime times the cosine of the angle between the two. But notice these are unit vectors, these are normalized basis vectors, so the magnitude of x and x prime is nothing other than 1. So that means that the inner product of x prime and x is just the cosine of phi. Similarly, the inner product of x prime and y is the cosine of 90 minus phi, since that's the angle between x prime and y. But of course the cosine of 90 minus phi is the sine of phi. So you know x prime on x is cosine phi, x prime on y is sine of phi. Similarly, y prime and y are both uh, at an angle of phi. And the last one, the trickiest one, is y prime on x. But uh, you'll notice that that angle turns out to be 90 plus phi. The cosine of 90 plus phi is minus the sine of phi. So if we make those replacements, we see that uh, a sub x prime, the x prime component of A, is cosine of phi A sub x plus sine of phi A sub y. And you see that the uh, prime component, the y component of A prime, or the primed component of A, the y prime component of A, is a minus sine phi ax plus cosine phi ay. Now if you look at those, you'll notice that in fact you can write this in matrix form, where the primed coordinates are a vertical vector, the unprimed components are a vertical vector, and the sine and the cosine and so on form a transformation that transforms the x components into the, or the unprimed components into the primed components. This is called a transformation operator, a change of basis operator. It's a special kind of operator that's called unitary. Uh, it preserves angles between vectors, but basically just is a change of basis. Okay. Uh, there's another way to solve the problem. The other way is to, again, start with the same definition of the original ket, but simply apply the identity expressed in the prime basis this time. So we just multiply by the primed identity operator, and I distribute that out among all the pieces. I'll end up with four terms, but notice that uh, the thing that multiplies x prime is just a number, and the number is x prime on x times a sub x plus x prime on y times a sub y, and the number that multiplies the y prime vector is y prime on x a sub x plus y prime on y a sub y, but the number that multiplies the x prime vector is nothing other than a sub x prime, and the number that multiplies the y prime ket, that's nothing other than a y sub prime, and you can see right away that those match. So you get the same exact result that we had before. Cosine phi a sub x plus sine phi a sub y is ax prime. Minus sine phi a sub x plus cosine phi a sub y is a 
y prime. And that is the end of this lesson. I hope it was useful, and uh, we'll see you next time. Okay, so here we are back again with lesson 25, the second lesson on quantum mechanical formalism. First thing I want to discuss is the whole notion of the statistical interpretation of quantum mechanics. The idea here is that if you decompose a quantum state into eigenstates of some observable, and you measure that observable, the probability of measuring a particular value is the square of the amplitude that that eigenstate shows up in the superposition. So if you have, let's take an example. Let's say we have a wave uh, superposition, a, a quantum mechanical superposition of three eigenstates of some observable, and we want to know what's the probability of measuring the particle in the state three. So in, in this state, in this case, it's E3, the, one of the basis states. And you can look at that superposition and see right away that the amplitude of being in the state E3 is the square root of one third. In other words, the amplitude of being in the state E3, given that you start out in the state psi, is the square root of one. And the, uh, and the square of that number is just one third. So we end up with a probability of one third. Okay, how do we calculate expectation value? So let's say we know we're in a state psi, and we want to know the expectation value of the energy. Well, the formal way to do that is to calculate the quantity that you see on the screen there. But if you put in a representation of psi as a superposition of energy eigenstates, so that means that psi is equal to a sum of amplitude times basis ket, then the bra version of that, of course, is the sum of the amplitude complex conjugate times the corresponding basis bra, and you expand that double sum, as you see here, notice that the Hamiltonian acting on an eigenstate, or an eigenket, is just the energy of that state times the eigenket back again. So that converts the operator, the Hamiltonian operator, into a number, the eigenvalue. But that eigenvalue can then come outside, since it's just a number, and you can see that you're just going to get um, the Kronecker delta, delta nm, which is going to reduce the double sum to a single sum. And also the m's and the n's are all going to have to be the same. So cm star cn becomes cn magnitude squared. And you can see right away what you get is the probability of measuring the nth eigenvalue times the value of the nth eigenvalue. This is just a normal statistical expectation value. So that turns out rather nicely. Also in this chapter, there's a, there's a section on the uncertainty principle. It's a generalized version of the uncertainty principle. And the, the only thing I expect you guys to remember, or to even really appreciate, is the result of that derivation. <clears throat> the result says, that the uncertainty in an observable A times the uncertainty in an observable B is always greater than or equal to 1 over twice I times the commutator of A and B. Well, what that means is if, if the two observables commute with each other, that means it doesn't matter the order in which you perform measurements of those observables, then there's no limit to the uncertainty. In other words, the uncertainty can be as small as you like. On the other hand, if the two observables don't commute, so that they have a finite commutator, then there is going to be an uncertainty limit, a, a limit on the uncertainty in those two measurements, below which you cannot go. Quantum mechanics does not permit you to go. And uh, we can check it using the momentum operator and the position operator, which you realize have a finite commutator. The commutator of x and p is i h bar. If you put that commutator in to the expression, you get that the uncertainty in x times the uncertainty in p is always greater than or equal to h bar over 2, which is the uncertainty relation we've been using all along. So you get a sense of how that goes. And if you had any other observables, not necessarily momentum and position, but uh, we're going to find at some point, probably next semester, we'll talk about photons 
in cavities and you'll find that the photon number and the photon phase, the phase of the photon wave function, um, have an uncertainty relation, something like this. We're going to find out in the next chapter, chapter 4, that various components of angular momentum uh, have limitations on the uncertainty. So you can't know the x and y component of angular momentum with arbitrary precision at the same time. So there you go. <clears throat> now let's, uh, let's uh, get some more experience with our Dirac notation. Suppose you have an operator q hat with eigenvectors q1 and q2. So in other words, <clears throat> these are eigenvectors of the q operator. That means they correspond to precise values of q, but they're expressed in a in a different basis uh, that could be the energy basis. Maybe q is angular momentum or q is some other observable, and we express the eigenstates of q in a different basis. The question is, oh, and don't forget that these two eigenvectors have different eigenvalues. So if you find the system in state q1 and you measured its q observable, you would get a value of 2. And if you measured it in, in state q2 and you measured its q observable, you'd get a, uh, a value of 3. So that's, uh, that's another uh, factor about the operator q. In fact, it turns out if you know an operator's eigenvectors and all its eigenvalues, then you know the operator completely. You know everything there is to know about that operator, basically. So we can literally deduce the matrix elements of the operator and everything else about the operator if we know those things. So, and we'll see how that works as we go along, but uh, suppose the system is currently in the state psi, which happens to be the E1 basis vector. The question is, if that's true, what's the expectation value of Q? So what we do is imagine, uh, go back to the basis vectors, and then the question is, given that the system is in the state E1, what's the amplitude that we would find the system in the state q1. But notice that uh, there's a relationship between the amplitude of being in the state q1 given that you're in e1 and the amplitude of being in the state e1 given that you're in q1, and, and that is that they are complex conjugates of one another. But notice that these coefficients are all real, which means that in fact the amplitude to be in q1 given that you're in e1 and the amplitude to be in e1 given that you're in q1 are the same number because all these coefficients are real. So we can compute that amplitude uh, very easily by asking what is the amplitude to be in the state E1 given that you're in the state Q1. Obviously it's a half because that's the coefficient of E1 in the superposition that produces Q1. Similarly, oh and so the probability of being in that state would be one half. Similarly, the probability of being in the state E1 given that you're in the state Q2 is the square root of 3 over 2, which means it has a probability of 3 fourths. Okay, So the probability of being in state E1 given that you're in state Q1 is 1 fourth. The probability of being in state E1 given that you're in state Q2 would be 3 fourths. And the probability of being in one or the other would be 1. So you either uh, have to be in one or the other. So uh, how do you calculate the expectation value? You take the probability of finding the system in state Q1 times the va eigenvalue Q1 plus the probability of being in state Q2 times the eigenvalue Q2. That's the standard technique for calculating expectation values. And if you plug all that in, you'll see that the answer is 11 fourths. Um, but there's a more formal way to do this. You can also, as we did before, just compute the expectation value of Q hat directly by putting in um, the definitions of psi and it's convenient to stick in the identity. So we put in the identity operator but we expand it in the Q basis. Why do we use the Q basis? Because we're using the Q operator and in the Q basis the Q operator's operation is trivial. You just multiply each or, uh, eigenvector by the corresponding eigenvalue. Let's see how that works. So we, we uh, take the summation outside, and then you notice that what you have there is q hat acting on the ith eigenvector of q. In other words, the q sub i basis is the basis of eigenvectors of the, of the operator q. And of course, that's just q sub i times 
um, the eigenket q using the eigenvalue equation, but q sub i is just a number. So in fact, we can bring it out. We get psi on q sub i times q sub i on psi, but that's just the amplitude of being in the state q sub i given that you're in the state psi. Um, but that's just the coefficient, right? That's just the co that's just the amplitude of being in the state q sub i. So that's easy. And again, we have uh, the normal way to calculate expectation values, um, probability of being in a state times the value that you get if you're in that state. Okay, so how would things change if we change the current state to be a superposition of eigenstates? What would happen then? Well, it's the same idea. You just calculate the amplitude of being in state Q1 given you're in the state Psi, and um, it's a bunch of inner products, but knowing the definition of Q1 and Q2, we can calculate the value of those inner products, and we can square them, and then we can calculate the expectation value in the standard way. So it turns out it's not that bad. Um, if you just go through the thing step by step, calculate the inner products uh, using the definitions of the eigenvectors, and uh, you get an answer. Okay. Let's talk about a more concrete example. This concrete example is the ammonia molecule. So the ammonia molecule is a molecule that has three hydrogen atoms connected to a nitrogen atom. And uh, we know a fair amount about this guy. We're going to call the state that you see there to the left the up state. But there's a completely equivalent state that has exactly the same energy, has exactly the same basic geometry, except that it's upside down, like this. I'm going to call that the down state, or we'll use the ket notation D. So the up ket is the U ket, and the down ket is the D ket. Now what's the Hamiltonian going to be in this case? Well, if the ammonia molecule is in the up state, it has the same energy as if it's in the down state. Okay, so we call that we can calculate the Hamiltonian matrix element, the up-up matrix element, and the down-down matrix element. Those have to be the same because of the symmetry of the problem. But another matrix element that's interesting is what happens if uh, you take the down component of what you get when you apply the Hamiltonian to the up state, or if you take the up component of what you get when you apply the Hamiltonian in the down state. <clears throat> it turns out that uh, the fact that this is not zero means that if the thing is in the up state, there's a finite probability that it can tunnel through and go to the down state. And if it's in the down state, there's a finite probability it can tunnel through and get to the up state. And that shows out up as an off-diagonal element of the Hamiltonian. So we can think of the up state as being the one zero state, the down state as being the zero one state. And then using those matrix elements that we just worked out, we can write the Hamiltonian out as a matrix. Di diagonal elements are the energies when the thing is in uh, the up state and the energy when the thing is in the down state. And they're just the original energy of the molecule if it's not allowed to make transitions between those two states. And then the minus A it corresponds to an amplitude of the thing leaking through to the other way. So if it's in the down state, it can leak through and become up. And if it's in the up state, it can leak through and become down. Because of the way the Hamiltonian governs the time evolution of the system, this turns out to mean that the states up and down are not energy eigenstates because they're not stable. If you put the thing in the up state and you check a little while later, there's a chance you can find it in the down state. And if it's in the down state, and you look a little while later, there's a chance you'll find it in the up state. So that means that up and down are not eigenstates. They're not stationary states of the Hamiltonian. The question is, what are the stationary states of the Hamiltonian? In other words, what are the solutions to the Schrodinger equation that H acting on an energy eigenstate is equal to the energy times the energy eigenstate? What, what states are going to have that property? So the, the way you handle that is you invent an arbitrary state, some arbitrary superposition of up and down, and call that an eigenstate. We don't know what the eigenstate is yet, but we can 
imagine that there is an eigenstate and that its amplitudes are alpha and beta, respectively. Then you plug that in to the Schrodinger equation, essentially, to the, to the eigenvalue problem, which means the Hamiltonian acting on alpha and beta must be equal to some number times alpha beta. But we don't know what the number is yet. But notice what we can do. I can multiply the right-hand side with the identity, and I can put the eigenvalue into the diagonal elements of the identity, and I haven't changed the equation. But now I can subtract the identity from both sides, and I've got an interesting formula. It says that some matrix acting on my eigenvector is equal to the zero vector. Now, that's a very interesting formula because there, there of course, is a trivial solution to that problem. If alpha and beta are both zero, then no matter what lambda is, that solution will be satisfied. That's not a very interesting solution because it's not a valid quantum state. But there is the possibility that you could find a quantum state, a eigenstate, that would satisfy this equation in a non-trivial case when alpha and beta are not zero. But it turns out that only happens for very special values of lambda, eigenvalues. So we want to find those eigenvalues. If you look at that thing for a little while, you realize that if you try to apply Kramer's rule to solve for alpha or beta, you're going to end up taking the determinant of that thing, and you'll be dividing zero by that determinant. The only way you can get a finite result is if that determinant is also zero. The zero divided by zero can sometimes be non-zero, it can be finite, um, but it only happens for very special cases of lambda where the determinant of that matrix works out to be zero. So we require, to find the eigenvalues, we simply require that that determinant be zero. That re reduces to an algebraic equation for lambda, and that's an equation that has two solutions because it's quadratic. So it turns out there are two eigenvalues. There's a plus and a minus eigenvalue. <clears throat> and those are the two energies of the system. Notice that it's either E0 plus A or E0 minus A. There's a low energy version, lambda minus, that's E0 minus A, and a high energy version, lambda plus, that's E0 plus A. Now, what could be the corresponding eigenvector? We'll call that lambda plus. Um, if we plug lambda plus back in, lambda plus is E0 plus A, and we, so we replace lambda plus with E0 plus A and solve the equations, um, you'll notice that what we get is minus A times alpha minus A times beta equals zero. But the only way that can be true is if alpha is minus beta, okay? Usually we like to normalize the eigenstates. So if we put in um, a normalization constant out in front, we find that the plus eigenstate is 1 over root 2 up minus down. So the high energy eigenstate turns out to be a superposition of up and down. What happens if uh, lambda equals lambda sub n equals lambda minus? We put in the eigenvalue lambda minus. Lambda minus, of course, is E0 minus A. Um, we cancel out the E0s and we get A alpha minus A beta equals 0. That has a solution. It's alpha equals beta. And so we get the low energy eigenvector. Turns out to be a different superposition of up and down. It's 1 over the square root of 2 up plus down. Okay, so let's summarize our results. We found two eigenvectors plus with an eigenvalue E0 plus A, and there's an eigenvector minus with an eigenvalue um, E0 minus A. Plus and minus are superpositions of up and down. One goes like the difference between up and down. <clears throat> the other goes like the sum of up and down. The other thing to notice is if you add plus and minus together, you get something that looks like up, and if you subtract them, you get something that looks like down. So you can express up and down also as superpositions of plus and minus. So it's, it's kind of a neat system. Um, we'll have time to talk about it in class, but uh, it's a nice playground f with which you, we can uh, get some appreciation for how these postulates work. The next time, we're going to be studying how these states evolve in time, so you get some sense of how this thing goes. All right, we'll see you next time. Hi guys, welcome back. It's time for lesson 26, our third and final lesson on formalism. So before we begin, I want to make two points. One 
is that you can always construct the identity out of the projection operators that project out the eigenvectors of any Hermitian operator. So one of the things we're learning is that Hermitian operators have eigenvectors that can form a orthonormal basis and that you can use that basis to form the identity. And that's going to be an important concept as we move forward. The other is that you can form any operator directly out of its eigenvectors and its eigenvalues uh, in this way. So notice what this guy does is it projects out the Q1 eigenvector from any arbitrary vector and then multiplies by the Q1 eigenvalue. And then it adds to that what the projection onto the Q2 direction times the Q2 eigenvalue and so on. And if you take all your eigenvectors and pro create projection operators out of them, but multiply each projection by the corresponding eigenvalue, you will have constructed this operator. So if you know the eigenvectors and eigenvalues of an operator, you know everything you need to, you know everything there is to know basically about that operator. Okay. Um, Here's another thing. We talked about O dagger, or the adjoint of O. Um, in a matrix representation, the adjoint is the transpose conjugate. In a more generic way, O dagger means the following thing. If you apply O to a ket and take the inner product with another ket, in other words, if you evaluate the inner product A on the ket you get when you operate on B with O, it's the same thing as operating on A with O dagger and, uh, and then taking the inner product of that bra with the original ket B. So that is, that's the meaning of the <coughs> adjoint. And uh, I just wanted to make sure I got that in a slide somewhere official so you guys would have seen it for certain. Let's talk about matrix representations. We had a lot of trouble in class last time with the homework problem involving matrix representations of operators. And so I, I've cooked up a system that I think is so obvious and so simple that uh, it hopefully will make some of these ideas clear. So it's, it's very geometric. So it's a geometric system. Let's say we have a couple of kets, X and Y, which you could think of as I hat and J hat in a geometric sense. And then we have another couple of kets, x prime and y prime, which you could think of as an alternative uh, coordinate system. They're at angles of 45 degrees relative to x and y. Um, in the unprimed basis, if you wanted to represent x, the ket x, the unit vector in the x direction in the unprimed basis, what you could do is imagine a, a vector representation or a matrix representation of these vectors where the top number is the x component and the bottom number is the y component. And that means the x basis ket would be 1, 0, and the y basis ket would be 0, 1. In that same basis, you can express the x prime basis ket and the y prime basis ket. In other words, you can express the primed basis vectors in the unprimed basis. And you'll get something like this. The x prime ket will be 1 over the square root of 2 x minus y. And in a vector representation or a matrix representation, that would look like um, the, the vector there on the right. And y prime, similarly, would be x plus y over root 2, which would look like the matrix, the one column, the co column vector matrix thingy on the, on the right. And any arbitrary vector you could represent in the unprime basis. You know, given what x and y are, it would just be a vector where the top number is the x component and the bottom number is the y component. Now, let's imagine we invent an operator acting in this vector space. And what the operator does is the following. <clears throat> you give it any arbitrary vector. It'll operate on that vector. It will get the projection into the x prime direction and multiply that projection by 2. It'll take the projection in the y prime direction and multiply that projection by 1 half. So the, vec the operator I'm thinking of, the t hat operator, is going to look exactly like this. Now I'm going to go through a bunch of math and we'll talk about tra changing bases and stuff like that. <clears throat> In the end, we're going to actually construct the matrix representation of this operator, knowing what we know about x, y, x prime, and y prime. 
So let's think actually about x prime. Notice if this operator operates on the x prime basis vector, the second term is going to give you nothing because y prime on x prime is zero. And so you're going to just get two times the original x prime uh, basis vector. So that means x prime is actually a uh, eigenvector of this operator with an eigenvalue of two. Similarly, if you apply this operator to the ve vector y prime, um, it's going to multiply y prime by a half. And so that means y prime is an eigenvector of this operator with an eigenvalue of a half. So we can tell just by looking at it that this operator has two eigenvectors, x prime and y prime. It has two eigenvalues, two and a half. And that uh, this is manifestly obvious from the way the, the operator is constructed. Now, any vector, any arbitrary vector, can be expressed in the unprime basis in terms of the x and y basis vectors, or you could equivalently represent it in the primed basis with the x prime and y prime basis vectors. And so part of what we're going to do is to figure out how to move back and forth between these two sets of basis vectors and what that all means. So let's talk about change of basis. We already sort of did this on the board a couple of lessons ago, but uh, I just want to reinforce it right now. Let's say I have a vector a, and let's say I, uh, I know the vector's representation in the unprime basis, but uh, I can, if I want to represent it in the prime basis, all I really need to do is insert the identity, but express the identity as a superposition of projection operators in the primed basis. And you can see right away what I'm going to get is that uh, each vector is going to have an x prime component or a y prime component, which uh, you can compute by taking the inner product of the x prime and y prime basis vectors with the arbitrary vector. But let's figure out how we're going to express this relative to the components in the unprime basis. So in the primed basis, uh, x prime is 1, 0, and y prime is 0, 1. So in the prime basis, you could represent this um, vector as a column vector that has the uh, x prime component in the top and the y prime component in the bottom. So notice in the unprime basis you represent a vector as a as a column where the top component is the x component and the bottom component is the y component. In the prime basis it's the same idea but now the top component is the x prime component, the bottom component is the y prime component. And what we want to be able to do is to switch back and forth between these two representations of the same vector. What if we know we have a in the unprime basis, and we want to get it in the prime basis? We did this on the board the other time. You just insert the identity, express the identity in terms of the coordinate system you want to use, not the one you're in, but the one you want to use, and then you just multiply. And what happens is you multiply away, and you get cross terms, and so on. But notice that the x prime component is a superposition of two uh, numbers. Everything in the parentheses there is a number. x prime on x and ax, x prime on y and ay are all numbers. So what you end up with is a number. And then similarly with the y prime component, you get the y prime unit uh, basis vector times a number. So you can think of this new primed representation <coughs> as um, as a vector, a column vector with a x prime component and a y prime component. But I want you to notice that if you look at that carefully, you'll see that you could also write it as a matrix multiply. And so you can take out the ax and ay and make that a column vector. And you can see that what happens is you take the square matrix made up of inner products between basis vectors and you multiply it by a column vector in the unprimed representation, and what comes out is a column vector in the primed representation. So this is a change of basis. This is a matrix picture of a change of basis. It's nothing more than the identity, which, uh, which you saw above. It's just a way to write it out as a matrix. Now, um, you know that x prime, you could think of it in the unprimed basis it has x and y components of x on x prime and y on y prime. The bra x prime is just the transpose of that, okay, with the uh, inner products swapped. Now in this example, all our inner products are real. So there's no difference between x on x prime and x prime on x, 
but in quantum mechanics in general, inner products are complex. And so <coughs> <coughs> when we switch from uh, x on x prime and x prime on x, we get a complex conjugation. So it's important to keep track of the order. Um, similarly, the components of y prime in the unprimed basis are going to be x on y prime, y on y prime, and the uh, components of the bra y prime are just the complex conjugates of those. So that's how that works. But what I want you to notice is that the rows of the matrix which takes you from the unprimed to the primed coordinate system are nothing other than the bra components of x prime and y prime. So I could rewrite this as the a primed ket in the vector or matrix representation is just what you get by taking the bras of the other coordinate system, the primed coordinate system, and applying them to the ket in the unprimed coordinate system. So this uh, matrix that created with the bras of the basis vectors of the primed frame is sometimes called a a coordinate transformation matrix or a unitary transformation matrix. Let's talk about that. What this says is that A prime is some operator acting on A. We found that this operator is nothing other than the bras of the basis vectors of the in the primed frame. And S dagger, the adjoint, is going to be the transpose conjugate. Basically it's just the uh, kets of the basis vectors in the prime frame lined up in, in a row. Notice that it's obvious that s on s dagger, s times s dagger, is going to be the identity because uh, this the primed basis vectors are orthonormal, which means when they hit any of the others, you get zero, and when they hit each other, when they hit themselves, when the bra x prime hits the ket x prime, you get one. Um, also, if I calculate an inner product between two arbitrary vectors, I can stick uh, the identity in there, and we're going to find out in a moment that, in fact, not only is S on S dagger equal to the identity, but S dagger on S is also equal to the identity. Um, notice that S on B is B in the primed, um, <coughs> S on B is B in the primed uh, coordinate system, or the primed uh, basis, and uh, notice that if I move S dagger into the bra, I have to take its adjoint, so A S dagger is the same as the bra of S on A. So you can see that what I really have here is the inner product of A and B in the primed uh, basis. So uh, the long and short of all that conversation is basically just that when I go from the unprimed to the prime basis, A and B both change, their components both change. But when I compute an inner product with the resulting vectors represented in the primed basis, I get the same answer. So that means that this kind of transformation, this so-called unitary transformation, preserves inner products. And since it preserves all inner products, it means it preserves the inner products of any ket with itself, which means it preserves probability. It preserves, in quantum mechanics, its probability, its length. The length of these vectors is preserved, which means the corresponding amplitude, uh, Magnitudes are preserved, which means probabilities are preserved. And that's a good thing. So let's continue. Let's see if we can actually compute the uh, matrix elements or the matrix values of these operators. First, I want to remind you how x prime and y prime are defined in terms of x and y. And then you can see that uh, the bra x prime is just going to be 1 over the square root of 2 in a row, 1 minus 1, and the bra y prime is going to be um, 1 over the square root of 2 with a 1 and a 1, and that means that s is just going to be 1 minus 1, 1, 1, uh, just like it's calculated there. You just take the bra version of x prime and y prime and lay them out horizontally. Then s dagger is going to be the transpose of that, so we can actually compute matrices and the matrix elements of all these matrices. And you can see now, quite clearly, not only is S dagger times S equal to, or S times S dagger equal to the identity, but if you run it the other way and calculate S dagger times S, it's also the identity. So uh, you can run them either way. Also notice that uh, 
There's no difference, therefore, between S dagger and S inverse. They are equal to each other. So uh, the adjoint of S is its own inverse. Okay, so we're not, we're not quite done yet because we still have to figure out what T is. But let's talk about the matrix representation of generic operators, just any old operator, and we can see how to find these other, uh, these other guys. In the unprime basis, uh, X is 1, 0, and Y is 0, 1. So if I have some generic operator, not the T operator, just any old operator, and uh, I call its matrix elements A, B, C, and D, and I apply that operator to X, what am I going to get? Well, in a second, you can find out that you get AC as a vector. And if you apply it to Y, you get BD. So one thing to notice right away is that the columns of any generic operator are the result of applying that operator to the basis vectors in whatever representation you're using for a basis. So what that means is O on X, you could really think of it as uh, <clears throat> the X component of O on X and the Y component of O on X in a, in a vector. But we just figured out that A is the upper element and C is the bottom element, so that identifies A as X is 0, X, and C as Y is 0, X. Furthermore, if you apply O to Y, you get the same basic idea. X0, Y is the X component of what you get when you apply O to Y. But looking at the result, that's just B. And Y, O, Y is the Y component. That's got to be D. So what that says is that any generic operator you choose, you can actually calculate its matrix elements by taking the expectation, I guess, in quantum mechanical terms, of the operator between the basis vectors that correspond to those matrix elements. Okay, so now we know how to evaluate the matrix elements of an arbitrary generic matrix. Let's try to find some matrix elements of some um, operators we know about. For example, the X prime projection operator. What's that going to be? Well, remember, uh, using this idea, X prime, X prime, as a uh, projection, I just plug in the uh, that is a generic operator, and I see what I need to do to calculate the components of that vector. But remember, um, same way with y prime. But remember what x prime and y prime are in terms of x and y. That's all you need to evaluate all these inner products. So we'll just keep track of all that, and let's evaluate uh, what we get. So the, the upper left-hand corner of x prime, x prime projector is x on x prime. Well, that's 1 over the square root of 2. And what about x prime on x? Well, that's also 1 over the square root of 2. So the product of those two is a half. And you just march ahead that way. Um, if you do all those, you'll see that what you get is a half times a matrix full of 1s and minus 1s. That's the projection operator that projects out the x prime direction. You do the same thing with the projection operator that projects out the y prime direction, and you get this result. And just to check to make sure we haven't messed anything up, let's add the x prime projector to the y prime projector and make sure we get the identity. And sure enough, you see the minus ones and the plus ones cancel on the off diagonals. The ones add up and the two takes care of the, uh, the sum to make it one in the on diagonal. And so indeed, you do get the identity. Keeping track of those, let's go back to our T operator and construct it using these projection operators. So if we do that, we take 2 times the x, proje x prime projection operator and a half times the y prime projection operator. And what do we get? We get a matrix. So this is the matrix that represents T in the unprimed basis. Of course, in the primed basis, we already know it because it's just a diagonal with a 2 in the upper left-hand corner and a 1 half in the lower right-hand corner and zeros everywhere else. That comes directly from our original, if you just look at the representation there, um, that's what it's got to be in the primed representation. But just for fun, if you have time, you should check it. Go ahead and take this definition of the T operator, find its eigenvalues, find its eigenvectors. You'll discover that the eigenvalues are indeed 2 and a half, and that the eigenvectors are indeed x prime and y prime. So too much fun. Okay, let's continue with our discussion from last time. We were talking about the ammonia molecule, and we discovered that the uh, Hamiltonian of the ammonia molecule has two eigenvectors. The eigenvector for a high energy is called plus. The low energy eigenvector is called minus. 
there were two eigenvalues. The energy for the high energy uh, eigenvector was lambda plus, it was E0 plus A, and the low energy eigenvalue, lambda minus, is E0 minus A. Now, lambda plus and lambda minus are energies. They're the energy of the corresponding state, plus and minus. Minus has a lower energy, plus has a higher energy. That's the way it works. Um, I want you to notice that if you add plus and minus together, you get something like u. So you can rewrite u as a superposition of plus and minus, and you can rewrite d as a superposition of plus and minus. So the up and down states are superposition states of energy eigenstates. Now, the question is, how do I compute time evolution? The rule is I use the ever useful time evolution operator. The time evolution operator is an operator you apply to a state to see what the state does at a later time. So the notion is if you want to know psi at some later time, you take psi at t equals zero and you multiply by the time evolution operator and what you get is psi at a later time. Now the time evolution operator has the Hamiltonian in it. So in order to actually calculate anything, <clears throat> it's generally useful to rewrite psi in the energy basis using energy eigenvectors. So I write the identity, but what is the identity? It's the superposition of projection operators that project out the energy eigenstates. So I write it this way. Now notice that uh, what have I got there? I've got the Hamiltonian, exponential of the Hamiltonian acting on an energy eigenstate. Here's the rule about exponentials. If you want to figure out what they mean, you've got to uh, expand whatever wave uh, whatever state you're looking at in the basis of the operator that's used in the exponential. And then uh, all you have to do is to replace the operator in the exponential with the eigenvalue of that basis ket that you're expanding with respect to. Uh, what about that inner product on the right, n on psi zero? Well, that's just the component of psi zero in the direction of the nth energy eigenstate. So that's that's what we normally call c sub n. That's the Fourier coefficient. So what do we find? We find psi at a later time is a superposition of the Fourier coefficient times e to the minus i omega sub n t times the nth energy eigenstate. This is what we've been doing all semester. It's just done in a little more formal way using the so-called very fancy time evolution operator. But uh, it's really nothing other than the same thing we've been doing all semester. Let's take a specific example. Let's find out what happens if we start the wave, we start the ammonia molecule out in the up state. And we ask the question, what's the probability that the ammonia molecule is up at a time t, given that it was definitely up when t was equal to zero? So I want to compute the probability that the thing is up now, given that it was up at an at t equals zero. That's the thing I want to compute. How do I do it? Well, I compute the amplitude that psi, that the uh, ammonia molecule is up <coughs> with respect to psi of t, but psi of t, of course, is u of t applied to the initial condition, psi sub zero, which was up. So really what I want is the amplitude that the thing is up after a time t when we knew it was up before. So that's how you write that using the uh, Dirac notation. And what I want to first do before we calculate the probability, let's just calculate the amplitude. What's the amplitude that the thing is up now at a time t, uh, given that it was up at t equals zero? So what we're going to do is just stick in the identity, expand the up state as a superposition of energy eigenstates, and then put in the time evolution operator using energy eigenstates. That gives us um, e to the minus i omega sub n t on n. And, uh, but that's just a number. So it comes out of the uh, calculation, or it can come out of the calculation. Uh, now, in this case, you know that the there's only two states, plus and minus. So we can write this sum out explicitly as a sum over uh, n equals plus and n equals minus. I can factor out the exponential because they're just numbers now. And you notice I'll get u on plus times plus on u, but that's just the magnitude of plus on u squared. And u on minus 
times minus on u. That's the magnitude of u on minus squared. And if you go back and look at the original definitions of plus and minus in terms of up and down, you'll notice that the uh, magnitudes are just 1 over the square root of 2. So what I wind up with is a half. I get a half times e to the minus omega plus t, uh, e to the minus i omega plus t, and plus e to the minus i omega minus t. I can uh, keep marching ahead with that. Let's go ahead and calculate the probability. So I take the magnitude of the squared. In other words, I multiply by the complex conjugate. And so I get a fourth, and I get a whole bunch of stuff. Uh, a lot of these exponentials cancel out, but what I'm left over with is a cosine, and it's a cosine of omega plus minus omega minus times t, but uh, omega plus minus omega minus is just twice a divided by h bar. So in the end, I get a uh, probability that goes like 1 plus cosine twice a t over h bar. So the thing flops. It starts out up. At t equals 0, it's definitely up. Um, but at a later time, it's definitely down, so the probability being up goes to zero. And then at a later time still, the probability goes back to one. So the probability actually flips between one and zero and one and zero and one and zero. So the interesting thing is if you start the ammonia molecule in the up case, uh, it won't stay. It'll flip up and down and up and down and up and down forever. Fascinating. All right, so that's the end of today. Um, I know that was kind of a long one. But uh, the two things we did was to review how you deal with matrices and how you do uh, similarity transformations, unitary transformations, change of basis, all that stuff. And then finally, we uh, talked about the time evolution of the ammonia molecule. And you should expect to see that again at some point, maybe on a GR coming your way soon. Hope you have fun. Talk to you later. Bye. Hi, guys. I want to give you just a quick slideshow that just, just sort of caps off some of the things we've been talking about from Chapter 3 before the exam. So let's make it quick. Um, basically, I want to go back to a slide from an earlier lesson where, where I talked about the business of changing basis from an unprime basis to a prime basis and how you could work that out in terms of matrices and so on. I just want to point out that the ammonia molecule bears a lot of resemblance to this system. So, for example, instead of x and y, you could... Um, consider up and down. So x could be like up and y could be like down. And the uh, up and down basis vectors in the unprime basis can still be thought of as 1, 0 and 0, 1. So that um, you can imagine writing these guys out as, as uh, linear algebra type vectors. Then also plus and minus, if you remember, were interesting directions in our ammonia molecule space. Um, plus was like up minus down, and minus was like up plus down. Now these guys were interesting primarily because they turned out to be eigenstates of the Hamiltonian of the ammonia molecule. In other words, these were states of well-defined energy. Up and down alone didn't have a well-defined energy because if you put the thing in the up condition, amplitude could leak to the down condition and so on with down back to up. But if you put the thing in the minus energy state, it would stay put in that state. Or if you put it in the plus energy state, it would stay put in that state. It would only acquire a, a time-dependent phase factor that depended on the energy of the state. But the uh, probabilities of getting up and down or plus or minus would, would stay constant. Now let's... Uh, Let's remind ourselves, in the old problem, we could imagine expressing any arbitrary vector as a superposition of the x and y basis vectors. But in this problem, you could imagine writing any ket as a superposition of up and down um, in an exactly analogous way. Uh, similarly, we worked out a t operator in the old problem that was diagonal in the primed basis and uh, had eigenvalues of 2 and 0.5. But in this problem, in the uh, ammonia molecule problem, there's a very interesting operator, namely the Hamiltonian, which turns out to be diagonal in the plus minus basis and which has eigenvalues of E plus and E minus. What that means is plus and minus are eigenvectors of the Hamiltonian. Therefore, they're the directions in this state space where time evolution is most simple. 
You remember the time evolution operator is most simply expressed in the energy eigenvector basis. In this case, that's the plus minus basis. And in that basis, it's simply uh, project out the plus component of any ket, multiply by e to the minus i omega plus t, and then add to that what you get when you project out the minus component of any ket and multiply that by e to the minus i omega minus t. If you think about it, this is the procedure we've been using all year to evolve quantum states in time. We've been calculating the component of the quantum state in different energy eigenstate directions, multiplying each component by e to the minus i omega t, where omega was the energy for that component, and then adding it up. And that's exactly what this thing says to do. All right, so that's uh, just pointing out the similarity between two problems that we've encountered, the fact that really you could think of them as just different forms of exactly the same problem. Okay, what about measurement? Um, measurement is a process in quantum mechanics where you look at the system using a particular observable. You measure a particular observable. If you do that, the quantum state collapses to an eigenstate of that observable, and uh, it's actually an eigenvector, if you will, of the operator that represents that observable. The measured value you get when you make the measurement is the eigenvalue of that corresponds to that eigenstate. Um, and the probability of getting a particular eigenstate is the magnitude squared of the amplitude of that eigenstate in the original state. So whatever, whatever the amplitude was of that state, of that eigenvector in the original state before the measurement, that's, you square that number, take its magnitude and square it to get the, uh, the probability. Now time evolution. Time evolution is something we've been doing all semester. There's nothing new here. It's just stating it in these uh, slightly more formal terms. The idea is each energy eigenstate or eigenvector evolves with a simple phase factor as time progresses. You just multiply each component, each energy eigen component, by e to the minus i omega t. If you have a superposition of energy eigenstates, then the expectation values of other observables are going to slosh due to the fact that different energy eigenstates get phase factors of different frequency because of the, the old Einstein relation. The time evolution operator is trivial in the energy basis, but it's complicated in other bases. In the energy basis, you just multiply each energy eigen, eigenstate component by the corresponding time-dependent phase factor. And finally, uh, since the amplitude of energy eigenstates only changes by a time-dependent phase factor, the probability of measuring a particular energy eigenvalue doesn't depend on time. Okay, As long as you don't measure anything else, uh, the amplitude of each energy eigenstate component is constant. Okay, Let's see how that works out in practice. Suppose we start with some arbitrary state that's a little bit plus and a little bit minus. And then we ask the question, what is the state going to be at a later point in time? Well, that's easy. We just apply the uh, time evolution operator to our state. Our state we write out as a little bit of plus and a little bit of minus. And you can see that what we get is what we've been doing all along. It's the plus component, e to the minus i omega plus t, plus the minus component times e to the minus i omega minus t. That's the state at some point in the future. If we want to ask what's the probability of measuring plus, then it's just the amplitude of getting plus squared, which is just a plus squared. And the probability of getting minus is just a minus squared. And those don't depend on time. So if you're measuring energy, if energy is the observable you're measuring, then, uh, then you get a time independent result. Its probability is constant. So um, if you actually do the measurement, then the system collapses to either plus or minus if you're measuring energy. So if you measured the energy and you got plus, then the system would now be in a new state, which is just plus, e to the minus i omega plus t, with no minus component. And if you measured minus, then the system would collapse instantly to minus e to the minus i omega minus t with no plus component. Okay, that's the idea. Measurements are going to change the system. So anytime you make a measurement, the system is now in a new state, and you have to start over. What about if you measure up or down? Well, if you measure up or down, you've got to ask the question, what's the amplitude to be up, or what's the amplitude to be down, and calculate the probability based on that. Let's do that. We'll start with our uh, wave function at a time t, 
and we'll ask, what's the amplitude of measuring up? Well, if you do that, you multiply through by the up bra, you calculate up on plus, up on minus, it turns out to be 1 over the square root of 2. That gives you the amplitude of being plus or minus. And uh, you can factor out the 1 over the square root of 2 if you like, and now calculate the probability of being up. Then you take the amplitude and multiply it by its complex conjugate. You see it gets a little bit ugly, but not too bad. Um, you can factor out the 1 over square roots of 2. You get a plus squared plus a minus squared, and then you get these other terms that have to do with uh, the cross terms. Um, notice that a plus squared, or a plus could be a magnitude and a phase. A minus could have a magnitude and a phase. In I'm just allowing these guys to be complex. But whatever they are, the sum of the squares has to be 1 if we assume that the initial state was normalized. So that means that the probability works out to be something like this. You get a half times 1 plus the product of the magnitudes of the two amplitudes, and then you get a cosine of the difference of frequencies plus some initial phase, which has to do with the uh, phase of the coefficients a plus and a minus. Um, the point is, the probability of being up is not independent of time. It sloshes back and forth with a frequency equal to the difference of frequencies of the two states, which corresponds, of course, to the difference in the energy of the two states. <clears throat> the other thing we need to know is uh, what would have to happen if you wanted to stop the sloshing, if you wanted the sloshing to stop? I want you to think about that a second. And maybe you came to the same conclusion I did. Either the energies have to be the same, in which case the omega plus minus omega minus is zero, or either a plus or a minus has to be zero. In other words, the thing either has to be in the plus state exactly or the minus state exactly. Notice that if it is in the plus state, then the probability of being up is independent of time. And if it is in the minus state, with a minus is one and a plus is zero, then the probability of being up would also be independent of time, and it would be a half. So the probability of being up would be a half in either case, whether it was plus or minus, which is kind of interesting. Let's, uh, let's do a little demo and uh, see if we can visualize what's going on here. Okay, so this is a little demo I cooked up to try to help visualize what's going on here. Um, you can see that we have a, uh, a set of basis vectors here. These are the up and down basis vectors and the plus and minus basis vectors uh, for the ammonia molecule. At the same time, I'm going to show here on two different sets of axes the, the up and down amplitudes and the plus and minus amplitudes um, for a particular uh, phaser that depends on time. And let me go ahead and show you what that phaser looks like. It's this guy here. It looks it's pointing off in some arbitrary direction. Notice it's got a minus component and it's got a plus component. The minus and plus components are shown here, but at the same time it's got an up component, which is big, and a down component, which at this moment is fairly small. So I can uh, <clears throat> I can change it. I can force it, for example, to be up, or I can force it to be down. Uh, down. <laughs> I can force it to be plus, or I can force it to be minus. Now the other thing I'm showing here, if, for example, if I show the up, embedded in here you can see the minus component and the plus component, or if I make it down you can see the plus component and the minus component. But of course if it's in the minus direction, then, um, then it's all minus, or if it's in the plus direction, then it's all plus. So that's the way the thing works. Now let, let's suppose it is in the plus direction. Let's go ahead and make it in the plus direction. Notice the amplitude to be plus is 1. The amplitude to be minus is 0. But you'll also notice that that is the same thing as up minus down. In other words, plus is up minus down. It also, you can see it here, plus is up but minus down. Okay, so they're all connected together. Now what happens when I turn on the time? When I turn on the time, the plus, vec the plus amplitude gets multiplied by e to the minus i omega plus t. That just means it gets uh, an imaginary part. That just means this phasor gets multiplied by that phase factor. The up and down get multiplied by the same phase factor, <coughs> uh, 
as long as they stay in this combination up minus down. So this is up minus down times that phase factor. Now what happens if I, uh, let's stop the time and let's, uh, let's look at minus. Now minus is the low energy eigenstate. Here I'm 100% minus, zero up, and that's up plus down. And again, if I turn on the time, up plus down gets multiplied by a phase factor. You can see that the energy is lower. It's moving more slowly. And this phaser moves around in space um, with that complex amplitude. No, the the uh, imaginary part is out of the plane, and the real part is in the plane is basically how that, that's showing. But you can see clearly that the... Uh, the minus amplitude gets uh, just multiplied by a common phase factor. Now here's a question, what's the probability of being up? Well you can see that the amplitude of being up and the amplitude of being down have the same magnitude. So when you're in the minus state, the, ampli the probability of being up or down is 50% uh, either way. <clears throat> it works the same way in the plus state. If you go to the plus state, the amplitude of being up or down are equal. They happen to be opposite in amplitude, but they're equal in magnitude, so that means it's 50% <laughs> again. Now, what happens if I'm in the up state? Let's go to the up state, and now I turn on the time. Well, what's going to happen is the plus and the minus now have different frequencies. So you'll notice that um, you're going from a, uh, a case where they're out of phase to a case where they're in phase. When plus and minus are in phase, like they are right here, then that means up is 100% and down is 0%. But when plus and minus are out of phase, let's see what goes on there. Wait for them to get completely out of phase. I guess that's right about... Oh, I waited too long. on it. Okay, now they're back in phase. We're back. Now we're back up again. If we wait for them to get out of phase, I guess that's going to be right about now. Okay, notice now we're completely down. Also, notice that the phaser is completely down. Okay, so out of phase plus and minus gives you down. In phase plus and minus gives you up. So we'll see how that works here. That looks right about like that. So now we're up. Okay. Now what happens if I just pick a, uh, a random vector off in some crazy direction and then turn on the time? Well now I get some superposition of up and down, some superposition of plus and minus. The thing never gets completely up and it never gets completely down. There's always some amplitude to be the other way. Also notice that the amplitudes of these two guys are not changing. Remember these are the energy eigenstates. No matter what goes on, all they do is spin. Their magnitudes don't change. So as time goes on, the probability of finding plus and the probability of getting minus uh, don't vary. But if you're measuring up and down, you'll notice that up and down do vary. Down gets big, up gets small. Then down's going to get small and up's going to get big. And it's all because the relative phase of the plus and minus components are changing. And that affects how much up and how much down there is. Um, now, let's talk about measurement. What if we're going along and we measure energy? Well, if we measure energy, then the thing's going to collapse into either plus or minus. So if I measure energy right now, for example, there's a greater probability of getting minus because it has a greater magnitude, and there's a smaller probability of getting plus because it has a smaller amplitude. But I can measure plus. It's not zero. So if I measure plus, boom, suddenly... I get 100% in the plus state. And then we're back to up and down being equally likely. Now, if I measure up and down this now, you can see I could either measure up or down. Let's say I measure down. Then suddenly it collapses into the down state. But um, then the probability, notice that in the down state, the probability of getting plus or minus is equal. They have different phases, but their magnitudes are equal. Similarly, if I measure up, um, let's say if I go along and I measure up right now, then sw it, it switches to the up state. But it doesn't stay there forever because up state is an equal superposition of plus and minus, and an equal superposition of plus and minus uh, 
is the same thing. You need to get a down state. It's just it's a question of what the relative phase of those two guys is. So if they ever get 180 degrees out of phase, then you're going to be completely down and zero up, like right there. Right now they're completely pretty much out of phase, and you're almost all down, very little up. Similarly, if I'm going along and I measure plus, boom, I go into 100% plus, and um, I'm back to an uh, up and down or opposite. And if I measure down and then measure minus, now I'm in a minus state with a 100% minus and no plus, and so on. So I hope that gives you some sense of how the uh, how measurement works, how time evolution works, the important role that the energy eigenstates have, and uh, sort of how it all fits together. Hey guys, welcome back. It's uh, the Schrodinger equation in more than one dimension. Finally, we've gotten there. This is lesson 30. We're going to talk about what happens when you involve a situation in which the particle is free to move in more than one dimension. So for example, let's say three dimensions. Uh, first of all, the potential is no longer just a function of one dimensional variable. It's now a function of a position in space. And so that becomes a vector. The uh, potential can depend on a spatial vector. Let's call it R, say. And the, uh, the old momentum operator we used to use in one dimension, which was minus i h bar times the derivative with respect to our one uh, variable now becomes a gradient. So the momentum operator is now your friend, the gradient operator in three dimensions. And uh, what that means is, for example, in Cartesian coordinates, you now have the superposition of an x component, a y component, and a z component. That's fairly straightforward to understand. But the basic uh, time-independent Schrodinger equation become, is still the same thing. You take the Hamiltonian operator, you hit it on a quantum state, and uh, the eigenstates have the property that you get a number, the energy, times the eigenstate back again. So as an example, let's look at the two-dimensional situation. Our momentum is now going to become a uh, two-component object, i hat and j hat, or x hat and y hat. And the wave function now, uh, instead of taking the inner product with the x bra, with the state psi, we're going to use the r vector bra. It's just a bra that represents the two coordinates of space, in this case x and y. Um, we still have the Schrodinger equation, time independent, and uh, if you write out what the Hamiltonian is, of course you apply the momentum operator twice, and divide by 2m. You add the potential energy function times the wave function, and that's the total Hamiltonian operating on the wave function. That's equal to the energy times the wave function. Back again, that's the eigenvalue problem for two dimensions. Uh, if I write that out a little more explicitly, the wave function now becomes a function of x and y, say in Cartesian coordinates, uh, and the potential and the gradient, or the, uh, I should say, the p squared now looks like a Laplacian. <clears throat> if I think of the potential as being made up of an x part and a y part in sum, and the energy as being made up of an x part and a y part, then I can separate this one Schrodinger equation into two Cartesian components. I can write out the uh, x, y dependence as an x part times a y part. It's similar to the way we divided the space and time part of the Schrodinger equation into a time-independent part and a time-dependent part, uh, except now we have an x-dependent part and a y-dependent part. This works as long as the potential can be expressed as a sum of an x-part and a y-part. And so you get, of course, you can see that those two equations are nothing other than the one-dimensional eigenvalue problem for the infinite square well, or for the Schrodinger equation. Uh, if we're doing the infinite square well, where the well has a with a in the x direction and a width a in the y direction, then the x and y parts of the wave function are each like this, and uh, and then we get an overall product wave function that looks like the product of two sine functions. Again, this is all for the infinite square well in two dimensions. Uh, what are the energies going to be? Well, you can plug the uh, 
kinetic energy back in. in. Inside the well, there's only kinetic energy. Outside the well, there's nothing because the wave function can't go out there. So all you have to do is calculate the kinetic energy. As you can see, there's an x part, the nx squared, and a y part, ny squared, corresponding to the wave number in each of those two directions. All right, the, to, how do we get the wave function as a function of time? We apply the time evolution operator on the initial wave function. Of course, that's uh, got the Hamiltonian in it, and the easiest way to do that is to uh, decompose the initial state into the energy eigenstates, the eigenbasis of the Hamiltonian. And so we stick the identity in there, made up of the projection operators onto all the energy eigenkets and bras. Um, now the thing is, of course, what we really want is the wave function as a function of time. So to get that, we take the inner product of psi at some time with the x and y, or the r vector uh, bra, that tells us where what the wave amplitude is at a different place in space. And if I stick all that in there, I get the following thing. Notice that the Hamiltonian acting on the nx and y basis is just the energy of the nx and y state divided by h bar. That's just omega some nx and y. So I can write that. That's just a number. So I can bring that outside. And you'll notice that I have several things here. There's the component of psi 0 in the nx and y basis direction. That's, of course, just the Fourier coefficient, uh, c, nx, and y. And what's the other thing? That's the xy acting on the nx and y basis vector. That's just the wave function of the nx and y eigenstate of the Hamiltonian. And so I can plug all that in there. And uh, what do I get? I get this month. Oh, I, how do I calculate the Fourier coefficient? Of course, I just take that inner product, just as it's written there. Put in what the actual wave functions are and integrate. And uh, how does it come out? It comes out looking very much like the stuff we've been doing. You get the Fourier coefficient, you get the basis state, you get the e to the minus i omega t. But now you're summing over not just a one-dimensional set of basis vectors, now you're summing over a two-dimensional set of uh, energy eigenstate wave functions. But uh, it's basically the same idea. And if you plug all that stuff in there, this is what you wind up with. It looks pretty terrible, but it's really not that bad. It's really not that bad. So let's look at Computing Project 8. We'll do a little demo associated with that and uh, see how it turns. Okay, so here we are looking at Computing Project 8. This is the actual program running here. It's uh, about a particle in two dimensions that's confined to a region initially uh, in the lower left-hand corner. Now let me uh, walk you through a couple of the parts of the code here. So uh, we have a new set arrow from complex number function, which I should point out. Let's see. Where is it? Here it is. And uh, basically, it takes a complex number and an, and an arrow. But the arrow is now actually a cylinder. It's a cylinder because we have a richer situation. We've got to represent a complex number at each point in a two-dimensional space. So we can't use the arrows, which used y and z to be the real and imaginary part, because uh, each cylinder now takes up one of two dimensions already. Its position is in one of two dimensions. We only have one dimension left over of space, which would be the height of the cylinder. We're, we're using cylinders instead of arrows. The height of the cylinder is the real part of the complex number. And for the imaginary part, I'm going to use a combination of the radius of the cylinder and its collar. So you can tell by the collar whether the imaginary part is positive or negative, and you can tell by the radius whether or how big the imaginary part is. But uh, I didn't want it to be able to go completely to zero or else we couldn't see the real part. So it never produces a radius that is less than 5% of the magnitude of the complex number. So that's the idea. And you'll see how that looks in a minute. Anyway, <coughs> we're going to graph the probability of the particle being in the lower left-hand corner. So you'll notice that probability. That shows up down here. Okay, down here. You'll notice that probability starts out very close to 1. If I just turn on the time for a moment, you'll see the probability of being in the lower, uh, lower left-hand corner is quite high. You also notice that the, uh, 
the imaginary and real parts suddenly change very quickly, close to t equals zero. We'll talk about that in a little bit. But um, the thing spreads out and jumps all over the place. Let's talk about how that code really works. Um, first of all, these arrays, nx and ny, uh, determine which Fourier coefficients are going to be around. Uh, so, for example, if you only want the first 10 Fourier coefficients in, in the x and y direction, you can just make a list of which ones you want. If you only want a couple of them, um, you, can, you can modify these lists in order just to have one or two. Um, also, uh, this mgrid function is just a trick to make the x and y arrays. They're a little bit like lin space, except for uh, two dimensions. So x is now a two-dimensional array that contains x values. y is now a two-dimensional array that can contains y values. And the reason for that is that I can come down here and I can compute wave functions by taking the sine of n pi x over a <laughs> Time. mm. times the sine of n pi y over a. And it looks just like the math we use in the report just like we use in the uh, description of the thing analytically. So the code matches sort of what you'd expect it to match. Um, the initial wave function, of course, is a constant. It's constant in the lower left-hand corner, and so I created a two-dimensional array for the wave function that's complex, but then I set it to something non-zero in the lower left-hand corner, and then I nor normalize it to make it a normalized wave function. And uh, calculate the Fourier coefficients, uh, before we've been using the analytical expressions to calculate the Fourier coefficients, you can see here I'm actually doing the calculation numerically. I take psi zero, multiply it by the nm wave function, and then I sum to get the integral, and I just store the coefficient um, in an array of coefficients. The uh, coefficient array is actually now uh, an associative array. That's kind of like a dictionary, so you look up coefficients based on the n and m value. Same way with the omegas. The omegas are going to be stored in a dictionary, an associative array, um, where you can look up the corresponding omega. And I'm calculating the omegas right here. It's the ground state omega times the quantity nx squared plus ny squared. So you can see that the, uh, the energies are being computed essentially here. And uh, everything else is fairly straightforward. One thing is eigenstates is now uh, an associative array. Uh, and we're basically going through all the nm pairs in that associative array. Let's see, where is eigenstates created? It looks like, uh, let's see, right here. So for nx in all the nx's and ny in all the ny's, I create the wave function, and then I store eigenstates by pair as a lookup table, basically, by pair, and then when I want to go through all those states, I can just um, choose them uh, by going through the keys of that dictionary. The keys will simply be the pairs of n and m values. And here you take out the nx and ny from that pair, and you can, uh, and you can calculate with it. All right. So uh, what's the main point of all that? Let's, Let's go ahead and turn on the time and watch what happens. You'll notice that the wave function bounces around in complicated ways. It's uh, It's got a lot of symmetry to it, but really the symmetry is just due to the original symmetry of the wave function. If we start with a different wave function that doesn't have uh, a strong symmetry between x and y, then um, what you'll find is that the thing uh, doesn't maintain any symmetry. It doesn't start with any such symmetry, and it doesn't keep it. What I want to try to do is to stop the thing when it gets back to its original uh, state, which is right around in here. Well, let's see. No, I'm too early. You can see there's kind of a periodicity to it, just as there was with the infinite square well in one dimension. Here we go. Aha, there we're very close. So that, notice that the probability is now all confined to the lower left-hand corner again. So the thing does have a revival time, just like the infinite square well. But the revival time is, uh, well, I should say the other wave functions are not now uh, simple multiples of the ground state wave function energy. And so it's a little more complicated situation. But anyway, that's sort of the way the thing looks. It's kind of mesmerizing and... Uh, I hope you enjoy it as much as uh, 
as much as I do. It's kind of wacky to watch that stuff. All right. Welcome back. It's time for lesson 31 and 32. What you see in front of you is a three-dimensional representation of two stationary states interfering with one another in the hydrogen atom. This is where we're about to go. But we're not quite there yet. So let's start more or less back at the beginning. Um, we're going to pick up where we left off last time when we talked about the Schrodinger wave equation in three dimensions. Last time we talked about what happens if we use Cartesian coordinates to separate the Schrodinger wave equation into pieces. This time we're going to use spherical polar coordinates. We're going to do that because the potential in many cases depends only on R. And so it is easiest to break the wave function up into pieces that depend on R, theta, and phi. So here's the kinetic energy operator acting on the wave function in spherical polar coordinates. Notice there's a piece that's got derivatives with respect to r, there's a piece that's got derivatives with respect to theta, and one piece that's got derivatives with respect to phi. The theta and phi part turn out to have to do with angular momentum, and the uh, r part has to do with radial momentum, the momentum in, toward, and away from the center of force. Now we can convert this into the Schrodinger wave equation by simply adding the potential energy times the wave function and setting that equal to the energy eigenvalue times the wave function. This is the eigenvalue equation for the Schrodinger wave equation written out in spherical polar coordinates. Now, our plan is to separate the wave function into pieces, just as we did in, in one-dimensional quantum mechanics when we had the time-dependent Schrodinger equation, we factored the wave function into a time part and a space part. The separation constant in that case was the energy, and that's how we got the energy on the right-hand side of this equation. That's the separation constant that helped us to separate the wave function into a time part and a space part. But now the space part has three variables, so we're going to separate again. We're going to rewrite the wave function as a product of an r part, a theta part, and a phi part. And if I plug all that back in, I get this monstrosity. Now what I want you to do is to focus just on the kinetic energy term for a second. Let's move it to the top. And let's see what happens when we go ahead and take some of these derivatives. So for example, if we take the first r derivative, the first theta derivative, and the first phi, we can take both phi derivatives, in fact, since it's a second phi derivative, you can see that things simplify a little bit. What I want to do now is to uh, see what happens when I factor out the pieces that I didn't take derivatives of. So let's separate things a little bit. We'll take the phi and the theta out of the r prime term. We'll take the r and the phi out of the theta prime term. And we'll take the r and the theta out of the phi double prime term. Now what I want to do next is to multiply everything by 2 mu r squared over h bar squared. Remember mu is the reduced mass of the electron and the proton in this case. And I'm going to divide through everything by r theta phi. Let's see what we get. Notice that um, now the parts that depend on r are separate from the parts that depend on theta and phi. This is really cool because it means um, I have a function of r plus a function of theta and phi equals 0. Now we talked about this in class, but Anytime you have a function of one variable plus a function of a different variable equals zero, those functions are in fact constants. They can't be anything else. And you can persuade yourself of that. We talked about it in class. But uh, you can persuade yourself of that pretty easily if you try sticking in one value for one of the variables and then look at what the other thing, say we set r equal to 3. Now we have 3 plus a function of theta and phi equals zero. Well, that means that function of theta and phi is minus 3. It has to be. And uh, it works out the same way if you choose a theta and phi. Uh, the function of r has to be a constant, and so on. So we're going to call the function of r l times l plus 1. Now that's kind of a strange name for a constant, but it turns out that that is a useful name for a constant because l ends up being an integer, we'll discover. Uh, and that means that g of theta and phi has to be minus l times l plus 1 because they have to add up to 0. So they have to be negatives of one another. 
Now, if I put in that the thing on the right, the function of theta and phi, is equal to minus L times L plus 1, it means that if I add L times L plus 1 to that function of theta and phi, I have to get 0. Now what I can do is get rid of the theta in the phi term and uh, multiply by uh, sine squared theta through the whole expression. And notice that now I've got a function of theta only times a function of phi only. Again, just as it was before, these each have to be constants. And I, the, for this time, I'm going to choose the constant to be m squared for the function of theta and minus m squared for the function of phi. This is just the strategy of factoring the uh, wave function into pieces that each depend only on one variable and then I, uh, inventing separation constants that allow us to solve the equations. We're choosing separation constants with the knowledge of the answer. <laughs> so we already know the answer. So we're picking the separation constants in kind of a weird way, but there it's a weird way that proves to be useful. So if you rewrite the phi part, you'll notice it's uh, it's actually just the second derivative of phi is equal to minus m squared times phi again. This is obviously just the plain old solutions we've been working with, e to the i m phi. Um, m, it turns out, has to be an integer. Why is that? Well, if I add 2 pi to phi, I get e to the i m phi plus 2 pi, but that's e to the i m phi times e to the i m 2 pi. Now, one thing about space is if you go around and end up back where you started, you should be, uh, you should have the same wave function. And so in order to keep the wave function single valued, in other words, if it has the same value at phi and phi plus 2 pi, then it turns out e to the i m 2 pi has to be 1. Now, uh, that means m has to be an integer, and that means that uh, m has to be 0, plus or minus 1, plus or minus 2, like that. Okay? So, uh, what's the next equation? It's this, uh, the theta part. Now, we go ahead and put back in what phi double prime over phi is, and multiply through by theta, we get this monstrosity. Now, I'm not going to solve this one. It turns out uh, it's done in Griffith's Electromagnetics book, I think, and it's done in many other places. But this equation has well-known solutions. They're called the associated Legendre functions, and they're related to the Legendre polynomials. Um, these functions are defined uh, in this way, it's the mth, absolute value of mth derivative of the, the lth Legendre polynomial times the m over 2th root of um, 1 minus x squared. And uh, the Legendre polynomials are defined this way as the lth derivative of x squared minus 1 to the l divided by 2 to the l times l factorial. You know, it's a terrible uh, monstrosity, but the point is if you just use these two definitions as a machine to compute these functions, you can do it. So I wrote a little program that does that, and I computed a whole pile of these things, and you can see they're functions of theta. Um, they are, uh, there's some in there, let's see, there's, you notice there's a square root of 1 minus cosine squared. If my program were smarter, it would replace that with sine of theta, and uh, 1 minus cosine squared uh, is sine squared of theta, and so on. But uh, you get the idea. These are just a pile of functions of theta, and uh, and there's no phi anywhere in sight because these are functions of theta only. But they get kind of complicated as the numbers go higher. But it's straightforward to compute them if, if uh, a little tedious. Now we define the spherical harmonics as the product of the associated Legendre functions times the solutions to the phi part, the e to the i m phi, and a normalization factor. Now the normalization factor is just there so that when you integrate over all theta and all phi using the correct normalization for theta and phi, you end up with uh, with functions that are orthonormal. That is, y m l squared integrated over all angles is 1, and y m l times a different y m l gives you 0. The normalization constant is a little scary to look at, but it's uh, it's computable at least, and you can uh, work with it. So it's not it's not terrible. If you again write a program to generate a bunch of these guys, 
you'll see that they come out. Um, you know, it get it, they're fairly ugly, but uh, this is for all the positive m's. Um, there's a simple symmetry relationship that gives you the negative m's, but uh, there they are. You can tabulate them. You certainly don't want to try to memorize any of these guys, um, <clears throat> but uh, they're listed in tables and textbooks and manuals and so on, so they're easy to get. Let's jump back to the radial part. So that's the theta part. Now, notice we didn't have to deal with the potential at all to get the theta and the phi part. The theta and the phi part are the same for any potential that depends only on R. So uh, that means they apply to all different kinds of atoms and molecules. As long as the interaction potential only depends on R, you can use those guys uh, right out of the box. Okay back to the radial equation. Now the radial equation does have a potential in it. And so in order to solve this for um, the hydrogen atom, for example, we're going to have to stick in some definite potential. But I want you to notice that when I go ahead and take the other derivatives, I can simplify my life by making a substitution. The substitution we're going to make is that u of r is defined to be r times capital R. Now capital R is the r part of the wave function. u of r is called the radial wave function and uh, we can just substitute uh, u of r over r in for big R and if you look at what r prime is and you look at what r double prime is uh, we actually did this on the board last time so you guys should remember how this all goes you plug all that back in and you get the following result there's a u double prime there's an v minus e term, there's an l times l plus 1 term. Um, if we keep working on that a little bit and rearrange, you get the following result. And if you multiply by r on both sides, you get this result. And this is interesting because if you look at it, you'll notice that it looks exactly like one-dimensional quantum mechanics with a single extra term. There's minus h bar squared over 2 mu u double prime. There's the potential times u. And then there's this one extra term that has to do with the magnitude of the angular momentum. This is the centripetal force term or the centripetal potential term that shows up in classical mechanics if you solve exactly the same problem. And uh, it just acts like an added effective potential that, uh, that acts in the R direction. Okay? And uh, other than that, it looks like one-dimensional quantum mechanics. Now there is a special case when L is equal to zero, that centripetal potential term goes away and you just get straightforward one-dimensional quantum mechanics. So interesting case. If we want to solve the hydrogen atom, we simply put in the actual potential, the Coulomb potential, and we get this follow the following thing. It's a terrible monster, but, uh, but that's our problem. We want to solve the hydrogen atom. Now, uh, it almost always pays to look at asymptotic behavior when you're solving a problem like this. So let's look at two different domains. Let's look at small r and large r. If you look at large r, you'll notice that the Coulomb term and the centripetal or centrifugal potential term become negligibly small at very large r. And so you end up with uh, what looks like the outside of the finite square well. Basically, you've got minus h bar squared over 2 mu u double prime is equal to e times mu. This is uh, what we had when we were outside the potential well with the finite square well in one dimension. And the solution should not be too shocking. Turns out to be exactly the same. You'll notice that uh, it goes like e to the minus kappa r. Now r goes to infinity, so you, technically you could also have an e to the plus kappa r, but of course that blows up as r gets large, and so in the large r limit that term is going to be negligible. So for large r we have to have a, a decreasing exponential. Okay. Now what about small r? When you have small r, then the, the Coulomb potential doesn't matter anymore because the centrifugal potential is going to overwhelm it since it goes like 1 over r squared. And so in that domain, we can just ignore the energy term, ignore the Coulomb potential term, and just make sure that the second derivative term and the 1 over r squared term uh, line up with each other to make the equation satisfied. And you can see that uh, if you let u be some power of r, and you plug that in, you end up with the condition 
that uh, q times q minus 1 is equal to l times l plus 1. Now there's only two solutions to that. The two solutions, just plug into the quadratic formula, are either l, r to the l plus 1 or r to the minus l. Now the problem is for, uh, for small r, r to the minus l blows up. So the only answer that actually physically could work is the r to the l plus 1. So we got the small r and the large r limits taken care of, but we haven't dealt with the middle yet. So the idea is to factor the u function into the small r piece times the large r piece times some kind of function that's going to take up the uh, slack in the intermediate areas. So we've can sort of factored out the asymptotic behavior for small r and large r. And what's left over, we hope we can get a simpler differential equation to try to solve. Um, if we plug all that back in and substitute into the radial equation, we, uh, we get a recursion relation. We can, de we can demand that v be writable as, a, as an infinite sum, a uh, polynomial, uh, and uh, we get a recursion relation, but it's interesting. It's a recursion relation that gives us the positive exponential if we follow it through, unless um, the thing terminates. So the point is, in order for the thing to terminate, e has to have a particular value. And that turns out to be how e becomes quantized. e becomes quantized by demanding that the wave function we wind up with is physically reasonable, which means it doesn't blow up as r goes to infinity. And there are only a certain set of e values that make that possible. Remember, e is related to kappa. So kappa values, e values are all connected. And uh, turns out that those e values that work are the ones you're familiar with. 13.6 um, volts divided by n squared. So actually negative 13.6 volts divided by n squared. And uh, it's sort of like when we had the simple harmonic oscillator, you may remember that we had to stop the series solution for the simple harmonic oscillator when we did it using the analytical approach in order to keep the thing from blowing up. It's the same basic idea. Once you have energy, of course, that gives you kappa. It also defines uh, what we call A. A is the Bohr radius. It turns out to be about half an angstrom. And uh, it also determines the value of this uh, function V. Now the V functions turn out to be polynomials. If you snoop through the literature on various special polynomial functions, you'll find that in fact it's a very old function that was discovered a long time ago. They're called the Laguerre polynomials. And they are computed this way. This is the associated Laguerre polynomial. And uh, they are defined similar to the Legendre polynomials based on the Laguerre polynomials. And the Laguerre polynomials are derivatives of exponentials times powers of x. And again, this is a recipe you can use to build these guys. It's a bunch of special functions. I wrote a little program to build a pile of them, and I came up with this list. You can see that they are... Uh, there are polynomials uh, in x, and uh, of course x, remember, is r over na. So um, if you plug all this back in, you get the following terrible mess. You get wave functions, which are uh, exponentials that decay with r. You have r to the power l. You have the Laguerre polynomial times the spherical harmonics. And remember, the spherical harmonics are products of Legendre-associated polynomials times uh, complex exponentials in phi. So if you put in all the dependents, this thing would be a terrible mess. But I want to factor some of this out and just look at it. We've got some kind of normalization constant. We've got r to the l. We've got a polynomial in r. And we've got the spherical harmonics. And then, of course, there's the exponential decay in r. If you put all that in, you'll see that, in fact, it's the product of r stuff times the spherical harmonics. And uh, all the angular dependence is in the spherical harmonics. The small r and large r dependence we worked out before uh, separating out the v polynomials is still there in the final solution. And the structure in the r direction is all given by the Laguerre polynomials. 
So, and we're going to see that in a minute. Let's actually look at some of these functions using the 3D visualization strategy that I cooked up for the purposes of this set of slides. Okay. Okay, so before we get started, I want to describe for you how these pictures work. These are visualizations of three-dimensional wave functions. And uh, the problem, of course, we have all three dimensions are used up in real space. So we have to represent the wave function somehow separately from space. So one issue is the phase of the wave function. To get that, I'm using color. So you've seen that done before, so that's not anything new. The other question is the amplitude of the wave function. And you'll notice there are a collection of little dots out there, little spheres. These spheres are uh, sized in such a way that their radius is proportional to the amplitude of the wave function. Now they're capped so that they can never get smaller than a certain size, even if the amplitude goes to zero. And they're also capped at the other end so they can never get bigger than a certain size, even if the amplitude becomes very large. But they have another feature that makes them interesting, and that is that they move around. They move around because they're attracted to regions of high probability. So they tend to congregate in those areas where the probability of being there is large, and they tend to avoid areas where the probability of being there is small. Now, obviously, there's a little bit of thermal agitation and so on that goes on, but that's the basic idea. So here's the 100 eigenstate. And here's the, uh, this is what the 200 eigenstates looks like. This is a freeze frame. I wanted you to notice uh, that in the 100 state, the color was changing. That was simply the phase. It was a, uh, an energy eigenstate, so everything changed color at the same time, which only makes sense because the whole thing is in phase. This case is a little different because you'll notice that the interior part of the wave function is green, but the outer part is red. And that's a consequence of the fact that the radio wave function goes through a zero and changes phase. So we have two different parts in space. At a given snapshot in time, different parts of space have different phases. And this becomes important when it comes time to finding superposition wave functions where you add states together. Now see what happens as we turn on the time. Okay, here's the 211 state. This is a state of uh, one unit of angular momentum, and notice that the phase now varies continuously around the z-axis. If you watch the thing go in time, you'll notice that it's spinning in such a way that it would normally have a plus one, a plus component of angular momentum. Let's see what happens. So there it goes. Now also notice there's no probability at the center. That's the r to the l. And here's the two one minus one state. Looks the same, but it spins the other way around. Here's the 320 state. Notice the phase. And here's the 322 state. Notice that this time the phase goes two full cycles around the z axis, corresponding to two units of angular momentum. I've got a couple of quick superpositions to show. Here's the 211 plus 21 minus 1 plus 100. Notice that this one shows a significant variation in dipole moment. This is a sloshing superposition. And I've got another one similar to that. This is a 320 plus a 211. So notice that it looks like there's a charge sort of circling the origin. And uh, this also produces a varying time time dependent dipole moment. OK, let's talk about orbital angular momentum. Remember, orbital angular momentum classically is defined as r cross p. and uh, Mathematically, you can define that in terms of a uh, determinant of the unit vectors, the position vector, and the momentum vector. And the components of the angular momentum, the orbital angular momentum, are defined thusly. And uh, the question is, these different components of angular momentum, are they compatible observables? In other words, can I observe the x component of angular momentum and the y component of angular momentum at the same time. Sort of like I can observe x and y at the same time. I can observe y and z at the same time. What about angular momentum? Well, it turns out because the angular momentum is a mixture of momentum and position, and momentum and position are incompatible observables. If you try to measure two components of the angular momentum, you run into trouble. 
So for board work, we're going to work out today the um, commutator of LX and LY. What I want you to do, if you're listening to the slide, uh, if you're listening to these slides and you're not going to actually see me in class, I would like you to try to work it out on your own, but you know, email me or let me know if you have trouble, and we'll see if we can't get you going. The answer turns out to be that it's proportional to LZ. That is LZ, uh, that the commutator of X and Y is not zero. They do interfere with each other. And shockingly, the interference is proportional to LZ. Now you can generate commutator of LY and LZ by just cyclically rotating these guys. So LY comma LZ, the commutator is IH bar LX. And LZ LX is IH bar LY. So they're cyclical. Um, they, you can get the rest of them by doing cyclical rotations of X, Y, and Z. Now it turns out, uh, we could also show this, but we don't have time, but it's easy enough to show that the L squared operator does commute with LX, LY, and LZ. So those commutators are all zero. Um, what that means is you can, at any one moment, know the total angular momentum and any one component of angular momentum but not the other two, because the other two interfere with the first, and so you can't know any two components of angular momentum at the same time, but you can know one component and the total angular momentum at any given moment. Now you may remember with this uh, simple harmonic oscillator, we uh, define these raising and lowering operators, and so uh, we're gonna do that again. We're gonna define L plus and L minus as linear combinations of LX and LY. <coughs> Now, um, let's work out the commutator of LZ and L plus minus. Well, d the definition of L plus minus is LX plus minus ILY. So the commutator of LZ and L plus minus is just the commutator of LZ and LX plus I times the commutator of LZ and LY. Of course, we know those from the equation at the top of the screen. So we can put in the results. And you'll notice that uh, what that says is LZ does not commute with L plus and L minus. But the commutator, interestingly, is plus minus h bar l plus minus. So there's a relationship between uh, l plus minus. It's, it, it is its own commutator with lz, which has interesting consequences. Let's imagine we have a state. Because l squared and lz commute with each other, it should be possible to find a single state that is a simultaneously an eigenvector of l squared and lz. So let's suppose we have such a state. Let's call it lambda mu. It has an L squared eigenvalue of lambda, <coughs> and it has an LZ eigenvalue of mu. So mu tells you the Z component of angular momentum. Lambda tells you the uh, magnitude of the angular momentum squared. And uh, remembering that these guys can be with each other, um, we should be able to see what happens if I ask for the L squared eigenvalue of a state which you get by applying L plus and minus to a state of well-known L squared and LZ eigenvalue. So what do we get? Um, well, it turns out since L squared and LZ, or L plus minus commute, then uh, we can operate on either, either order. So if we operate with L squared first, we get out of lambda. And so that tells us that uh, a state which we get by applying L plus and minus uh, it has the same value of its L squared eigenvalue that it had before. So what that means is um, if we apply plus and minus, L plus minus to a state of well-known L squared and LZ eigenvalue, we get a state that has the same L squared eigenvalue as it had before. Now, what if we apply LZ to a state? that has a well-known L squared and LZ eigenvalue, well, I can, uh, I can subtract off L plus minus LZ and add L plus minus LZ, and I still get the same state, still get the same operator. I've just subtracted and added the same thing. But notice the trick there is that the first two terms in that sum are nothing other than the LZ L plus minus commutator. So I can put in what I know the LZ L plus minus commutator is, it's plus minus h bar L plus minus, 
But now h bar is just a number. And if you look at the second term, you'll notice that we've swapped L plus minus and Lz. So now Lz is acting on lambda mu, but that is just uh, mu times lambda mu. And so I can uh, now I have L plus minus plus or minus h bar L plus minus. The plus or minus h bar and the mu are both just numbers, so I can factor those out. And I get the interesting result that the Lz eigenvalue of the state you get after you apply L plus minus to a state of well-known L squared and Lz is uh, mu plus or minus h bar times the same state. In other words, what you've got now is an eigenstate of Lz with an eigenvalue for Lz that's either h bar greater or h bar less than you started with. So that's the idea. If you, uh, if you hit one of these states with L plus, you get a state whose Lz eigenvalue is mu plus h bar. And if you hit it with L minus, you get a state whose Lz eigenvalue is mu minus h bar. So it leaves the L squared eigenvalue the same, but it adds or subtracts h bar from the Lz eigenvalue. What good is that? Um, that's good because it means we can play interesting games. Uh, one thing is we know there has to be a limit. You can't keep increasing the Lz component without changing the magnitude of L without eventually running into a problem because there's no way the Z component of angular momentum can ever be greater than the magnitude of the angular momentum. And so there's some maximum value of mu that can't, uh, where you can't go any higher. And so the idea is if you apply L plus to that state, you ought to get zero. And similarly, there should be a minimum value, a most negative value of mu, below which you can't go for the same reason. It's kind of like in the uh, simple harmonic oscillator, when we hit the lowering operator on the ground state, we got nothing. Here, if we hit L plus on a state that has the maximum Z component of angular momentum, we get nothing. If we hit L minus on a state that has the minimum value of Z component of angular momentum, we should get nothing as well. So uh, let's imagine that we hit uh, this state. Let's imagine we have a state that has the maximum value and we hit it on with Lz, we should get an angular momentum times the maximum back again. We're going to define h bar L to be that maximum. So this L, turns out it's going to be the same L we ran into when we did the separation of variables. Um, of course L squared acting on that maximum state is going to give us lambda um, times that maximum state again. And uh, now it turns out it's easy to show that if you take the L plus minus operator and hit the L minus plus, that means L plus on L minus or L minus on L plus, you get L squared minus LZ squared plus or minus H bar LZ. So you can, sh you can show this with algebra. Griffiths does it. It's easy to do. Just put in the definitions of L plus and L minus and fiddle around. Um, you can run that backwards and solve for L squared. L squared is uh, this expression that I've written down there. So let's see where we get with that. Let's apply L squared to this maximum state. Now I took the upper sign, or no, I'm sorry, the lower sign in the expression on the right at the top. Um, L minus L plus plus LZ squared plus, I got the lower sign, H bar LZ acting on this state should give me lambda times the state back again. But if you look at it, notice that if you hit L plus on the maximum state, you should get nothing. Lz squared gives you an h bar squared L squared, and Lz gives you an h bar squared L. But that also has to be equal to lambda. So that means that uh, lambda has to be h bar squared L times L plus one. So that tells us how lambda depends on the maximum component of z component of angular momentum. Now let's imagine that there's a minimum. So let's call that value h bar l bar. L bar is the lowest possible, uh, the most negative possible value of a z component of angular momentum. And we'll play the same game, but this time I'll take the upper sign from the expression on the upper right hand, and we'll do the same trick and we'll find that the minimum uh, that, that L squared, lambda, is also related to the most negative value of the LZ 
eigenvalue, and those have to be the same. So lambda is lambda either way. So that means L times L plus 1 has to be the same thing as L bar times L bar minus 1. Now that has two possible solutions. One of them is crazy, and the other one is that L bar is minus L. So what does that say? That says that if you apply L plus to the minimum Z component of angular momentum ket n times, you have to get up to the maximum. And it also, uh, since uh, the minimum corresponds to minus L and the maximum corresponds to plus L, it means minus L plus n must be equal to plus L. That means that L has to be an integer n divided by 2. So L is a half integer value. And mu is h bar times the m. So you st m starts at negative L and it goes up to positive L. And the angular momentum associated with each of those states is just h bar times that integer. And, uh, and that's the whole thing. I want you to note that there's no prohibition in this derivation for L to be half integer. Um, so if capital N is an even number, then L will be, uh, I'm sorry, M will uh, be full whole integers. But if capital N is a half integer number, I'm an odd number, excuse me, then M will take on half integer values. So uh, this turns out to be important when we study spin because spin of many particles turns out to be half integer, like the spin of the electron is a half. And so that uh, actually becomes important. All right, very good. So uh, I hope that wasn't too much. I know that was a lot of material for one day, but uh, that's all there is. Hey guys, welcome back. It's lesson 33. We're going to dig a little bit deeper into the whole angular momentum, orbital angular momentum. Next time we'll, we'll start with spin, but uh, let's see where we are. I want you to remember that um, last time we discussed the x, y, and z components of orbital angular momentum. And in particular, we discovered that um, you can know at any one moment a single component of angular momentum, but not the other two. And mathematically, the way that comes out is that the x and y components of angular momentum have a non-zero commutator. That means that it matters. If you measure one first and then the other, you get a different result than if you measure them in the opposite order. That's the same way um, position and momentum are incompatible observables. That means that you can't simultaneously have an eigenstate of both observables. That means you can have an eigenstate of LZ, but then it won't be an eigenstate of LX and LY, and, and similarly for the others. So uh, the convention is that we pick LZ as our preferred axis and, and use eigenstates of Z component of angular momentum to describe what's going on. Of course, that's completely arbitrary. You could pick x or y. In fact, you can define your z-axis to point any way in space you wish. And uh, what it boils down to is we always pick the z-axis to point along the direction in space in which we're interested in describing the, uh, the wave functions or, or uh, quantum states as superpositions of well-defined components of angular momentum in that direction. That's, that's the idea. Um, the other thing that we discovered was that the magnitude of the angular momentum does commute with all three components. So what it boils down to is that you can know the total angular momentum, L squared, um, which is the square of the magnitude of the angular momentum, and any one component, and the component we normally pick is the Z component. Okay. It also uh, turns out that the eigenvalue of L squared is h bar squared times L times L plus 1, where L is an integer that describes the uh, total angular momentum in, as a f uh, in units, basically, of h bar. So uh, that's how that works. And the z component of angular momentum has an eigenvalue that's h bar times m, where m is, again, an integer <coughs> for orbital angular momentum. We'll find out when we start involving spin that uh, m will be permitted to be half integer because you have a spin of a half, for example, for the electron and the proton. And uh, so the z component has a uh, eigenvalue of h bar times this number m. So any given uh, quantum state 
can be expressed as a superposition of states of well-defined L and well-defined M, little l and little m, which correspond to the magnitude of the angular momentum squared and the z component of angular momentum. Now, as a helper, as an assistance, we invented these L plus minus operators, which are constructed by adding or subtracting the x and y versions with an i multiplied by the y. And basically, there was no reason given for this other than that they're useful. Uh, it, Griffiths demonstrated, and I think I showed it in the last set of slides as well, that uh, if you apply L plus or L minus to a state uh, little l, little m, you get a state with the same value of little l, but uh, a value of little m that's one more or one less than the state you had before. Now what I didn't show, but what you can show fairly easily, there's a homework problem in the chapter about this, <coughs> is that uh, similar to the raising and lowering operators from the simple harmonic oscillator, if you hit L plus or minus on a state with a little l, little m, uh, not only do you get a state with little m increased or decreased by one, but there's a factor out in front that depends on the values of little l and little m and an h-bar. And you can deduce this using the uh, I, the definition of L squared that's based on L plus minus times L minus plus, I think, uh, and then it's plus LZ squared plus h-bar LZ or plus minus h-bar LZ. I, I forget the exact equation, but uh, you can find it in Griffiths or you can find it in the last set of slides. What I want to do right now is to spend a little time focusing on a particular system which uh, turns out to be enlightening, at least I think it can be enlightening, and that, that's the system when little l is equal to 1. In other words, when you have a orbital angular momentum of 1, then you know m can go from minus 1 to plus 1 in steps of 1, so that means it only has three possible values. So for L equals 1, we have three possible values of M. M can be plus 1. That would be the 1, 1 ket. M could be minus 1. That sort of corresponds to no Z component of angular momentum. Uh, that would be the 1, 0 ket. And M can be minus 1, which would be the 1, minus 1 ket. And uh, <coughs> these three states all have the same magnitude of angular momentum, but they have different z components of angular momentum. And it's useful to sort of think about how the, what that means and how it works and so on. So what I want to do right now is to remind you what the those three states look like in the hydrogen atom by looking at the 2, 1, 1, 2, 1, 0, and 2, 1, minus 1 states using that uh, visualization trick that I cooked up for the last set of slides. Okay, so uh, here is the picture of the 2-1-1 hydrogen energy eigenstate looking straight down the z-axis. And if we turn on the time, you'll notice the thing goes counterclockwise. Um, if I, uh, I'll let that loop a second. And you can see that it just goes and goes. Um, so this is the L equals 1, M equals plus 1 state looking straight down the z-axis. Now let me switch to the minus 1 state. Here's the um, same thing with the minus 1 state. And it just goes the other way. And you can see that uh, if you look at it from one of the other directions, if you look at it, for example, from the negative x-axis, it just looks like kind of a blur of color. But if you look at it, and there it is along the negative y-axis, so here it is about the z-axis, here it is about the negative y-axis, and this is what it looks like about the negative x-axis, okay? So this is the minus one state, and you, it's about the same idea for the plus one state. So now let's look at the two, one, zero state. That's the one where uh, there's no z component of angular momentum. Looking straight down the z-axis, you see it looks just like a blob, but if you tip it up, if you tip it up and look at it, you'll notice that uh, it's got structure in the theta direction, um, but it has no phase change as you go around the z-axis. If you go around the z-axis, the phase is constant. Looking at it straight down the z-axis, it's a constant color in this picture. 
And that's another way of saying that, uh, there you go, the thing is uh, got no z component of angular momentum, but it does have some angular momentum because it's got structure in the in the theta direction. Okay. Okay, now that we've refreshed our memory about what those three states look like in the hydrogen atom, uh, I want to discuss how you construct operators, how you construct matrices that represent operators. And I want to go back to the pizza, feed the pizza operators from the skinny mouse, fat mouse tutorial. You guys remember that one, I hope. You still have the tutorial, I hope, if you want to read about the feed the pizza operator. But basically, if you feed pizza to a skinny mouse, you get a fat mouse. And if you feed pizza to a fat mouse, you get no mouse at all. In other words, uh, the mouse dies or the mouse ceases to exist in some meaningful way. Now, if we represent the skinny mouse as a vector, 1, 0, and we represent the fat mouse as the vector, 0, 1, you can see that those two vectors are mutually orthogonal to each other. And also, given that representation, given that basis, that set of basis vectors, we can represent the feed the pizza operator quite easily. If you feed the pizza to a skinny mouse, you get a fat mouse. So the first column of the feed the pizza operator has to be 0, 1. And if you feed pizza to a fat mouse, you get a dead mouse, or no mouse at all, which means that column has to be all zeros. Now the next question is, what is the adjoint of the pe feed the pizza operator? Now this was a uh, part of the tutorial, and just for completeness, I want to go ahead and explain to you how you get that. The definition of adjoint is that uh, if you hit the skinny mouse on what you get when you feed the pizza to the fat mouse, that's the same thing as hitting the skinny mouse with the adjoint of feed the pizza, and then taking the fat mouse inner product with the result. Now, since feeding pizza to a fat mouse gives you no mouse at all, we know the skinny mouse and the fat mouse components of feed the pizza to the fat mouse are zero. And that tells us what the fat mouse components of P dagger, or feed the pizza dagger, feed the pizza adjoint operator are, when feed the pizza dagger is applied to the skinny mouse and the fat mouse. They've got to both be zero. So it doesn't make any difference if you feed the if you take the feed the pizza adjoint operator on the skinny mouse or the fat mouse, you don't get any fat mouse when you're done. Uh, so those are zero. Similarly, if you feed pizza to a skinny mouse, you do get a fat mouse. So that's a one. Feeding the pizza to a skinny mouse has no skinny mouse component because all you get is a fat mouse. There's no skinny mouse. <coughs> And then uh, looking at the definition of what P dagger means, you see that feeding the pizza adjoint to a fat mouse gives you a skinny mouse. Feeding the pizza adjoint to a skinny mouse does not give you any skinny mouse component. That tells us right away what P dagger is. So I'm not, I didn't tell you what P dagger was. I'd simply worked out what it had to be based on the definitions of P, what P did to the basis vectors. And you can see P dagger looks like it's the transpose of P. Notice what it does if you hit P dagger on a skinny mouse, you get no mouse at all. If you hit P dagger on a fat mouse, you get a skinny mouse. So P dagger is kind of like a starvation operator. If you starve a skinny mouse, you get a dead mouse. If you starve a fat mouse, you get a skinny mouse. So P and P dagger are not observables. They're not Hermitian. They are not unitary. Um, but they are adjoints of one another. So that's just a little uh, more experience with operators and how you deal with them. But let's go back to uh, L plus and L minus. Now what do we know about L plus and L minus? Let's, let's pick a basis for our three state system, 1, 1, 1, 0, and 1, minus 1. We'll make 1, 1, <coughs> we'll make 1, 1, the 1, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 1, 0, and 1 minus 1, 0, 0, 1. So those are our three basis vectors for the L equals 1 subspace of sort of angular momentum space, I guess, if you want to think about that. And we know what L plus and L minus do. If you apply L plus to the 1 minus 1 state, 
you get the one zero state multiplied by this uh, factor out in front which I went ahead and computed here it turns out to be h bar times the square root of 2 in this case and L plus acting on 1 0 again gives you h bar times the square root of 2 but this time it's times 1 1 notice the M went up by 1 the L stayed the same and finally if you apply L plus to 1 1 if you calculate the coefficient out in front it's a 0 so you get nothing but with the same sort of plan that we used to find the matrix representation of the pizza operator, we can now just write down the matrix representation of L+. Plus. It's got to be this. If you apply L plus to 1, 1, you get nothing. If you apply it to 1, 0, you get the square root of 2 h bar times 1, 1. And if you apply it to 1 minus 1, you get the square root of 2h bar times 1, 0. And that's exactly what that matrix says. Uh, similarly, you can get L minus, or you can just notice that L minus is the adjoint of L plus, and you can get the just take the transpose of the darn thing, and that turns out to be L minus. But what good are L plus and L minus? Well, L plus and L minus are good for the following reason. We know that L plus and L minus are defined in terms of LX and LY. So I can write LX as the sum of L plus and L minus divided by 2. And that's also got to be true of the matrix representation of LX. So what this allows us to do is to write down a matrix representation for the X component of L and the Y component of L. Now notice our basis is the z component of L basis. In other words, 1, 0, 0 is LZ is plus 1, 1, 0, 1 is LZ is minus 1, and 0, 0, 1 is LZ is um, minus 1. And what this tells us is that if you apply LX to the LZ is plus 1 state, what you get is the LZ is 0 state times uh, h bar over the square root of 2. So that gives you a sense of what the thing does. If you apply Lx to the Lz is 0 state, you get a superposition of Lz is plus 1 and Lz is minus 1, and so on. So that tells you what the Lx operator actually does to the basis kets in the Lz basis. Um, and similarly, you can work out the Ly matrix. Um, what I want to do now is to think about what happens if I compute the eigenvalues and eigenvectors of LX. Let's just focus on LX. It turns out, um, well, in fact, for both LX and LY, the eigenvalues turn out to be h bar, 0, and minus h bar. In other words, no matter which axis you choose, LX, LY, or LZ, you get the same eigenvalues. If you measure the angular momentum of a state where the total angular momentum is, has one unit, when little l is 1, the only thing you're going to get for any component of the angular momentum is h bar, 0, and minus h bar, no matter what axis you pick. But the eigenvectors are, in fact, different. The eigenvectors for Lx turn out to be uh, these guys. And you can see, and you can do this by simply applying the formula, applying the strategy for finding eigenvectors and eigenvalues to those matrices. Um, Lx is plus h bar, has an eigenvector 1 half, 1 over the square root of 2, 1 half. And Lx is minus h bar, is 1 half minus 1 over the square root of 2, 1 half. And Lx equals 0 is plus 1 over the square root of 2 and minus 1 over the square root of 2. These are all, these are normalized eigenvectors. What I want to emphasize is that uh, each of these eigenvectors represent states with a well-defined value of the Lx component. But you can see that they're all superpositions of different components of Lz. So that means that if you have a well-defined value of Lx, let's say you're in the Lx is plus h bar state, then you've got a 25% chance, if you measured Lz when the thing was in that state, you'd have a 25% chance of getting plus 1, a 25% chance of getting minus 1, and a 50% chance of getting 0. So it's not a state of well-defined Lz. And neither are the other two states of well-defined LX. And the situation is analogous, similar, if you, uh, if you do the same thing with LY. There are three eigenvectors for LY, 
and uh, they are superpositions of states of well-defined LZ. So it's kind of fascinating. I, I need you to think about that a little bit, ask questions, but uh, it's a fairly subtle thing, but it, it's important that you understand the basic idea. So that's all there is. I basically just wrote that out. States of well-defined angular momentum about the x and y axis can be expressed as superpositions of states with well-defined angular momentum about the z axis. Now what I want to do now is to go back to the visualization stuff and actually see what one of these states, which is a superposition of states of well-defined LZ, looks like in the context of the hydrogen atom. So let's do that and then we'll be done. Finally, this is what we get if you, uh, let's go, let's look at the code. This is the setup for uh, the superposition of a little bit of m equals plus one, a little bit of m equals zero, a little bit of m equals minus one. It's a half unit of minus one, one over the square root of two units of zero, and a half unit of plus one. If you go back to the video, you'll notice uh, looking straight down the z-axis, it looks like a blob of color. So this is some kind of crazy combination of plus one, minus one, and zero. But watch what happens when we rotate the thing to show the x-axis. Along the x-axis, it's got, it looks just like the m equals plus one state did along the z-axis. Let me run that in real time or run it as a video and you can see what that looks like. There it is. There it is around the x-axis and it looks just like it the m equals plus one state did around the z-axis but now it's going around the x-axis. This is a state of well-defined L sub x. It's L sub x equals plus one. You could do the same thing for L sub x equals minus one or L sub x equals zero uh, and it would look just like it does in the case of the uh, of the L sub Z equals plus one, minus one, and zero, except it would be about the X axis instead of about the Z axis. So think about that. That's pretty crazy. Talk to you soon. Hey guys, welcome back. It's time for lesson 34. We're going to talk about spin, which is kind of another angular momentum. But before we get into spin, I want to do a little math. I want you to look at this binomial expansion of one plus X divided by N to the power n. If you expand that out, you'll notice that an interesting thing happens. Um, n factorial divided by n minus m factorial is just n times n minus 1 times n minus 2 down to n minus m plus 1. So it's m terms uh, with n, n times n minus 1 times n minus 2 and so on. If you let n become large, so we're going to let the n value be, be a very large value, and we're going to have a finite value of x. So if n gets large, this x divided by n becomes very small. So that means only a small number of terms in this sum is actually going to contribute significantly. So we only have to look at m values that are very small compared to n, as n becomes very large. Now, in that limit, if you look at the thing, you'll notice that n factorial divided by n minus m factorial is very nearly n to the mth power. So the ratio of those two things approaches 1 as n becomes large. And as n becomes large, notice that smaller and smaller values of m become important. So then you take the limit as n approaches infinity and you get the following result, that the, uh, that the sum reduces to what looks like a Taylor series. So what we end up with is nothing other than the exponential. In other words, the Taylor series is just the uh, exponential function. Uh, what does that have to do with us? Well, I want to imagine that we can invent an operator that shifts the wave function to the right or the left. So let's call it a displacement operator. You, you build a displacement operator with a, the amount you want to displace the wave function. You apply the displacement operator to the wave function and you get out a shifted wave function that shifts to the right slightly. If the amount that it shifts to the right is small, then 
um, we can say that it's got to be 1 plus a little bit because if the amount of shift goes to 0, it needs to revert to the identity. And for small amounts of displacement, we want something proportional to delta x. And I'm just going to propose that a thing that would do that would be the derivative operator that just takes the derivative of the wave function, multiplies by delta x. And then, uh, of course, that's going to be the change in the wave function. If I add that back to the identity, I should get something that displaces the wave function. Another way to look at that is if you look at the definition of the derivative, it's psi of x plus delta x minus psi of x divided by delta x. If you solve that for psi of x plus delta x, you'll see that uh, you'd get 1 plus the derivative times delta x. Of course, we want the other. We want 1 minus the derivative times delta x to shift the wave function to the right. So that's the idea. Now here's the interesting thing. We already have an operator that looks like the derivative, and that's the momentum operator. So if I fiddle around algebraically, I can rewrite this displacement operator in terms of our given, our known, momentum operator. And sometimes you'll see in the literature, sometimes you'll see written that momentum is the generator of displacement. And this is the sense in which this statement is meant, that you can build a displacement operator using the momentum operator in exactly this way. Um, now, what if I want a finite displacement? What if I want a displacement that's actually not very tiny, but very big? How do I do it? Well, I could just apply the displacement operator many, many times. Well, what do I get if I do that? Well, I get the displacement operator raised to the capital N power, where each displacement is a finite size, A, divided by capital N. But notice that's exactly the situation we had in the math we did earlier. And so I don't have to go through all that again, but I can persuade you, I hope, that in fact, you can make a finite displacement using the exponential. So the exponential function comes into play if you want to do a finite displacement. Notice that this is looking a lot like the time evolution operator, e to the minus i Hamiltonian over h bar times t, but now we're not displacing in time, we're displacing in space. So instead of a Hamiltonian, I need to use momentum. Now, let's do an example. Let's say we have a wave function which is a pure value of k. Let's apply the momentum operator to that just to see what we get. You can see right away that you get h bar times k times the wave function back again. In other words, I happen to have chosen an eigenstate of the momentum operator. So I get it has an eigenvalue, h bar k. Now, what if I apply the displacement operator to that function? Well, because this function happens to be an eigenstate of momentum, I can just replace the momentum operator in the exponential with the momentum eigenvalue. The h bars cancel, and I get e to the minus i k a, a e to the plus i k x. If I multiply all that out, notice I've got the wave function, but it's shifted to the right by an amount a. So it certainly works for a momentum eigenstate. Does it work for any other wave function? Well, yeah, it has to, because I can always rewrite any wave function as a superposition of momentum eigenstates. In other words, I can do the Fourier transform. And each Fourier component is a momentum eigenstate, and each Fourier component is going to be shifted to the right. So if I shift all the Fourier components to the right, and then I inverse Fourier transform, I'll get back to the same wave function, except it'll be shifted to the right. It makes obvious sense. It has to be true. All right. So the same thing works out for rotations. In other words, instead of translating in space, now we're going to rotate an angle. But the same basic argument applies. I just use angular momentum instead of momentum. And instead of ddx, I've got dd phi, or dd theta. So if I want to rotate about the z-axis, I'd apply the momentum displacement operator, or the, uh, yeah, the, the I'm sorry, the phi displacement operator, the rotation operator, it's e to the minus lz over h bar times phi. And similarly, for rotations about the x-axis and the y-axis, I can play a similar game. So I can build a rotation operator about any axis by using the angular momentum operator 
that measures that uh, represents the component of angular momentum about that axis and uh, and that's all we need now we can move on to spin so electrons and protons have a spin of one half in principle other particles and there are other particles that have higher values of spin but uh, well, let's start with spin one half since that's the most important for us right now so you can deal with spin it it behaves much like angular momentum except now that instead of l being an integer 0 1 2 3 4 l can now take on half integer values and m can also take on half integer values going from negative l to plus l so if l equals a half there's only two values of m minus a half or plus a half that's the idea so uh, the operators operate the same way in orbital angular momentum we had L squared in spin we have S squared in orbital angular momentum we had L sub Z in spin we have S sub Z but it's the same basic idea so uh, with orbital angular momentum we had L plus and minus with spin angular momentum we have S plus and minus and they operate in exactly the same way S plus and minus applied to a ket gives you a ket with one less or one more unit of z component of angular momentum. Now, um, let's, there's only two different states, so we can easily work out all the details. If you apply s plus to a half plus a half, you get zero. If you apply s plus to a half minus a half, you get h bar times a half plus a half. If you apply s minus to a half minus a half, you get zero. And if you apply s minus to a half plus a half, you get h bar times a half minus a half. So those results can be summarized and uh, used to construct matrix representations of s plus and s minus. So if you think of the plus a half, one, a half a spin and a plus one half z component, let's call that z plus and a half unit of spin with minus a half z component, we'll call that z minus. And we can represent those as two vectors, a 1, 0, and a 0, 1. So our basis is z plus and z minus. This is simpler than the L equals 1 case with orbital angular momentum, where we had three basis vectors. Um, if you write out the matrix elements of s plus in that basis, you get the following result. Notice all it says is if you apply s plus to z plus, you get nothing. If you apply s plus to z minus, you get h bar times z plus. And similarly for s minus, if you apply s minus to z plus, you get h bar z minus. If you apply s minus to z minus, you get nothing. And why is this useful? It's useful because we can use it to build to construct the matrices to represent SX and SY because SX is just going to be the sum of the raising and lowering operator divided by 2 and SY is the difference divided by 2i and if you put all that in you get these two matrices the uh, the interesting thing is that these matrices have eigenvalues and eigenvectors which we can solve for using the traditional approach for finding eigenvectors and eigenvalues. I won't bore you with the process. You can easily do it yourself on the back of a napkin or something. Um, but the eigenvalues turn out to be h bar over 2 and minus h bar over 2. Um, that makes sense because the z component of spin only had h bar over 2 and minus h bar over 2 as eigenvalues. And so the x and y components must have the same eigenvalues since Nature doesn't know the difference between x, y, and z. But an interesting part is the eigenvectors x plus, x minus, y plus, and y minus. Notice that each of these guys can be represented as superpositions of our z component basis. So it's just like spin angular momentum or uh, orbital angular momentum. Any angular momentum. Uh, eigenstate of value uh, with an angular momentum eigenvalue of L can be represented as a superposition of eigenstates of well-defined Z component of angular momentum. And uh, we'll see here in a moment uh, that we can actually show a spin angular momentum eigenstate that points in any direction in space. We're going to go back to those rotation operators we cooked up earlier if we start with a state that points in the positive z direction and then rotate it 
we can make a state that points in any direction. So first, let's rotate this state that points in the z direction. Let's rotate it about the y-axis. That means we're going to rotate it in the xz plane, and it will get a theta value. So we'll just, multi we'll just rotate about the positive y-axis by an angle theta, and we'll get a vector that's in the xz plane at an angle theta from the positive z-axis. Then we can rotate it in phi about the z-axis, and we can make a vector that points in any direction that's allowed. So um, let's do that. We'll just write down the uh, rotation operators. Of course, since these are states of spin, we need to use spin angular momentum to do the rotation. Uh, first, we rotate in y. Now remember, when we use the time evolution operator, what basis do we have to use to apply the time evolution operator? We had to write the state in the energy basis. Well, now we're going to rotate about the y-axis. So we need to write the z plus state in the y basis. What's the y basis? It's uh, y plus plus y minus over the square root of 2. That's the eigenvector. That's the that's the value of z plus when expressed using eigenvectors of <coughs> of y component of spin. If you go back to the eigenvector slide, you'll see that uh, z plus is equal to y plus plus y minus over the square root of 2. Now applying the spin operator is easy. y plus has a spin of plus h bar over 2, y minus has a spin of minus h bar over 2 in the y direction. So we can plug that in and we get e to the um, minus i theta over 2 times y plus plus e to the plus i theta over 2 times y minus. Now we want to apply the z component of spin operator, but the only way to do that is to rewrite y plus and y minus using the z basis. But those vectors, again, are defined back on the eigenvector page. You'll notice that uh, y plus is z plus plus i z minus, y minus is z plus minus i z minus, if we plug all that in, uh, f factor out the common terms, z plus and z minus, you'll see that uh, what we end up with is an expression that now just depends on theta and phi. Uh, one other point, you can multiply any state by a phase factor, and it doesn't change the state. It doesn't change any physical consequences. So it makes sense to multiply by e to the i phi over 2, that gets rid of the first phase out in front and doubles the second phase. So in the end, we can express any spin state pointing in any direction in space in the z basis using uh, sine, cosine, and the complex exponential to adjust the magnitudes and phases of these two spin states. Uh, we're going to find this very useful when we get to talking about uh, teleportation and uh, entanglement and Bell's theorem and so on. We're going to use these exact states. So I want to point out that you can apply this exact same idea to the L equals 1 states we talked about last time and uh, you get the following result. This is the expression you deduce if you did the same rotation with the three components of L equals 1 spin uh, pointing in any direction in space. And you'll notice just as a check if you set phi equal to 0 and theta equal to um, pi over 2, that you get exactly the result we were using. In other words, the cosines go to 0, the sine goes to 1, and you get 1 half z plus, plus 1 over the square root of 2z0, plus 1 half z minus, which is exactly the way we built the state that had um, a angular momentum of 1 about the x-axis. And uh, you can build any other state exactly the same way. All right, have a good one. Hey folks, welcome to lesson 36. I'm, uh, we've got two main things we have to do today. We have to learn how to add angular momenta. We have to learn about singlet states. And uh, we have to learn a little bit about reality. So, okay, let's get started. Suppose we have two spin one-half particles, and we want to know what the total spin of the system is, given that we have that the system is composed of two spin one half particles. Now, you can think of two spin one half particles as having four possible combinations. They can both be spin up. You can have particle one spin up, particle two spin down, particle 
one spin down, particle two spin up, or they can both be spin down. Now I want to be clear about what I mean by this notation. When I say both particles are spin up, I mean what we have is one particle which has a spin of a half with its m value plus a half, and the other particle, which is also spin a half, has its m value plus a half. That x with a circle around it is uh, sometimes called the direct product operator. It just means that there are two particles and that any given state is a combination of the state of the two particles. So we'll see how that works out here in a minute. Uh, if you look at the down down <coughs> at the down down state, clearly uh, when you add two spin one halves together, both pointing down, you're going to get a spin of one and a z component of minus one. So if you, if both spin one halves have a z component of minus a half, the total spin has to be minus one. The question is, uh, what happens when you look at the other spin states? How do those fit into the picture? of a particle with a total spin of 1. And, and just to be clear, when I say um, the, uh, the spin is 1, I mean I have a particle with a spin of 1, a, a system with a spin of 1, and a z component of spin of minus 1. And we're thinking of that as a direct product of two spin 1 half particles, each of which has their z component of spin pointing down. That's the idea. So the question is, um, Oh, and the shorthand, look at that complicated business. The shorthand for that is 1 minus 1, s is 1, m is minus 1, is the same thing as two spin 1 half particles with their spins pointing down. So there's two different notations going on. There's the sm notation, and then there's the spin of particle 1, spin of particle 2 notation. I'll try to be clear about those two different notations, and when I have to be explicit, I'll try to break it out and make it very explicit. You can think of this state, the two spin down states, as kind of like uh, a downward pointing cone with two spin one half particles pointing down, making a spin one system with the spin pointing down. How do we figure out what the next state is, the state with spin of one and z component of spin of zero? Uh, the easiest way to do that is to apply the s plus operator. You already know what happens when you apply the s plus operator to a particle, to a system with a spin of 1, you get a system with a spin of 1 with a z component of spin of 0 instead of minus 1. And there's a factor out in front that's determined by the values of s and m, and that factor in this case works out to be h bar times the square root of 2. But notice I can also apply the s plus operator uh, <coughs> as the sum of the s plus operator acting on the first spin and the s plus operator acting on the second spin. In other words, I can look at the individual s plus operators that act on the individual spin one half particles and see what that gets me. If I do that, you can work it out. It turns out uh, the s plus one operator flips the spin of the first spin. Uh, spin one half particle and does nothing to the second spin, the down spin of the second particle. And the s plus two, the one that acts on the second particle, flips the spin of the second particle but does nothing to the spin of the first particle. And that's the way it works. You end up with a state that looks like up down plus down up. And there's a multiple of h bar. But these two states must in fact be the same state because I applied s plus to the down down state to the one minus one state it's the same state, I must have the same state. So if I set those two equal to each other, I get the following result. That 1, 0 is in fact nothing other than up, down, plus down, up over the square root of 2. And that is in fact correct. That state, you could think of it as kind of a jackknife state where the two spins add and uh, you get a z component of spin of 0, but the total spin is 1. Okay. And finally, what happens if I apply s plus to this state again? Well, uh, as you can guess, I, the s plus increases the value of m from 0 to plus 1, and I get another factor of the square root of 2. But if you look at what happens when you apply s plus 1 plus s plus 2 to the superposition state, um, it turns out s plus 1 acting on the first state gives me nothing because s plus acting on up uh, gives you nothing. It can't go any higher than up.
But the second state gives me something. It gives me up, up. And the similar thing happens with the S2. I get up, up. And when the whole thing is done, I end up with the square root of 2 times up, up. And that means that up, up must be the same thing as 1, 1. So what we found is that there's another state, a state with uh, S equals 1, where both the spins are pointing up. So the only kind of goofy state is the state in the middle, the m equals 0 state, that has to be a superposition of up, down, and down, up. And you might have noticed we've actually left the state out here. But let's summarize what we've discovered. We found a triplet of three states, which is appropriate for a spin of one, uh, a down, down, a superposition of up, down, and down, up, and an up, up. And those correspond to s equals 1, m equals minus 1, s equals 1, m equals 0, s equals 1, m equals plus 1. Now there is a state we've left out. There's another combination of up, down, and down, up that's orthogonal to this one. And that one turns out to be up, down, minus down, up, the anti-symmetric combination of up and down. And uh, Griffiths does a nice job of showing that that is a singlet. That's a state with no angular momentum and with no z component of angular momentum. What I'm going to have you guys do on the board today is to express that singlet state in the x basis. It turns out in the x basis, it also looks like up, down, minus, down, up, except it's up in the x direction for the first particle and down in the x direction for the second particle, minus down in the x direction for the first particle and up in the x direction for the second particle. And in fact, it turns out that it's the same expression for the singlet in any basis. You can pick any direction you like as your basis and you'll get up, down, minus, down, up along that direction for the singlet state. So the singlet state is uh, kind of special in the sense that it has exactly the same form in every basis. Not true of the triplet state. The triplet state, um, if you have a particle that's down, down in the z basis, it won't be down, down in the x basis or the y basis. It'll be some superposition of down, down, and up, up, and down, up, and up, down. <coughs> All right, so the singlet looks very special. It's isotropic. It looks the same from every direction, and that's the reason we're interested in it. Both the 0, 0 and the 1, 0 state are also special states. They're called entangled states. That is, the up and the down state are entangled. Uh, they're inherent superpositions. You can't, you can't rewrite them as anything but a superposition state. So they're, uh, they're useful for problems that involve what's called entanglement. Um, here's an idea. What if you start with a particle in the singlet state and ask what's the amplitude of measuring a particle in some specific direction? For example, let's say we want to measure particle 1 in some specific direction given that we're starting out in the singlet state. Uh, let's look at what happens. If I measure particle 1, if I calculate the amplitude of finding particle 1 in a particular direction, I can simply hit that singlet state with the bra that refers to that particular direction. So I rewrite our arbitrary direction uh, spin state uh, as a bra, which means I have to use e to the minus i phi 1, multiply that all out, and look what I get. I get uh, 1 over the square root of 2, cosine theta over 2 with the second particle pointing down, minus e to the minus i phi 1 times the sine of theta two over 2, with particle 2 pointing up. So I haven't really got a total amplitude because I've only actually calculated the amplitude for measuring particle 1. I've left particle 2 free. But notice that um, the amplitude of particle 2 being up or down now depends on theta and phi. The theta and phi along which I measured the direction of the spin of particle 1. I want to rewrite this a little bit. I'm going to factor out um, the a complex exponential, I want to change it so that the the amplitude of particle 2 being up is real. Remember I can multiply the whole thing by a phase and I will still have the same uh, quantum state. So I'm going to multiply by e to the plus i phi 1. Actually I'm going to multiply by minus e to the plus i phi 1. That'll get rid of the minus sign and get rid of the phase. And I also want to notice something. Um, the cosine of theta over 2 is the same thing as the sine 
of pi minus theta over 2, and the sine of pi minus of theta over 2 is the cosine of pi minus theta over 2. So I want to rewrite that state using the cosine of pi minus theta over 2 times particle 2 being up, and the sine of pi minus theta over 2 times the particle 2 being down. And I want you to notice that uh, this looks kind of interesting. This looks like the state where particle 2 is has its spin pointing in the pi minus theta direction and, ha and in the phi 1 plus pi direction. But if you think about it, you'll realize that that means its spin is pointing in exactly the opposite direction of the direction in which we measured particle 1. So the consequence of that is if you measure particle 1 pointing in a direction, particle 2 will automatically be pointing in exactly the opposite direction. Now you may be wondering about that 1 over the square root of 2 in front. That just refers to the fact that we measured the uh, s particle 1 being spin up in a particular direction and the probability of that happening turns out to be a half. If you pick a random direction in space and measure the spin of either of the particles in a singlet state in that direction, half of the time it'll be spin up and half of the time it'll be spin down. That's just a feature of the singlet, sp singlet state. But what we found is that if you do make that measurement, the other particle will definitely be pointing in the opposite direction. So that is a fascinating result and that is a result that uh, we're going to take advantage of. This process we've used actually is a generic process. Um, it turns out you can express any uh, superposition of two spins, a combination of two spins, um, in a similar way. Uh, if J1 and J2 are the spins of the two particles with uh, Z components M1 and M2, and you want to know what the total angular momentum and the, to and the total Z component is, you can call that capital J and capital M. You can, you can use the fact that the uh, individual spin states must form a complete set to form an identity operator. You stick that identity operator in, and you see that you can write the superposition state, or the total angular momentum state, as a superposition of the individual spin states of the two particles. The coefficients that get calculated in that case, the inner product between J1, J2, M1, M2, and capital J and capital M, are called Klepsch-Gordon coefficients. So, and just to be clear, little j1, little j2 are the spins of the individual particles making up the combination. Little m1, little m2 are their z components. Capital J is the total angular momentum added together, and capital M is the z component of the total angular momentum added together. And uh, so that's the way that works. There, uh, you can see that we've actually done this because we've written 0, 0 as a superposition of up, down, and down, up. But up, down, and down, up are nothing other than J1 is a half, J2 is a half, M1 is plus a half, M2 is minus a half, and J1 is plus a half, J2 is plus a half, J M1 is minus a half, and M2 is plus a half. So uh, what we actually discovered was that the one Klepsch-Gordon coefficient was plus 1 over the square root of 2, the other Klepsch-Gordon coefficient was minus 1 over the square root of 2. If you look in the book or you look online, you can find tables of these things. This is a one page out of a very large table of Klepsch-Gordon coefficients. It looks pretty intimidating. I want to point out that, in fact, uh, we found a couple of elements out of this uh, one example, and the elements look like this. The uh, Klepsch-Gordon coefficient we found was plus 1 over the square root of 2 and minus 1 over the square root of 2. Uh, if you look at the table, the values of little j and little m and big J and big M are all listed in the table. So once you learn how to find where things fit in, they're not too bad. Now, honestly, we're not going to do very much with these guys, but I just wanted to point out that they exist and that you can add any two angular momenta together and these tables of Klepsch-Gordon coefficients will tell you the magic combinations that it takes to form a, a total angular momentum out of individual uh, angular momenta. Okay, now let's move on from that uh, and let's talk about logic. Okay, 
Uh, why am I talking about logic? Because it turns out entanglement produces some situations in which ordinary classical logic seems to fail. So you guys have all seen Venn diagrams. Let's say we had uh, situation A, situation B, and situation C, and a collection of events, some of which, some of which f uh, have A true, some of which have B true, some of which have C true, and some of which have combinations of A, B, and C all being true. Now, uh, there's a statement that you can make in, lo in classical logic that is going to be very obvious, obviously true, uh, and involves A, B, and C. So first, let's consider the situation A and not B. Of all the events that I've drawn there, which ones have the property A and not the property B? Well, clearly, it's these ones here, the ones that fall in the A circle but don't also fall in the B circle. And there's a similar bit of logic if you want to consider B and not C. So which ones fall in B but not C? It's got to be these ones, the ones that aren't in A, that aren't in uh, C but are in B. And finally, what about A and not C? Those ones are these guys. They're inside the circle A, but they're excluded from the circle C. Okay? Now, if you think about these, uh, I, you can make a clear and obvious statement that if, if A and not B uh, is added to B and not C, then if you take all the events that have the property A but not the property B, and you add to them all the events that have the property B and not the property C, it's got to be greater than or equal to those that have the property A and not the property C. In other words, these events added to these events are always going to be greater in number than these events. And you can see that uh, the events on the right are all included on the left, but in addition, you have uh, some events that uh, aren't included on the right. So that means that the uh, sum of those two guys has to be greater. That's the idea. So, um, and that's basically the statement. You can see that there's some that are in B uh, but aren't in A, and some that are in C that aren't in A that are included on the left that are not included on the right. That's, uh, that's basically the idea. Now, let's imagine we have two particles that are entangled in a singlet, and we do an experiment where one of the particles moves off to the right and the other particle moves off to the left. Maybe a hydrogen atom decays or something, <coughs> or falls apart for some reason. Um, we're going to let situation A be that particle 1 is spin up in the zero degree direction. Situation B is going to be particle 1 is spin up at 45 degrees. And situation C is going to be that particle 1 is spin up at 90 degrees. In other words, if we have an apparatus, a Stieringer lock or something, that can measure spin, we can dial it to 0, 45, or 90 degrees. And the situation A, B, and C is that particle 1 is got its spin up in one of those three directions. Okay. Now, what about not A? Well, not A means particle 1 is spin down in the 0 degree direction. But because the particles are entangled, if particle A is spin down in the zero degree direction, then particle two, particle one, I should say, is spin down in the zero degree direction, then particle two will be spin up. So not A is that particle two is spin up at zero degrees. Not B is that particle two is spin up at 45 degrees. Not C is that particle two is spin up at 90 degrees. So you see, if you make a statement about particle two, it's the not of particle 1 if particle 1 and particle 2 are entangled with one another. So you can think of A and not B is that particle 1 is at 0 degrees and particle 2 is at 45 degrees. And B and not C is particle 1 is at 45 degrees and particle 2 is at 90 degrees. And A and not C is particle 1 is at 0 degrees and particle 2 is at 90 degrees. That's what those guys mean. Now, quantum mechanically, we can calculate the amplitude that we have A and not B. First of all, the condition A and not B is that particle 1 is at 0, particle 2 is at 45. So we can use our s generic state vector that we worked out before to figure out what the amplitude or what the 
quantum state would be for that situation to exist. We know that the initial state is the singlet state of particle 1 and particle 2, and we can simply compute what's the amplitude, of particle 1 being at 0, particle 2 being at 45, given that they start out in this singlet state. I want you to notice that particle 1 only interacts with the first term in the singlet state because it's got its spin pointing up, and in that term, particle 2 is pointing down, and so only the particle 2 pointing down part of the generic 45 degree angle state counts. And so when the smoke clears, it's quite easy. The amplitude is simply the sine of 45 divided by 2 divided by the square root of 2. You calculate that number, you get about 0.271. Now, what about the next one? What about B and not C? That means particle 1 is at 45, particle 2 is at 90. But notice, it's only the relative angle between the two that counts. So we, we could actually work this out, um, but we don't really need to, because we know it's got to be the same result, because we could simply shift our z-axis to point along particle 1, and then particle 2 would be at 45 degrees again, and we'd have to get the same result. So it, you can do it if you want to, but trust me, it works out to be the same. Um, now what about A and not C? That means that particle 1 is pointing up, particle 2 is pointing at 90 degrees. That's also straightforward to compute. Um, and we have the same basic situation, except now it's the sine of 90 over 2. Of course, 90 over 2 is 45, and the sine of 45 is square root of 2 over 2. And so when you work that out, you get an amplitude of exactly a half. So let's go back and check our logic and see how it turns out. A and not B, B and not C, the amplitude for those events was 0.271. I just have to square that to get a probability. And uh, each of them has the same probability, so I multiply by 2. And I get about 14.7, almost 15% is the probability of those two things taken together. So if I actually did the experiment, I'd have a bunch of events. I could measure event A, I can measure event uh, I can measure events that correspond to A and not B, events that correspond to B and not C, and if I added up all those events, about 15% of the time, one of these two conditions would be satisfied. Then the other thing I could do is check for A and not C. If I did that, though, I'd find that 25% of the time that condition would be satisfied. And if you notice, 25% is bigger than 15% by about 10%. So I would have a uh, violation of simple classical logic of about a 10% effect. And if I do it long enough, then I can be uh, very sure that this is a real effect. And it had this experiment has essentially been done, and it's been shown that the quantum mechanical result is correct, and the uh, classical logic turns out to be wrong. There's another way to look at this. It's called Merman's Reality Machine. This was an invention of David Merman. Um, a similar situation, you have uh, two entangled particles in a singlet state, and you send them through a machine. The machine has, it's basically three, uh, it's a steering gear lock apparatus with three switch settings, up 120 degrees to the right and 120 degrees to the left. And then on the other side of the experiment, you have an oppositely configured uh, machine that's got its uh, switch settings so that the steering gear lock is pointing down, 120 degrees clockwise and 120 degrees counterclockwise from that. And you'll notice that because of the orientation of these guys, um, if a particle goes through the left Sternger lock and goes up, the particle going through the right Sternger lock will definitely be pointing down. And so if the switch settings are both set to 1, both machines will measure, yes, the particle is pointing in that direction with 100% probability. Now, the way the machine works is if if the switch setting is pointing up and the particle goes through and has its spin measured pointing up, it flashes a green light. If the switch setting is pointing down and the particle goes through and measures a spin pointing down, it flashes a green light. On the other hand, if the switch setting is up and the particle goes through and it doesn't measure its spin in the up direction, the red light will flash. Okay, That's the way the thing works. And you'll notice that because of the orientation of the different switch settings, if both machines are set to 1, uh, both lights will either flash green or both lights will flash red. In other words, if particle, 
the particle goes through stern girl lock one and it's measured with its spin going up the other particle will definitely have its spin going down and it will definitely flash green if the uh, particle one goes through the stern girl lock and it doesn't measure its spin pointing up that means it spins pointing down that means the other particle will definitely have its spin pointing up and both lights will flash red so the, the rule is that if the switch settings are the same both lights will always flash the same color now if you only look at one machine 50% of the time it'll flash green and 50% of the time it'll flash red and that's a simple consequence of the fact that if you if you only measure one of the spins and you only care about one of the spins it'll be a likely, equally likely to be spin up or spin down and that's always true no matter what but if you have the switch settings on a different setting in reality uh, well actually we'll work out the the math of how it turns out but quantum mechanically it turns out only a quarter of the time will they end up with the same color and three quarters of the time they'll have different color now what Merman realized is that you could imagine a classical model of this situation in which the particles have some kind of gene some kind of embedded hidden information that nobody knows about in fact Einstein was a big fan of this hidden information he felt that quantum mechanics wasn't complete that there must be some hidden uh, genetic code or some hidden gears and wheels that we didn't know about yet that if we only could figure out what the hidden gears were we could predict the results of experiments um, exactly and it would be a complete theory that would tell us exactly what was going on inside and we could figure out uh, what was happening um, so Merman said well look what if embedded in these particles when they're born they have some kind of DNA and the DNA is shared by both of the particles and what the DNA tells us is what color the things gonna flash when the switch settings have certain values so for example there are eight combinations of red green and blue that are possible so if we had a particle with the gene GGG that would mean that no matter what the switch settings were um, you would always measure green uh, but if you had GGR it would be switch setting one would be green switch setting two would be green switch setting three would be red notice what this does um, if the switch settings are the same you always get the same color that's consistent with the quantum mechanical model um, also it has the property that uh, if you just no matter what the switch settings are if you look at only one uh, reality machine you always get 50 percent green and 50 percent red because all these combinations if you only look at one switch setting there's half green and half red in each column of this uh, this set of genes however if you have different switch settings according to this plan um, half of the time the color will be the same and half of the time the color will be different in other words this this uh, model this classical model fails to predict the quantum mechanical result that when the switch settings are different only 25 percent of the time do the colors flash the same and 75 percent of they they flash different now you can work out a genetic code that has the property that when the switch settings are different the the uh, thing turns out to be 25 percent the same and 20 and 75 percent different the bad news is when you go back to having the switch settings the same it won't predict what we see in nature which is that the colors are always the same and um, the individual uh, probabilities on any one machine are always 50% green and 50% red so there's no classical uh, model that produces the uh, quantum results so according to this plan it correctly does the same switch positions but it doesn't correctly get the different switch positions if you make it work for the different positions it fails to correctly predict the same switch positions so that's the uh, that's the main point of both of those guys we will uh, we'll try to reproduce some of these results on the board today I hope you guys made some sense out of all that and we'll see you next time welcome back guys it's lesson 37 we're discussing quantum teleportation or at least that's the punchline we actually have a lot of things to talk about today 
The first is the remaining schedule for the semester. I wanted to remind you that on Lesson 39, we're going to be taking the QMAT. It's sort of a diagnostic exam about quantum mechanical concepts, and that should help us uh, get ready for the final exam. We're going to be talking about the final graded review, uh, the themes that will be assessed in the final exam, and so that'll take a little bit of time. And finally, we're going to end it up with the discussion of teleportation. We're going to need to hit a couple of concepts before that, but uh, mostly that's what we're going to be doing. So let's talk about the themes for the, for the final. We're going to need to understand wave functions, probability distributions, time-independent Schrodinger equation solutions, the concept of commutation and the impact it has on our interpretation of uh, the wave function and various observables, the notion of time evolution of quantum states. We've, this has been a major theme for the entire semester, so I hope everybody can basically nail the time evolution aspect. And finally, we're going to focus a little bit on measurement, how measurement works, what does it mean, how do different observables behave when you measure various other observables, and so on. And finally, we're going to uh, have a section on the 3D quantum wave functions, angular momentum, spin, and all that stuff. So let's, uh, let's start talking about measurement. For a given observer, for a given observable, excuse me, what values are possible? The answer is the eigenvalues of the operator that represents that observable are the only things you'll ever measure for that observable. Um, what probability, with what probability will you measure these observables? The answer is at any given moment, the probability of measuring any particular eigenvalue is the amplitude of that eigenvector in the overall quantum state. So you project out the eigenvector of that observable <coughs> that corresponds to a particular eigenvalue, and the amplitude of that projection is going to be the uh, going to determine the probability. The probability, of course, is the amplitude squared. And uh, finally, after the measurement is complete, what state will the system be in? And the answer is it will be in the eigenstate that corresponds to the eigenvector that corresponds to the eigenvalue that was actually measured. At least that's the interpretation we're going with in this course. There's a lot of different people who have different ideas about how measurement actually works and what it all means, but this is the most straightforward traditional interpretation of how measurement goes. The idea of wave functions. First, uh, boundary conditions. You need to understand that if you have finite potentials everywhere, th that the wave function has to be both continuous and its first derivative has to be continuous everywhere. In particular, if you have a finite potential that changes values, it, the wave function has to remain continuous and its derivative has to remain continuous whenever the potential changes. Um, the boundary conditions often lead to particular energies that correspond to eigenvalues of the Hamiltonian. Uh, and also the notion that a generic quantum state is made up of, of a superposition of eigenvectors and uh, that that's often looked at in, with wave functions as a kind of a Fourier series, a superposition of different eigenfunctions in that case. The idea of probability distribution, the notion of normalization, the idea that uh, that the total probability of being anything has to be one, no matter what the state is. Uh, the, the idea of expectation values, so you uh, need to be able to compute various expectation values, position, momentum, energy, angular momentum, and so on. Uh, the different kinds of probability distributions we have, discrete and continuous, and uh, probability distributions that extend into more than one dimension, one, two, and three-dimensional probability density functions. Okay, so what about the time-independent Schrodinger equation? You need to be able to sketch solutions uh, to the Schrodinger equation with various potentials, understand the difference between discrete and continuous spectra, the way kinetic energy leads to curvature, or uh, the way when the potential is greater than the energy, you get these uh, real exponential solutions and how the curvature of those solutions depends on uh, how far the energy, how far the energy is below the potential energy, and also the concept of energy eigenvalues. Uh, the whole notion of separation of variables and how the eigenvalues come about in three dimensions due to the separation of the various spatial 
uh, coordinates in the system. And uh, finally, of course, all those one-dimensional systems we studied and the uh, higher dimensional systems we studied in, uh, in Chapter 4. So we've got the infinite square well, the simple harmonic oscillator, the finite square well, barriers, scattering, and so on. Uh, all that stuff. The concept of commutation, the idea that uh, observables that don't commute with one another are incompatible, observables that do commute with one another are compatible, and what that means about the eigenvectors that we use to represent these observables, eigenvectors of definite value of these observables, um, the notion that when the an observable commutes with the Hamiltonian, then its uh, expectation value is independent of time, and also that the eigenvectors of that observable um, will uh, conform a, a set of eigenvectors. Uh, uh, how would you call it? You can have a common set of eigenvectors of operators that commute with the Hamiltonian and the uh, energy eigenvectors. And that means that uh, basically if you have an operator that commutes with the Hamiltonian, its observables don't, it's, uh, the, the, oh golly, I can't even speak. The value of that observable doesn't depend on time. That's the idea. Um, ha having said that, the rate at which an observable changes in time depends on its commutator with the Hamiltonian. And actually, we'll get to that today. And finally, the eigenstates of the Hamiltonian are special. If you're in a Hamiltonian eigenstate, it's called a stationary state. And uh, a pure stationary state, of course, no observable is going to uh, depend on time with that one. The expectation value of any observable will not depend on time in an energy eigenstate. Okay, so uh, how does time evolution work? Of course, you need to know the time evolution operator, and you need to know the special significance that energy eigenstates have in terms of time evolution. The Fourier expansion in the energy basis is what gives us an easy way to apply the time evolution operator, and, uh, and the notion that other observables, uh, when you have a superposition of different energy eigenstates, they tend to slosh. And so what happens to other observables in, in, th in that case? So, uh, okay, so we also have this idea of higher dimensional systems and angular momentum and spin, and so the infinite square well in two and three dimensions, the, the spherical square well, and of course the hydrogen atom. And all the stuff that came along with those spherically symmetric potentials, orbital angular momentum, spin, and so forth. Okay, so that's a brief review of the topics that are going to be on the, uh, on the final exam. Let's talk a little bit about the time dependence of an observable. Let's say we have an observable that uh, we want to know what its expectation value does in time. Now, of course, the expectation value of an observable is the inner product of the wave function with what you get when you apply the operator to the wave function. And if you look at the product, if you look at that inner product, you'll notice it has three pieces. It's got the bra, it's got the operator, and it's got the ket. And in principle, all three of those things can depend on time. We're going to focus on those cases where the operator doesn't explicitly depend on time. In other words, there's no t in the operator itself. All the operators we deal with in this course uh, have that property, that there's no t actually embedded in the operator. And, and also remember that when the Hamiltonian hits the wave function, that produces something proportional to the time rate of change. And so what you can do is uh, solve for psi dot, and you can see that that's minus i Hamiltonian divided by h bar. And uh, we can use that to evaluate this thing. So psi dot is minus i Hamiltonian over h bar. I can plug that in. Uh, the bra, of course, the i becomes plus i instead of minus i. And so you plug all that in, and notice <coughs> that what you get there is the Hamiltonian hitting the operator minus the operator hitting the Hamiltonian. But that's nothing other than the commutator of the Hamiltonian with the operator. So this final result is quite simple that the time rate of change of the expectation value of an operator is proportional to the commutator of the operator with the Hamiltonian. So um, 
that says that if an operator commutes with the Hamiltonian, that its time rate of change is zero. And if it doesn't commute with the Hamiltonian, then it does have a time rate of change. That's the idea. So um, also, we're going to be talking about teleportation in a moment. And I just wanted to point out that there's a theorem. You know, one, one issue is, uh, well, heck, why would I need to teleport if I could just clone? Maybe I could clone a quantum state and then just carry it wherever I wanted to. And I'd have a copy of the quantum state wherever I wanted it. But there's this thing called the no cloning theorem. Let's see how it works. Remember how a linear operator operates. If you apply an operator to a superposition, it's the same as distributing the operator over the superposition and applying it to each of the individual states within the superposition. This is a property that all quantum mechanical operators possess. They are linear operators. And so if you imagine the possibility, let's just think of the theoretical possibility, that someone could invent a cloning operator, an operator that took a state of two particles, say, one in state phi and one in state psi, and it could somehow operate in such a way that when it was finished, you got two particles in the same state, phi. So this would effectively clone the quantum state phi and, a, and force the second particle into that state. Is it possible we could invent such a thing? Let's take a concrete example. Let's say we have a particle that's spin up and another particle that it's in some arbitrary state. And we could imagine an operator that if it, if it applied to the first if it applied to that in initial state, it would produce as an output a state where both particles were spin up, regardless of the condition of the first of the second particle initially. So it would it would wipe out the information associated with that particle initially and produce a particle that was spin up regardless. Similarly, if you had started with the first particle spin down and you applied this theoretical cloning operator, you'd end up with two spin down particles. Well, the question then is, what happens if you put in a particle that's got its spin oriented in some other direction? Say, for example, the x direction. So the plus x direction, remember, that's spin up plus spin down over the square root of 2. What would happen to the cloning if we cloned this state? Um, what would we get? Well, remember that the cloning operator um, operates is a linear operator. So if you apply it to a superposition state, that's the same thing as applying it to the first state plus applying it to the second state. So we haven't actually changed anything. We should be able to apply it in this way. And of course, that is going to turn out to be up, up, plus down, down. But that state is not the same as the state x plus x plus, which is the state we were trying to achieve by cloning the x plus state. Let's see why that is. x plus x plus would look like this. It's up plus down over the square root of 2 and up plus down over the square root of 2 for the two particles. But if I multiply that out, it actually looks like this. It's up, up, plus up, down, plus down, up, plus down, down. And it's divided by 2. But the state we got was up, up, plus down, down. We're missing the up, down, and down, up states in our cloned state. So what that means is the cloning operator can't work. It could work in principle for cloning the two particular states up and down, but it can't clone an arbitrary state. Uh, the linear operator machinery just won't permit that. So what that means is you, you've heard no can do. Well, the moral of this one is no can clone. Too bad. All right. Okay, well, oh, there was one other thing I wanted to talk about. It's the notion of a special class of unitary transformations that we're going to need in order to do the teleportation. Um, first, we need a mathematical theorem, which I'm just going to propose. We can talk about it in class and prove it if you're interested. But basically, the theorem goes like this. E to the i alpha times a sigma matrix, where the sigma matrices are the, the Pauli matrices, uh, sigma x, sigma y, and sigma z. They're a special class of matrices. But uh, the idea is that if you um, if you calculate e to the i alpha sigma j, what you get is cosine alpha times the identity plus i times the sine of alpha times the sigma j that you use. You can use any of the three sigma j's and, and this thing will work. The, uh, the point is that we can use this to, to build up essentially arbitrary 
transformations of spin one half particles. So let's let's see how this works. Imagine we have a spin one half particle in a magnetic field. Uh, we did this last week uh, on the board, essentially, and uh, the Hamiltonian is going to be minus b dot mu, but mu of course is gamma times s, the spin of the particle, and so if we put that Hamiltonian in and create a time evolution operator out of that Hamiltonian, um, what's the time evolution operator going to look like? It's going to be uh, e to the i gamma beta zero over two sigma z if the magnetic field's pointing in the z direction. Of course, if you had it in the x direction, you'd get a sigma x. If you had it in the y direction, you'd get a sigma y. But uh, we'll just work with sigma z for the moment. I want you to notice that this is exactly the same operator in the theorem, except that uh, the angle alpha is now gamma b0 t over 2. Okay, so we'll uh, plug all that in. That means that the time evolution operator reduces to this thing. It's a cosine of something times the identity plus i times the sine of something times sigma z. If I uh, continue to, to push on this a little bit, we can put in what sigma z actually is, and you can see that the time evolution operator becomes exactly what you'd expect it to be, um, except that uh, if you apply it to an arbitrary state, you get that the upspin gets multiplied by e to the plus gamma beta zero t over two, the down state gets multiplied by e to the minus gamma beta i gamma b0 t over 2. Uh, you can multiply through by the phase factor uh, e to the minus i gamma b0 t over 2 in order to make that first term real. And you'll see that what's happening is that uh, your generic state just gets its phi direction changed by an, a certain amount. And uh, that means that it, since the general state is written with just a e to the i phi on the down spin, that the phi coordinate simply spins around the z-axis. This is just Larmor precession, which we've already discussed. <clears throat> so I just wanted to point out you're familiar with this in one context, but if you happen to apply the uh, magnetic field for a period of time such that gamma beta zero t is equal to pi, Notice that the cosine term goes away completely, and that the sine becomes 1, and the time evolution operator for that short period of time becomes simply proportional to the uh, sigma operator. So what that means is you can physically realize uh, you can physically realize a situation in which the quantum state simply gets multiplied by a sigma operator um, by pointing a magnetic field in a particular direction and it is waiting for the appropriate amount of time. That's the idea. We're going to need this in just a little bit when we uh, finish the teleportation process. Okay, so here's the idea. We've got these things called Bell states and there are four of them. There's two of them and where the spins are different and there's two of them where the spins are the same. But you'll notice that they are completely entangled states where the two particles are entangled with one another. Neither of them has a definite spin. But if you measure the spin of one of them, it immediately affects the spin of the other. So for example, in the different states, if you measure the spin of one um, to be up, the spin of the other be, is definitely down. And in the same states, if you measure the spin of one, the other is the same direction of spin. So. Um, those are the so-called Bell states. I want to imagine we have two physicists, Alice and Bob, who are interested in teleporting a quantum state. Alice has a particle in the state phi. She has electron number one, and it's in the state phi where A and B are arbitrary complex numbers. Um, you could say that it's got a definite theta and a definite phi, um, but it's just a spin that points in some arbitrary direction. Okay. Now, in addition to that, Alice also has two electrons, electron two and electron three, that are in a singlet state. So they're in the Bell state D minus with each other. And, uh, 
and she's prepared these in advance. Now the basic plan is she's going to do a measurement on electrons one and two that will entangle them and detangle electron three. But before she does the experiment, she's going to carefully transport electron three or send it somehow to Bob. Or maybe Bob will come by someday and he'll pick up electron three, still entangled with electron two, and take it off with him someplace else in the world, to Switzerland or something. So Bob's got electron three, Alice has electron two, they are entangled with each other in a singlet state. And she also has this other electron, electron one, that's in a quantum state that she doesn't know what A and B are. She doesn't know what A and B are, but she wants that information about A and B to be teleported somehow magically to Bob. So the idea is um, the quantum state of electron one, two, and three is this product state, phi two, three. And uh, we can multiply all that out to figure out the complete state of the entire system. Electron one, electron two, and electron three are in this state. I'll call that state one, two, three. So Alice sends electron three to Bob, or Bob takes electron three with him. And then Alice measures the one, two system in the Bell basis. In other words, she has a machinery, some machinery, where she can send electrons one and two through the machinery and out will come the answer d plus d minus s plus or s minus notice that those four states span the entire possible spectrum of states that one and two can have so the combination of those particles has to be in one of those four states let's suppose for example she discovers that that uh, her pair of electrons one and two are in the bell state d minus D minus is this state, so she needs to calculate the inner product of D minus of particles one and two on the overall state. So we have the overall state here. It's the state one, two, three. She takes the inner product of D minus with that state. Well, D minus, notice it has electron one up and electron two down. So one question is, what's that inner product? Well, you can see that that inner product comes from only one term in the overall state, because there's only one term that has electron one up and electron two down. And so <coughs> the answer is quite easy. It's got to be minus a over the square root of three, or the square root of two. But there comes along for the ride the fact that if she measures that state, that puts electron three up. She also needs to calculate the inner product of electron one down, electron two up, that inner product, as you can see, is plus b over the square root of 2, but it has electron 3 pointing down. If you calculate the overall inner product of d minus, then you get minus a half times the state a with electron 3 up plus b with electron 3 down. That's the overall amplitude of her getting the d minus result for electrons 1 and 2. Um, what I want to point out is that the part that has electron 3 in it is exactly the state phi. So when she makes this measurement, miraculously, Bob's electron will suddenly be in the state phi, which she had at the outset. Now the one half out in front simply corresponds to the fact that there are four Bell states, and the probability of her measuring state d minus is one quarter. So you'd expect there to be an o a factor in the amplitude of uh, one half overall. Now, so now, what if instead of d minus, she had measured d plus? Now, d plus is the state um, one up, two down, plus one down, two up over the square root of two. Notice there's a plus instead of a minus. So this is not a singlet state. This is a, a s equals one m equals zero state, but um, I want to point out that uh, if she took this inner product, that the first electron, and with the first electron up, second electron down, would still only have an inner product with the third, or the second term, and the second part of d plus would only have an inner product with the third term, and when the smoke clears and you calculate everything, you get this as the inner product of d plus on one, two, three. So if she measures d plus, Bob's electron suddenly 
comes to a state, but it's not the state phi. It's the state a3 up minus b3 down. So in order to recover the state phi, Bob's going to have to do some work. In fact, what he's going to have to do is to multiply by sigma z. Notice, what does sigma z do? Sigma z uh, multiplies the up component by 1 and the down component by minus 1. So in order for him to know that that's what he's got to do, Alice is going to have to communicate with him. She's going to have to ring him up on the phone and say, hey, Bob, I measured D+. plus." That means you've got to run this system through a sigma z operator in order to make that happen. Of course, we just noticed that theorem that we showed a little bit earlier showed that all he has to do then is to put the spin in a magnetic field pointing in the z direction for a period of time so that the identity part of the time evolution operator became zero and the uh, non-identity part, the sign term, uh, became proportional to sigma z. That would have the effect of leaving a alone but multiplying b by minus one. Basically the phi in the spin would have to zip around to uh, um, to become a minus one. That's the idea. So, um, things to notice. In order to complete teleportation, Bob may have to perform a linear transformation on the resulting state. Uh, you can apl like apply applying a magnetic field for a short period of time. The original state that Alice had is gone. In the process of entangling, in the process of measuring uh, particles one and two together, she entangles particles one and two into a Bell state and in the process, she loses all information about what state particle one was in originally. The particle one state is gone, but it has magically reappeared in Bob's laboratory. And finally, it's necessary that Alice communicate with Bob in order to alert him to the fact that she measured one of the four Bell states. He needs to know which of the four Bell states the thing was in in Alice's lab in order to know what to do to the quantum state in his lab in order to get it to become the clone, or the uh, teleported version, I should say, of Alice's original state. Okay, so that's the way it works. Um, for the pre-flight today, I'm going to ask you to figure out what Bob would have to do if one of the other Bell states was discovered to be the correct one. And uh, that's kind of an interesting exercise, and hope you guys enjoy it. I'll talk to you soon. Hey guys, welcome back. <clears throat> it's lesson 38. This is the last official lesson of the semester. Remember, lesson 39 is going to be the final uh, diagnostic exam. It's called the QMAT. Um, I want you guys to try your best to perform well on that because I'm, I'm using that as a, uh, a gauge of how I'm doing. And in addition, uh, the harder you try, the better understanding you'll have of how you uh, how you're really doing in preparation for the final. Remember the final will have in addition to uh, detailed workout problems it will also have a significant uh, qualitative component, a multiple choice component that uh, will be based on the kinds of clicker questions and and the kinds of questions that will be asked on this uh, on this assessment so it should be a good gauge for you. All right today we're looking at quantum computing in order to understand quantum computing, we need to have this idea of a qubit. A qubit is a two-state system that, that sort of is analogous to a bit in a conventional classical computer. The uh, two-state system, you guys know, is a system that has two quantum states and, uh, in general, exists in some kind of a superposition state uh, with coefficients, uh, amplitudes for the two states, uh, A and B. Now, the thing is, A and B are not without restrictions. The sum of the magnitudes of A and B squared has to be 1. And also, uh, an overall phase doesn't matter, so that you could multiply A and B by a, the same phase factor, and it wouldn't affect the uh, actual physical consequences of being in a particular state. And that means that we can rewrite the state in terms of two real numbers, theta and phi. You'll recognize these as simply the 
the two real numbers that specify the direction of a spin one-half particle, the direction in which the spin is pointing in space, and uh, and so you can think of a two-state system as being a spin one-half particle. In other words, a spin one-half is sort of a canonical uh, model of how a two-state system goes. So if you have more than one qubit, then all of a sudden you have the possibility of more uh, coefficients, more combinations of um, spin up and spin down, or ground state and excited state, whatever whatever the states 0 and 1 are, they, they depend on the physical implementation of the qubit, but um, a, b, c, and d in general are arbitrary, except again the sum of the squared magnitudes has to be 1, because the o probability of being in one of those four possible states has to be 1, and also the overall phase of these guys doesn't matter. So for four uh, possible combinations here, there's only three relevant phases. So um, that means in this case there are going to be six real numbers instead of only two real numbers. And if you work it out, if you have uh, n qubits, it takes uh, 2 to the n plus 1 minus 2 real numbers to specify the quantum state. To give you an idea of, uh, of how that works, if I have, for example, my uh, laptop has 8 gigabytes of um, of RAM and if I want to specify the quantum state of an n qubit quantum computer uh, assuming that I use one floating point real, you know, IEEE floating point real number, a 4 byte number um, that means I get 2 uh, billion floating point numbers, it works out to be approximately a 30 qubit computer is the largest quantum computer I can simulate using all of the 8 gigabytes of RAM in my laptop. So that is a remarkably small number of qubits um, and you can see why if you had only uh, 40 qubits or 50 qubits it would be impossible to simulate the thing fully in any arbitrary quantum state uh, with even the most powerful supercomputer that's available today. So um, it's a different world when you're dealing with a quantum computer. Let's, let's talk about some quantum gates. So what is a one qubit gate? A one qubit gate is uh, a gate that takes a qubit and transfers it or transforms it into a new state. So it takes an old state and it transforms it to a new state. Um, you could think of that as a unitary transformation. Okay, it's a transformation that preserves probability. It's a transformation that uh, has a well-defined inverse, um, and uh, it turns out that, in, for all practical purposes, we can think of all the useful gates that we would like to build to make a quantum computer as essentially being uh, reducing to rotations. So you start with a qubit in one case, in one value of theta and phi, and it gets converted into a qubit with a different value of theta and phi, and therefore all of these uh, one qubit gates can be thought of as a simple rotation. For example, let's think of the not gate. A not gate is a gate that takes the zero state and makes it into the one state. It takes the one state and converts it to the zero state, and uh, that is a unitary transformation that looks like this. If in a vector representation, the uh, state, the generic state, is a column vector with a and b as the amplitudes, and it simply flips the amplitudes. Of course, that's nothing other than a rotation about the x-axis. That's our sigma x operator, which we're already familiar with from from before. So a not gate is simply a sigma x. Um, there's another extremely useful gate we're going to need for the uh, to, to understand the algorithm we're going to study today and that's the Hadamard gate. A Hadamard gate basically boils down to a 90 degree rotation about the y-axis. Uh, it simply corresponds, it, ta it takes the zero ket and converts it to zero plus one over the square root of two. It takes the one ket and converts it to zero minus one over the square root of two. It's quite easy. Um, Notice that if uh, if you think of 0 and 1 as being spin up and spin down, that these look like plus x and minus x. So these are, uh, all you're doing is taking a spin up or a spin down and converting it into plus x 
and minus x spin in the spin one half world. The final gate that might be useful is an arbitrary rotation about the z-axis. That just means we're changing the relative phase of the 0 and the 1 bit. Okay. What about a 2 input gate? Now the only 2 input gate we're going to need for today's lesson is called the controlled knot, or C knot for short. The controlled knot basically takes a uh, 0, 0 and makes it into 0, 0. It doesn't do anything to 0, 0. In fact, if the first bit, if the first qubit is 0, the second qubit is unchanged. So it also converts 0, 1 into 0, 1. So notice the first qubit is 0, the second qubit doesn't get affected. But if the first qubit is 1, the second qubit is inverted. So that's what the controlled knot does. The first qubit is the control bit, the second qubit is the target bit, if the first bit is 0, nothing happens to the target bit. If the first bit is 1, the target bit gets inverted. That's the idea. The symbol for the C0 looks a little bit like this. Uh, notice that there's this funny circle with a plus sign. That's the XOR operator from uh, Digital Logic. And uh, it basically has the property that if uh, it, it does the controlled inversion. If X is 1, and y is 0, the result is 1. If x is 1 and y is 1, the result is 0. It's exclusive or, which means it's x or y, except not x and y. So if x and y are both 1, you get 0. If either x or y are 1, you get 1. And if they're both 0, you get 0. So that's the, uh, that's the controlled knot. I want to point out that you can use, if you can build a controlled knot, a quantum controlled knot, then you have built an entangler detangler. What does that mean? Well, it means that if you create an unentangled state, run it through the controlled knot, then you produce an entangled state. And if you have an entangled state, you run it through the controlled knot, you get an unentangled state. Let's see how that works. Let's, let's start by applying the Hadamard operator to the first qubit of a two-qubit uh, register. This is a, using computer terminology. A register is a series of bits. So in quantum, register is a series of qubits. So we apply the Hadamard operator to qubit 1, and we get uh, 0 minus 1 over the square root of 2. But if I multiply that out, notice it's a superposition of 0, 1, and 1, 1. But this is not an entangled superposition because it's a simple product state. The first qubit is in a definite state. It's in uh, minus x, I guess. And the second qubit is in a definite state. It's in plus z. So uh, there's no entanglement. I could measure the second particle in the z direction, and it would not affect the first particle at all. Um, I could measure the first particle in the x direction. It wouldn't, it wouldn't affect any measurements I would make on the second particle at all. So these are not entangled. But let's see what happens when I run that uh, unentangled state through a controlled knot. We'll let the first qubit be the x and the second qubit be the y. That means that the first uh, pair in the superposition uh, suffers no change under the controlled knot because the first qubit is zero. But the second pair, um, the second qubit gets inverted because the first qubit is a one. So when you, when you run it through the controlled knot, you go from zero one minus one one to zero one minus one zero. Notice that that's the singlet, that's the uh, so-called D minus state and uh, it's completely entangled. If I measured the state of particle 1, uh, particle 2 is going to be in the opposite state. So I've affected, uh, I've affected the possible values particle 2 could be measured in. If I measure particle 1 to be um, 1, the second particle is definitely 0. If I measure particle 1 to be 0, the second particle is definitely 1. So th this is completely entangled. But what happens if I run it through the C0 again? Well, again, the first pair doesn't get affected, but the second pair gets flipped right back to where it was, so we're back in the original state, unentangled. So um, the control knot is an entangler detangler. Okay, that's one way to think about it. So let's get on to our uh, algorithm. The idea is, what is the quantum problem we're going to solve? So we're going to the, the easiest quantum problem to solve was the first one that was solved, and was solved by a fellow named David Deutsch, and it's called now Deutsch's problem. The idea is you've got a function. It's a binary function of one bit. 
You put one bit in, you get one bit out. Now the advantage of such a simple function is that uh, there aren't that many of them. In the universe, there are only four possible functions. The inputs can be zero and one. One possibility is the output is always zero, regardless of the input. That's the constant zero function. Another possibility is that when the input is zero, the output is zero. When the input is one, the output is one. That's the uh, identity function. It just You just get in, w out, whatever you put in. Then another possibility is the input is one, the output is, or the input is zero, the output is one. If the input is one, the output is zero. That's the not function. It takes the in, the opposite of whatever you put in. And the final possibility is that no matter what you put in, you get out a one. So that's the constant one function. So what is Deutsch's problem? Uh, Dr. Deutsch was interested in finding a problem that a quantum computer could solve faster with less effort than an equivalent classical computer. And so this is the problem he proposed. The problem is, is f of x constant or is it balanced? So the question is, are the outputs uh, independent of the inputs? That would be a constant function. Or are, do the outputs depend on the inputs? That would be a balanced function. So there's two versions of f of x that are balanced, and there's two versions that are constant. And if someone hands me a box that evaluates f of x, um, I don't know how to determine whether it's balanced or constant without evaluating the function at least twice. So here's the trouble. If I plug in f of 0 and get a value out, um, let's say I get out 0. Well. Knowing that f of 0 is 0 doesn't tell me f of 1. And so if f of 1 is 0, it would be constant. If f of 1 is 1, it would be balanced. But I can't tell until I evaluate f of 1. Uh, the, the, the possibilities, you know, you can think of 100 ways to try and do it. But in the end, you need to evaluate the function twice. So the classical algorithm, you need to try f of x twice. The quantum algorithm, allows you to determine if f of x is balanced or constant um, with only a single evaluation of f of x. Now that's, uh, that's pretty incredible, so let's see how it works. First of all, we have our C0 operator. We're going to modify it slightly for Deutsch's algorithm, and we're going to create what's called the FC0, which is basically the C0, except instead of getting the XOR of x and y, in the output qubit, we're going to get f of x and y. So we're going to build in the evaluation of f of x into the uh, fc0 gate. Now the fc0 gate is only going to actually run once. It's going to we're going to put in a state and we're going to get out a state, but we're not going to um, do anything else. That's all. That's all it's going to do. It's going to execute one time. But uh, how are we going to execute it? We're going to add some machinery to the beginning and end of the FC knot, the front and the back of the FC knot, if you like, in order to do this calculation. So notice, first of all, we've got a couple of Hadamard gates there on the inputs, and we've got a Hadamard gate on the uh, input side of the output of the FC knot. Notice that the, the C knot uh, normally passes one of its inputs through without modification. And uh, the uh, it, you just get x out, and uh, the other output, the bottom output, gets the xor of x and y. Or in the case of the fc knot, it gets f of x xor y. Um, we're going to put a Hadamard on that out on the top output to modify what it does. So let's let's look at the state at point A. We we force the inputs. Uh, to the Hadamard gates to be binary ones. So however we do that, uh, it depends on the system. We force them to be in the uh, one state. We pass the, that input through two Hadamards. So at B, we've got uh, the result of applying the Hadamard gate to bit qubit one and the result of applying the Hadamard gate to qubit two. And when I multiply all that out, I get the following state, size of B. And this is actually where the magic happens. This is a superposition of all possible combinations of the two inputs. So we're using the Hadamards to force each qubit into a superposition 
But if you look at the overall state of the system, it's an unentangled state, but it's an unentangled state of all possible values of both qubits. So this means that the FC0 gate in one execution cycle is going to visit all possible combinations of the inputs. And th this turns out to be the deep quantum magic that happens in quantum computers. There are other much more sophisticated algorithms. There's Grover's search algorithm. There's Shor's uh, factoring algorithm. There's a quantum Fourier transform algorithms and so on. But uh, all of these algorithms rely on this feature of quantum mechanics that I can, by uh, applying Hadamard gates to constant values of qubits and uh, looking at the system as a whole, I can generate uh, superpositions of all possible combinations of the inputs. And I can evaluate the result of all possible combinations with a very small number of uh, execution cycles. Okay, so let's keep track of where we are. I want to remind you what the FC0 is up in the upper right. And let's see what happens when the FC0 acts on this state, psi b. I want to pop over to psi c, and I'm going to just write down the answer, and then we're going to go through it term by term. Uh, FC0 acting on 0, 0, what does that do? Well, notice it takes f of x, x is 0, um, and it XORs it with y. But y is 0, so XORing with 0 no matter what f of 0 is, just gives you back f of 0. So that just produces the qubit uh, 0, f of 0. Similarly, the second qubit, um, we've got uh, f of x, so we're going to evaluate f of 1, but we're XORing with y, and y is 0. So again, nothing happens to the result. We just get 1, f of 1. Now the next one is more interesting because this time y is 1. So we're going to evaluate f of x, that's f of 0, but we're going to XOR with 1, which means we're going to take the inverse, or take the not, of f of 0. So I call that f of 0 tilde. Okay. Uh, and finally, the same thing for the last ket. Uh, we're going to evaluate f of 1, but since y is 1 for this ket, we're going to take the not of the result. So here's what we have. We don't know what the function f is, but whatever it is, this is what we're going to get uh, at the end. Now I want to point out something. There are only two possibilities. f can be balanced or f can be constant. If f is constant, that means f0 is equal to f1. So that means um, the first two terms, uh, the qubits the second qubit is the same, and the second two terms, the second qubit is the same. And if you think about that a little bit, you'll realize that that means we can factor this superposition into uh, 0 minus 1 and f of 0 minus f not, or not f of 0. Um, in other words, this is not an entangled state any longer. Uh, in fact, well, in fact, it wasn't an entangled state, but it's it's uh, it's unentangled in this exact way only if f is constant. On the other hand, if f is if f zero is not f one, in other words, f is balanced, then we can factor it a different way. It turns out then we get the first qubit is zero plus the second qubit is one instead of the first qubit is zero minus the sec second qubit is one times the same superposition of f and f not, or f and not f, I guess. Um, but here's the interesting thing. Notice that the first qubit is in the minus x state, and the second qubit is in the plus x state, uh, depending on whether or not f is constant or f is balanced. So if I run each of these situations through an additional Hadamard gate, then you'll notice that uh, the first qubit comes out 1 if f is constant, and it comes out 0 if f is balanced. So what I've done is to cook up a situation where the input qubit that passes through the uh, f c not gate comes out 1 only in the situation when f is constant, and it comes out 0 exactly only in the situation when f is balanced. So all I have to do is me measure 
that input register, it's the X register on the output of the FC not gate, and, uh, and I'll have my answer. If it comes out 1, F is constant. If it comes out 0, F is balanced. Now, I want to point out that the F function was only executed once, although it was executed on a superposition state. But in quantum mechanics, uh, it doesn't take any longer to execute a function, an operator. You apply an operator to a superposition, it doesn't take any longer than it takes to apply to a, uh, an eigenstate. So that means that uh, even though if we were going to calculate that, super, that calculation on a classical computer, it would take longer because there'd be more terms. But it's just nature happening. Nature doesn't happen at a different speed depending on whether or not you're in a superposition or not. So the point is this computer will uh, perform this step, perform this calculation in one cycle. And that's twice as fast as a classical computer could possibly do it. Now it doesn't seem like a huge advantage, especially for such a crazy problem. But the interesting thing is, uh, if you apply these ideas to even more sophisticated problems, you get tremendous speed up. So for example, if you're, um, if you're doing a search or you're doing uh, a factoring, that kind of thing, uh, it can, in many cases, you end up with uh, Instead of taking n cycles, it takes the square root of n cycles, for example. And uh, that doesn't seem like a huge improvement, except if it takes a million cycles to do it classically, and you can get it done in a thousand cycles quantum mechanically, that's, uh, that's a, you know, a thousand times faster. So it can, it can be many times faster to use a quantum algorithm. And uh, the main point of this whole thing was to give you guys a sense of how that might work and see how quantum mechanics allows you to do uh, calculations in parallel that would otherwise have to be done uh, one at a time exhaustively. All right, well, that was it. That's the end of this lesson, so we'll see you guys next time. Remember, QMAT on lesson 39 and uh, preparation final review on lesson 40 and then the final exam. We'll see you next time. Hello. This video is meant to accompany a worked example of a physics problem dealing with the stationary states of the infinite square well. Before you read through this worked example and try to solve the problems, it's important that you understand the phasor relationship, the phasor representation of complex numbers, the de Broglie relationship, which is that the momentum of a quantum particle is h divided by its wavelength or h bar times its wave number k, the Einstein relationship, which relates the energy of a quantum state to the frequency of the state, and the basic idea of the Schrodinger equation and, and how it works. So if you, if you haven't encountered those concepts before, you'd probably be better to go back to an earlier worked example and get those concepts before you try this one. The idea is to understand the quantum states of an infinite square well, I'm going to skip to the part that I want to focus on for the video, and that is that the solutions to the Schrodinger equation turn out to be sine functions using the coordinate systems in the example. It turns out the solutions are sine functions with this integer n, which is used to enumerate the various quantum states. The quantum states might remind you a little bit of the waves on a string. You've got the fundamental mode of vibration and the first harmonic and the second harmonic and so on. These harmonics are just like the quantum numbers of the states of the infinite square well. Now what I want to point out in this video is that there's a nice way to understand and to visualize the way these states behave. And so I'm going to flip to a uh, display. Here's a display of the wave function looked at from a particular point of view. And I want to point out that this is like a phaser that's rotating in time. It's like an e to the minus i omega t. And I want to point out that the time-dependent solution to the Schrodinger equation has just such a factor, e to the minus i omega t, this one right here. And this phaser is representing that complex number in the imaginary plane. So the real direction is to the right, the imaginary direction is up and down, and what we're doing is looking at this guy 
uh, as it spins around with an phase angle e to the minus i omega t. So it's got a frequency of omega. Okay. Now I'm going to rotate this display to show you the actual wave function. Here's the wave function. This turns out to be the n equals 1 state. Notice that it's a sine function as you move from left to right. <clears throat> and at every point there, at every point in space, this is space here. This is zero, x equals 0. This is x equals plus a. And at every point in space, there's a phasor. The phasor is the complex value of the wave function at that point. Let me pop back to the math here. This would be phi 1 of x e to the minus i omega 1t. That's what we're looking at in the screen. Phi 1 of x is the, uh, the sine. Here, I'll go back here and remind you what that looks like. It's the sine of 1 times pi x over a. So when x is equal to a, it's the sine of pi. So it goes to 0 at the right-hand side. Of course, it's 0 at the left because the sine function is 0 at the left. But you'll notice the whole thing is spinning. The frequency of the spin is determined by the Einstein relation. It's determined by the energy of the state. Now, the n equals 2 state is very similar. It looks like this. Notice it's spinning with four times the frequency. Every time the ground state goes around once, the, this is state, the first excited state, the n equals 2 state, goes around four times. That's because the wavelength of this guy is half of the wavelength of the other one. And you know that the momentum goes like h divided by the wavelength. If the momentum is double, then the kinetic energy, going like p squared over 2m, is four times. So you get the idea that this has to be four times the energy, therefore it's four times the frequency. All right? Now, if I put the two states together, they look like this. You can see the ground state is spinning around at a very low frequency. The first excited state is spinning around at a much higher frequency. The worked example is about the superposition of these two guys. So let me go ahead and show you what the superposition looks like. It's the blue arrows. Now you can see that looks kind of complicated. What I want to point out is that we can go into a frame of reference that's rotating with the ground state. And in that frame of reference, this thing becomes a lot simpler to understand. I have now switched the simulation to show a frame of reference that's moving with the ground state. And you can see that when the first excited state is lined up on the left side, that the superposition is big on the left and small on the right. Let me stop it when that happens. Okay, here first excited, or the n equals 2 state and the ground state are, are nearly aligned, and the superposition is big over here. On the right-hand side, they're anti-aligned. The excited state, n equals 2, is pointing down, n equals 1 is pointing up, and they largely cancel on this side. And you can see that if you wait around a little while, the first excited state ends up being big on the right and, and negative on the left, and the superposition is small on the left, and uh, very large on the right. So that gives you an idea of how that superposition works. Now there's one other thing I want to point out. To calculate the probability density, let me go back and let this thing turn again. To calculate the probability density, we take the magnitude of the wave function squared. Now the way I represent that in three dimensions is to make cylinders. I want to zoom in here and you can see these guys are cylinders whose radius is proportional to the square of the amplitude, the square of the wave function at that point. Okay, I can do the same thing. Let's do the same thing for the uh, for the first excited state. It looks like this. Okay, you'll notice that when we only have the the n equals two state, or we only have the n equals one state, the probability distribution is stationary. That's why these states are sometimes called stationary states because the probability distribution doesn't change in time if all you have is n equals 1 or all you have is n equals 2. But if I go to the superposition, you'll notice that no longer is the probability distribution stationary because the amplitude varies with position because these two states interfere with one another. And we get a sloshing of the probability density back and forth. Part of the worked example is to show that the frequency of the slosh is related to the frequency of the n equals 1 and the n equals 2 state. You'll see how that works when you look at the math.
All right, I hope this helps clarify what's going on. Hi guys, so somebody asked a question on Piazza about this question. It says, uh, x is measured to within an uncertainty of a over 10. Remember this is in the context of an infinite square well with a width of a. And x is the position of a particle in that well. So uh, originally, if you look back at the original problem, let's see, there it is. Um, originally, the a particle was confined to a region between 0 and a over 3. So now suddenly it's confined to a region um, at t equals 0. It was like this, but then later it measured, and it's measured to within a distance of a over 10. What happens to the Fourier coefficients at that time and the wave function after this measurement? Will the expectation value of the energy be different? So in order to answer this question um, most directly, I cooked up a, um, what you call, uh, Jupyter Notebook with the usual usual suspects, the NumPy library and the plotting library. And I also pulled in a numerical integrator, the Simpson uh, library from SciPy Integrate. I uh, made a function which gets a test wave function that's sort of like the ground state wave function of the infinite square well. Here you have the ground state wave function essentially. But then I'm multiplying that by a Lorentzian. You can look up Lorentzian. It's basically a, a peaked function that has a width that's determined by this parameter s. So when s is small, it's narrow and peaked, and s is large, it's broad and not so peaked. And if I multiply that by the ground state wave function, I can satisfy the boundary conditions at the edges of the well. But I can also have a wave function that has a variable width, right? Uh, I'm going to take the absolute value squared of the wave function, add that up to get a normalization factor, and then I'll divide by the square root of that guy to get a normalized array. Then I can also do the same thing for the nth uh, stationary state, or the nth eigenstate, n pi x over a, I normalize it and return it. So get psi n gets me the nth normalized eigenstate, energy eigenstate. Get psi gets me a wave function with a parameter s that determines how sharply peaked it is. Now get Fourier coefficient just does a Simpson's rule integration between an arbitrary wave function and the nth energy eigenstate. So that gives me the Fourier coefficient of that particular energy term in the Fourier series. And finally, I have a uh, function I call h for Hamiltonian, which uses the, n the NumPy gradient function to calculate the gradient of the wave function twice, takes the gradient of the gradient, I divide by dx to get the right scaling. So this gives me the second derivative of the wave function with respect to x. And then I'm going to take minus psi times that second derivative and add that up to get the expectation value of the kinetic energy of the particle in the well, minus h bar squared d squared psi dx squared over 2m, right? If I let h bar and m be equal to 1, like it says here, um, then uh, this gives me the, the energy. So first I want to plot the wave function. I'll give you, I, I adjust the parameter s from 0.5 down to 0 0.05. So the blue is 0.5. That almost looks just like the ground state wave function. But as I dial s down, the function gets more sharply peaked. So I'm looking at the variation in the peakiness of the wave function as I adjust s. Then I'm going to go through. I'll calculate the energy for different values of peakiness. I calculate the energy. I'll calculate the uh, actual wave function with that level of peakiness. I'm going to go through and get the Fourier coefficients for that wave function for different values of n, and then I'm going to make a graph. So I'm looking at the Fourier coefficients for a particular value of s. s is 0.5. I really have n equals 1. I don't have any n equals 2 because n equals 2, 4, 6, and 8 are all anti-symmetric in the well, but these wave functions are all symmetric since they're centered uh, at a is a half, and um, at a half of a, I should say, and so the evens are all zero, but the odd, the biggest odd is n equals one, and then n equals three has a little bit, and then everybody else is pretty much peanuts. The relative energy here is around five. So as I crank down s, notice that n equals three goes up, n equals five now has some, n equals seven is growing, Crank it down to 0.2, now 3, 5, 7. I'm seeing some 9 here and some 11. If 
I go down to point one, I, I, I'm out here at 15, 17, and 19 are starting to show up. And finally, if I go down to S is 0.05, I've got Fourier coefficients that are uh, non-zero all the way out to 19, and if I kept going, I could probably go even higher. The energy here is now 20 times what it was in the original picture. So the energy is going way up, the Fourier coefficients are all changing, and that's really the moral of the story. When you make a measurement, when you change your knowledge about the particle, its energy has to change. So when you, do, when you make a measurement, there's no way you can avoid interacting with the system and adjusting its behavior. So measuring is not a passive sport in quantum mechanics. Uh, it, there you go. I'll talk to you guys soon. Hey guys, real quick, some people were asking about how to calculate expect expectation values with NumPy arrays or with wave functions represented as NumPy arrays. So I just wanted to show you that real quick. I've just got a simple wave function here that's the superposition of uh, a sine of pi x over L and a sine, two times the sine of 2 pi x over L. So it's, it's dominated by the n equals 2 component, but it's got a little bit of n equals 1 component. And here's the trick. If you take the absolute value of psi and square it, and then you add those up with the sum, it's a numpy array, so you can just say sum, and then take the square root, that becomes a normalization factor. And if you divide psi by that normalization factor, then psi now is normalized. If you look at it, you can see, well, it's not obvious that it's normalized, but how can, how can you tell that it's normalized? Well, you could say, give me psi squared, and let's sum that, and it comes out to be 1. So that tells you that psi is uh, actually normalized. Now the cool thing is I can, I can actually plot that. So I can say PL plot uh, x and psi, and that's the, uh, I'm going to get a grid, grid on that so you can see what that looks like. <clears throat> and that's what the wave function looks like. So it's dominated. It's mostly n equals 2, but you can see this side is a little bit shorter than that side, so that means we've added into it a little bit of n equals 1. Now, what about the probability density? Well, that's not bad. I can just square this, and that gives me the probability density. So you can see the midpoint of the wave function is 1.5, that it goes from 0 to 3, but you can see that it shifted a little bit to the left. So you'd expect the expectation value to be over here somewhere. How do I calculate that? Well, it turns out to be easy. Uh, psi squared, of course, is the probability density. So I can, let's see, psi squared. This is, these are the probabilities of being in any of these cells. How do I calculate the expectation value? Well, I take the x of this cell times its probability plus the x of that cell. Well, what are the x's? The x's are these guys. So I would take 0 times that guy. I take 0 0.1578 times 0 0.0139. I take 0.3157 times... 0.05078 and so on. Wait a minute. That's what NumPy does, is it multiplies arrays. So I can just multiply this array by that array, and I get the product of those two. The expectation value is just the sum of those products, because it's x times it's x at the first cell times the probability of being in that cell, plus x at the second cell times the probability of being in that cell, and so on. So the answer is that sum. So that's a quick way. See, I'm kind of, in, it's like an integral. I'm doing a sum, but it's the sum of the product of the probability of being at any value of x times the x value that goes with that spot. And I just add those guys up. And that's how, so that's the expectation value of x. You want to know the expectation value of x squared? You just multiply by x squared. That's the expectation value of x squared. You want to know sigma? Well, that's not too bad. You take the expectation value of x squared minus the expectation value of x, right, squared, and then you take the square root of that. So that's sigma, okay? And that's the way the game is played. I hope that helps. Hi guys, I wanted to explain what's going on with the free particle and the spreading of the wave packet and the business of the wave packet wrapping around. So I've made a crude uh, representation here of what's going on. I, I have here a, the real part of a wave packet. It doesn't show the imaginary part, but 
The idea is I can adjust this parameter and you can see the wave packet move. But as the wave packet approaches the right side, you start to see some monkey business over here on the left side. And that's exactly what happens in the, in the uh, Python program is the, the wave packet appears to sort of wrap around. It moves off the right and then it starts appearing magically on the left. And the reason has to do with the basis functions we're using to represent the wave function. So um, we're using sines and cosines, essentially, periodic wave functions, or periodic basis functions. So if it were possible in the Python program to zoom out, what you would see is that well, we don't really just have a single wave packet. We've actually got an infinite number of wave packets that are periodically sprinkled along the x-axis. And what we're seeing when the thing moves is we're actually seeing the wave packet, the next periodic copy of the wave packet on the other side, starting to appear in the, in the field of view, I guess, of the uh, Python program. And the way we're calculating probability and expectation value is as soon as this guy starts to show up in the left-hand side of the um, picture, it starts affecting the expectation value. And so the expectation value of position gets all messed up, basically, because this is not a valid, if it were really a single particle moving in empty space, there would be no periodic copies of the thing. The periodic copies arise because we have a finite um, array that we're using to represent the wave function and we're using periodic functions that produce echoes essentially or copies of the wave packet that then start to uh, enter the scene when the uh, time passes a certain point. So anyway, I wanted to share that with you. I hope that helps clarify what's going on.